the top top dueler i don't know what they're called but one who beyblades right the before pokemon they begin champion. their beyblade mm. competition yeah when the pokemon comp challenge ships they they what do they say when they like oh let it rip it is that the one Ooh. let it rip let it rip i think yeah. that's true that, that's a flashback from the early 2000s let yeah it, no, i'm it sure rip. it's let it rip let it rip and then you would do that and then you just see what happens it was very exciting mm. it was kind of like um it's like more it's it's basically it's like ethical cockfighting <laughs> sort of um <laughs> Except they were probably made by like malnourished Chinese it orphans. Be, it would be very unethical to like spin a chicken really fast and throw oh, them yes. the <laughs> and spin them at each other. Yeah, can you imagine they go <laughs> they just, just spinning around, around like they're in a like they're in a pinball yeah. machine? Now we need that scene of the movie where it's like I happen to know the best creature to spin is one of the rarest like you know cave bats of the Malaysian hills or something. You're like, oh, if you get that one, you'll be you know you dominate. Well, that's where the monsters are so angry, so because at least with Pokemon, you throw them out of the ball and then they're fine. Whereas Beyblade, they go into battle and everything gets worse for them because normally they're just trapped in a static spinning top. And then no, let it rip happens, and they suddenly start spinning. And then they finally get out and they're really pissed off and immediately start fighting because they're thinking like, who does that to an animal? That's just cruelty. Yeah, I've heard apologists, Pokemon apologists, say that the Pokemon like no, no, they like it. Um, well, they like when they battle, uh, because it like it helps them grow strong and it trains them and stuff. Which is probably, I mean, explanations like that do historically harken back to maybe the transatlantic slave trade. But you know, that's I'm sure it's just coincidental. But it it is odd this idea. Look, look the Pokemon world building is we don't talk about Pokemon world building. We don't we don't we, we don't do. Want to do that. I guess we do, because people say, hey, read this entry from this card, from this Pokemon. And we look at the Pokemon, and we're like, yeah, oh, he looks like an interesting regularly. fellow. And then we, read the, then we read the Pokedex entry from, like, Sun and Moon, or one of the fucked up new ones. And it's like, yeah, steals the I souls think, uh, of children. I think Sun and Moon and... is uh, not that new, Rags. I think that came out, like, a decade ago. So there's... Well, you know what? That's newish. There is a new quirk with Discord, apparently, because I did update it today. Uh, sometimes when someone is speaking, have you noticed it too? Have yeah. you noticed it as well? <laughs> yeah. What is going well. on there? Like everyone sounds low bit rate, and then they go back to normal after a few seconds. That's weird. Yeah, I don't know what's okay. up with that. I'm glad I wasn't the only one. I thought I was going insane. Love, it's so funny. It's like we updated it. And you're like, you made it worse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why didn't you just leave it the way it was? Why have you? Why did you it? update it to just make it worse? <sighs> Oh well. Anyway, hello! <laughs> How oh, well. is everyone hey, doing? Everyone. We're hello, back! Everyone. Not that you would have known that we necessarily disappeared. I had a few people being like two recorded EFAPs in a row. You guys dead? And it's like, uh, a little bit dead. You know, no, just slightly dead. we would have mentioned, we would have said something. Well, not the dead one, but well, I mean, I the was... survivors would have mentioned something. It's funny that I would get the dead accusations in any way, shape, or form when I'm like on other live streams. Like, hello, I'm still alive. And they're just like, hmm. Don't know if we can trust on that. On Mahler's deathbed, he yeah. schedules everything out to <laughs> release. He's like, uh, you're like Jigsaw, where after you die, I spend more time being actually, alive than when yeah, I was alive. In the story. <laughs> yeah. What, oh, you, you guys think uh, Mahler's a handful when he's alive? Wait till he's dead. Mm -hmm. And he has all of this, all of this stuff that's releasing for years like, and years and years. For every day that goes by, we record extra EFAPs, real BBCs, open bars, just everything, even gaming streams for future games that are not even out yet. All of it's just done. Are you, are you okay? Yeah, I'll be fine. I heard the sirens. I was just making sure that you were okay. They're not for me. I didn't know if they were coming. I didn't know if they were police coming to arrest you or an ambulance coming to. No, police coming to arrest you or an ambulance coming to rescue you. You know, they're truly for or... the chat. Dun, dun, you know, dun. Are Wait, help me out here. What 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 do you, what what trouble do you think that Chad is in? Is Chad okay? I is, distract me safe? so much the safe? low bit rate, high bit rate thing, but I just gotta 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 deal with it. Gotta <laughs> soldier on. Just gotta, yep. It's exactly. just because we're doing a spooky but... film. I was just gonna try and spook them. You know, they're all like, "Oh God, me." And it's like, yeah, maybe. Who knows? Low bit rate is spooky. It is. It is. <sighs> anyway, well, have... uh, Fring was on a fun <laughs> adventure. Free, tell the world about it. I well, I went on a trip. <laughs> now I'm back. There you go. What fun, what fun things did you weeks. do? 
you see any fun uh, animals? Oh, you know, I saw, I saw lots. I saw lots of animals. Uh, oh, that's unfortunately, good. they were there because it was a, a road trip. Unfortunately, there was a a, a, a sad amount of uh, dead animals on the road. Oh. Uh, did you see oh, any living animals, <laughs> or was that, did you saw... only see flat ones? I, survivors. No, I, did you I, see I, any I saw, survivors? Uh, actually, I did. Uh, yesterday, when I was I was coming home, my uh, uh, as I was driving down the the road, I saw uh, I saw a live uh, kangaroo. Ooh. Instead of a dead one, and that was very swell. You make was, it seem so dystopian. The, like, oh, yesterday I saw the... a live animal, an actual animal. Everyone's like, "Ooh, well, you just it was moving." There was, a lot of, uh, <laughs> there was a lot of a lot of squished critters, lots of kangaroos, lots. The uh, kangaroos often rabbits. get hit by cars. Like, can't they just jump over them? Kangaroos yeah. are like uh, kangaroos are like Australia's deers in terms of uh, in terms of being the animals that people hit on the road. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a lot not... of warning signs here on the highways that have like yeah, we have know, them too. Deer, like watch we out have for kangaroo deer on them. Yeah, we have kangaroo on them. And we also and a lot of people don't know this, but uh, we do the inverse as well, where the uh, forestry service they'll go out into the woods and they'll do the same thing. They'll put out the yellow signs, the yellow diamond signs that have a picture of a generic automobile on them, about fifty feet into the woods on either side of the road. So that deer know as well that you know they need to watch out and be careful, and it, it works pretty well. All right, okay, that's yeah. interesting. You don't see don't that know. many uh, animals on the side. If you do, it's mostly little things like squirrels, possums, the occasional armadillo, a raccoon here and there. Uh, no, it's mainly it's mainly yeah kangaroos uh, or foxes or uh, some rabbits or possums. Uh, but I did see plenty of living animals, so that was that was swell. That was that's really good. swell. Yeah, that's good. I saw a lot of critters. That's good. Any of them um, have names? Uh, yeah, but I don't remember them if they did. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you don't want to name them, especially if you're about to hit them with your car. If you're driving <laughs> down the road and you see a kangaroo or whatnot, you don't want to give him a name right before you kill him, because that's you like killing a be. pet. Yeah. Once you name yeah. it, it's basically your pet, and it's your makes responsibility. It, makes it sadder, yeah. Did you visit I, any the... fantastic landmarks? Uh, yeah, I went to a few national parks, um, so that was, uh, that was really cool. Uh, yeah, like, uh, yeah, but basically mm -hmm. a, few, a few national parks along the way. Lots of driving. <laughs> Lots. Did you see <laughs> yeah. the Grand Canyon or the Eiffel Tower? Ooh, no, yeah. I, I uh, just missed those. But yeah, there were oh. there were a, a few a few too many hours out the way. Yeah, I figure maybe. So, uh, yeah. It sounds like if you can't hit it with your car, you're not interested. No, <laughs> you can hit both of those things with your car. To be clear, you can't. You can hit those it, things with your car. What does it mean to hit that's the Grand Canyon with your car? Yeah, that's right. You just that's drive that's into it and smack yeah. it to the bottom. You hit it with your car. Oh, I. Uh, <laughs> I also saw some emus. Actually, I I saw I saw a lot of cows and sheep. I saw. Oh. Good. I don't want to. I don't want to see another cow for a while. I I think I might have actually seen literally tens of thousands of cows, <laughs> like maybe tens of thousands over the last couple of weeks. I saw many recently as well. We had about a four and a half hour drive south to meet up with a bunch of relatives and stuff. And mm. boy, lots of cows. Lots of cows. Goats too, cows and goats and. Uh, well, yeah, so lots of uh, lots of cat, lots of cows, lots of sheep, some horses, sort of some horses here and there, and some goats and some alpacas as well. Oh, I have a question. If you go to the Grand Canyon, and you let's say you go to the Grand Canyon, you take a shovel with you, and you go to inside of it, you go to the inside of the Grand Canyon, and you just dig right. You're not you're not digging a hole. Really, you're just making the one that's there bigger, uh -huh. right? That's how it. That is how it works. Is this like a phenomenological question? Can you dig a hole inside a hole? Is that? I mean, I, I, I would if if I started digging a hole at the Grand Canyon and someone said stop digging that hole, I would say, I'm not. I'm just making Extending this one bigger. I'm actually, yeah, I'm just. Making the one we're in even bigger, even larger. I'm making it even more grand, you might even say. Uh, would they say that you're making it grand, or is it grand just the way it is? Oh, no, you wouldn't be making it bigger, because all of the dirt that you take out, you would, 
you'd have to like get you'd it out of the Grand Canyon, somewhere, yeah. actually make it. Bigger. And you so being there has already like... made the hole less hole, you know. That's right. That's technically true. You filled it. up. People wouldn't say the hole is smaller, but they'd say there's less room in the hole. So Which you'd have to have MI like makes bullet, mules, mules or burros, and you have to. They'd have to have big sacks for dirt and take it up as they do there. So. So anyway. Anyway, we never talk about right. that guy. Do no, we? Oh, dark. yes. Hercule Poirot, the famous Belgian detective uh, mm. of Agatha Christie's. Are there any other famous Belgian detectives, or is it just him? Oh, there's... Um, I yes. don't know of any. Who? Rufus. Rufus? From? Belgian. Antwerp. Uh, no, oh, I meant from what from what piece of media? Um, Antwerp. The Belgian, the Belgian mystery. Rufus, the Belgian detective. <laughs> Rufus, the Belgian detective. Uh, that's his name. Yeah. He's got to be an animal then. He has to be Rufus, the Belgian detective, and he's like a badger, and he puts on his little hat. He's like the the <laughs> frog and the toad. <laughs> I I would watch it, and, and it would be fucking great. Um, and where do we, uh, because I have no idea how to talk about this film in the way that we usually do, we're probably going to go a little darty aroundy, but before that, maybe give some kind of preamble on familiarity with Poirot, of which I have very little. I saw very little of the show that happened, I, I'm not sure if I've even seen a full episode, I think I did when I was younger, and then just cultural pieces of knowledge, and then I saw, um, the 2017... A Murder on the Orient Express. I saw Death on the Nile with the famous Gal Gadot or Gadot. Oh boy, she's she's a very yeah. talented actress. Gadot. She's very good. Mm -hmm. And the I saw the new one. That's why people real, say when she is in their movie, they say "Get out, Gadot." Nice. That's why they call her that. They say "Gal, get out," and she doesn't. Casting director did a great job of getting her in that movie. Uh, and so Someone, she's got an insanely good agent. Yeah, that's actually probably true. Uh, so, I, like, the way I see it is that uh, the, the Murder in the Orient Express didn't like it very much. I was like, eh. And then Death on the Nile was like, eh. And I thought this one would be the exact same experience, but it wasn't for me. And uh, then, I, then I expressed interest in discussing it with these fine gentlemen, and they have all and now me. seen it. So I, that, that's my uh, preamble. Would anyone else like to provide some backing on their familiarity with Mr. Poirot? I have sure. a thematically relevant one. It's <gasps> like relevant to the, the previous EFAP, though, on the question of unjustifiable or justifiable murder. Um, and Ooh. it just popped into my mind when you said we were doing this. In the last ever Poirot, which I think is just called The Last Poirot. It's not called The Last Poirot, but it's The Last Ever Poirot. Directed by Plot, Ryan Johnson? Yes, it is. It's the sequel to Age of Belgium. But it's um the the last thing that oh, he ever does. Oh, I thought you were gonna say the Belgium the, Awakens. The Belgium Awakens. Oh. Um and then the so rise the, the, of the Germany basic, would be the third one. Oh no. That would be the very, very dark third one. Yeah. yeah. Um but the, the basic plot is Poirot becomes convinced that there there have been these five murders that have happened, and everyone like they, they think they found the people responsible, and so they've all gone to prison. But Poirot, who is dying because he's really old and he has a bad heart, he is convinced that another person is secretly orchestrating all of these various different murders. And so he summons everyone to this house, and the guy who is there isn't actually directly responsible for killing anyone, but Poirot reasons that what this guy is doing is subtly, psychologically manipulating people into committing murders. And so Poirot's last ever case ends with him shooting the guy and then not taking his heart medication so he dies of a heart attack. Now, he says in his little letter to Captain Hastings after the fact, he's not sure that necessarily murdering this person was the right thing to do, but he is sure that it stopped other murders from happening. So, is that an example of a justifiable murder? It's a bit um, mad, Well, it's, it's going to be down to how you use the words, right? Like, if you, by justifiable, are strictly referring to, I feel that it was morally fine, but the law won't. That's what I mean by that statement, or whatever. It's like, that's one thing. But, um, if you mean... yeah. Will it be justified as murder? Like, uh, uh, will it will it justify a murder? Is like like it can't, as in like you can't. If it is a murder, then it's non just You know, like law. It's uh, like yeah, definitionally, I think if it's if it's murder, it is it is an unjustified killing. Because there are plenty of 
murders that I think all of us are going to be like, yeah, that was probably okay. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, know? there could be bad rulings, or there could be a really weird or unjust law, like drink in the freezer's done. Mm. Um, but I think that, yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the useful difference between saying, this is a killing, you've killed someone, like if someone tries to rob your house and you shoot them, like that's not murder, that's you've killed in self-defense, and then you have murder, which is you are not justified in taking this life, that's why we have, you know, killing versus murder. It also sounds um, quite controversial which... for Poirot, though I suppose that would be the kind of thing you'd expect yeah. to happen in his final story. It is, and it, like, I just quite like the idea that the guy's actual crime is just being a troll, and Poirot <laughs> can't actually pin evidence on him, so he just shoots him. That's, that's the end. <laughs> I could, I is that controversial? I've had I enough. Are people upset like, I've with had that enough of this shit. Oh, I feel like a lot of diehard Poirot fans might be like, ooh, yeah. this is very unlike him to do this i think it, that was my impression because like, i think it was one of the it might even have been the last one agatha christie herself ever wrote and so like i think the general consensus was that she was going a bit off the boil toward the end anyway but like my my entire familiarity with prior comes with the david Sush, uh, Sushay, david Suchet one so the tv show that ran for however many years that was but just as like background entertainment because my dad likes it and my nan likes it so it's that miss marple jeremy brett sherlock holmes were just mm -hmm. kind of always on without necessarily ever paying attention to it, but it just makes it really weird seeing anyone playing Poirot who isn't David Suchet, which is why I haven't seen Kenneth Branagh in the role until this film. Did you oh, see like the other two or just this one? Just this one. Not a bad decision, IMO. But anyway. <laughs> uh... um, someone in chat has asked, I thought murder was premeditated. And I, I have heard someone else say this as well, but uh, you have different degree. Maybe the law is different elsewhere, but here in America, we have different degrees of murder, and we also have manslaughter. Um, so, like, first-degree murder is, like, premeditated, planned-out murder. You're going to go kill the person. And I think second-degree murder is not intending to kill someone, but ending up doing it either as part of another crime or maybe a crime of passion or something like that, where it's murder, but it's not premeditated and planned. Mm -hmm. And then you have manslaughter, which is like the accidental murder of someone where you didn't intend to murder anybody. Maybe you're playing a prank or maybe you were negligent with something and it ended up killing someone as a result. And I think that's manslaughter. Um, and I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm no lawyer, but I don't, I don't actually, I don't really know any lawyers either. So there you go. Take that for what it is. Very well. Uh... What about you, Fringy? Anything on, on the old Poirot? Yeah, how many uh, people have I you mean, murdered? I, I, uh, I'm familiar with the character just, like, through, I guess, cultural osmosis, but I'd say I'm, like, not particularly familiar. I think I... I, I think I may have seen the the uh, the 70s uh, Orient Express film. Uh, I definitely caught like a few episodes of uh, that British, uh, the, the TV show that was running. Uh, and then just like things that you know about the character and like kind of what he represents and his little idiosyncrasies and, and all that. But yeah, I'm not super familiar with Hercule Poirot. Hence, I'm probably going to pr mispronounce his name a few times while we're doing this. Uh, it's okay. Not everyone yeah, I, will make fun of you or anything. What I, uh, I won't. all I've really known about the newer films is that people didn't really think that they were very good. Um, and I like that that Murder on the Orient Express, the the one that Kenneth Branagh made, was was just like not as good as the one that came out in the seventies. Uh, and then Death on the Nile, all I knew about that was everybody making fun of it because Gal Gadot can't act. Uh, <laughs> she can't which speak. was really funny. That seemed to have been the well, beginning of everybody realizing she can't act. And then uh, A Haunting in Venice kind of just came and went. Uh, it seems yeah. like it, it came out and it, it just sort of disappeared just as quickly. Uh, yeah, but, so but they make their money. So they, these... Yeah, well, they do make their money, but it looks like Death on the Nile and A Haunting in Venice made considerably less than uh, Murder on the Orient Express did. Which is uh, it's a real shame, because I want there to be mystery um, movies that can, you know, carry well, the genre. Like the Knives Out genre. Yeah, like that can contrast yeah. themselves with the really crappy ones. Like, it, it sucks, because I, I really like A Haunting in Venice. I like it a lot. Um, and oh I, God, spoilers. yeah, well, I, um, I hate the idea that the big popular ones that make all the money and everyone goes like, Ooh, my God, this is so amazing. Are the shitty knives out in the shitty glass onion movie when this one is kind of going under the radar. And that's pretty I amazing, wonder, right? Because I'm they're not just like bad. They're some of the worst I think you can do in the genre. Like 
I don't know yeah, that I've seen worse yeah. attempts at it. They're re well, it's it's they're really bad in part because the goal is to try and not be like a typical whodunit story where it plays itself straight, mm. where it is just exactly what it is. Some you know some crime has occurred, and the really interesting quirky detective is actually going to figure out who did it and be right. Instead of like all of this, ah, let's mess around with people's expectations of genre, or oh, what if it's just dumb, huh? These are pretty clever yeah, ideas. Just right dumb, here. so clever. Yeah. Uh, show Rather me than getting to the end of like the Lord of the Rings or The Stand or something like that, you get to the end of some great novel, and the end's like, ah, uh, whatever. It just doesn't. It's just dumb, and it doesn't make sense. What have you done with your life? All these chapters in all these pages. A lot of people would be pretty miffed at yeah, that. Yeah, like Gandalf's like, oh, I like just remembered a spell I can kill Sauron with. And they're like, really? And it's like, oh, yeah, he's so yeah. dumb that he didn't think to counter it. And you're like, okay. And doesn't that make you think about stories or something? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My wow. work here is done. And now <laughs> flies and away. Is like, his, his many more films and a lot of money. Yeah. Every, all the film critics on YouTube are like, wow, how clever, how incredibly. Because amazing this was it, what a subversion of the genre. the genre that makes it good uh that makes it really good i can make a video on how it's it's like that because ryan johnson said that's what the film is not gonna lie uh, yeah and if you don't like it you just didn't get it you didn't understand it like we understood it i would pay good money to watch poirot dress down uh leblanc or yeah that would, be, that would be uh ben, Matt leblanc. Ben Benoit leblanc, blanc, right? that's it yeah yeah Ugh. Anyway, uh, uh, I was going to say, should we it. get the initial out of the way? We'll go one by one, because uh, we don't exactly know what everyone here Mine feels about R. everything. About uh, a, a haunting in Venice. So, could go left to right, or could go from what I am least familiar with to most familiar with, since I shall be uh, piloting this. Meaning, Lil Platoon could go first if you want. What did you think of a haunting in Venice? I liked it. I, don't, I wasn't blown away by it. But I thought, I mean, it's beautifully shot, and actually it didn't exploit Venice porn too hard, which is normally how you trick people into thinking that it's beautifully shot, is you just show people Venice and they think, oh my goodness, how amazing it is. But no, I think it's actually genuinely very well shot um, in, in the technical aspects. Uh, I, I liked that they did give pretty much everybody in there at least one noticeable sort of character dynamic. That was nice, and no one was just there to make up numbers. Um, I, I slightly lean away from the supernatural elements and also from the world war ii stuff i, I, I like the, I, it gives important context it explains where the characters are and what they think i lean away from that kind of thing though because and I, the originals kind of deliberately lent away from it as well in that it's kind of a it can be too easy to get away with if you're doing supernatural and also the world war ii thing which just brings in sort of a very short hand or it's a shortcut way to establishing sort of background character trauma which is it's done quite well, it's just a bit too easy. Um, and I quite like the fact that in, certainly for the entire TV show run, for example, they deliberately avoid all of that because it puts Poirot more out of place versus the run-of-the-mill people around him. That he's this ambassador almost from an older, more civilized age, and he's not necessarily been dragged down into the mire, which is really the excuse for a lot of the characters' bad behavior around him. So like, well, he, there's more he does contrast explicitly by doing talk about how going through two wars has changed his perception. Oh, no, no, I'm, yeah, I'm not saying that's not accounted for. I'm saying that I don't necessarily like it in this context. I don't necessarily like it for the character. Like, it's not that I don't think it works. It's just that I prefer stories that don't necessarily lean on that as much. But that's just really a subjective point as opposed to a, like a proper criticism of the film not holding up. I think it does hold up. Um, it's just if you need to establish that Poirot has lost faith, which is the film needs to do in order to establish him rediscovering faith, which the film does by the end, then you need to have a very quick way of doing that. And his war experience makes perfect sense as a way to do that. It's just quite convenient, I guess. But it's not like a strong uh, criticism by any means. Would you say the same about Godzilla minus one? No, but I don't... Maybe that's the problem is the point of comparison in that I'm, I'm sort of looking at the way that Poirot has always been represented, at least how I'm familiar with him, and just like this is just the things I prefer about how his character is contrasted with people around him. Godzilla Minus One is very different because, A, there isn't that point of comparison in the same way, um, and B, the, the, the story is absolutely hinges on that part of sort of socio-historical context in Japan generally and the main character being the embodiment of all of that. I think it works brilliantly well in Godzilla Minus One because it was unexpected and because it was maybe more nuanced than this film does with Poirot. I mean, it's, it's kind of 
stock to say that World War II causes character trauma and trauma is motivation. And so we've, we've sort of gone through that very quickly. Um, it's, it's the quickest way to get him to lose his faith in man. Uh, whereas minus one is more detailed, I would say. Um, but I'm conscious as I'm prattling on about it that this is not a particularly well formed critique. So it's okay. Um, uh, maybe it's just a, we'll get through yeah. to all of it. But I was going to say, Fringy, if you want to give your thoughts, yeah, I liked it. I was uh, kind of pleasantly surprised again because I really hadn't heard good things about the other uh, films uh, in a variety of different ways. But I thought this film was cool. I think it's. Uh, I think it was it's a cool idea right to put the really intelligent detective in uh kind of like a horror d d maybe supernatural uh situation where he has to sort of grapple with uh unknowns or you know is his mind playing tricks on him it feels like a sort of fun venue to uh test uh the character and test his beliefs in an interesting way um I think I would also agree that it didn't like blow my mind, uh, but I I enjoyed it. I th I, th I think it's a I think it's a neat movie. Very well, um, Regolio, what do you think? I really liked this movie. Uh, I've seen it twice, and on a second viewing, I was able to appreciate and notice a lot of things that wouldn't stand out or be particularly noteworthy uh, until you sort of had the context of everything. So I'm very glad I watched it a second time yesterday with Mahler and we went through it and we, you know, kind of took our mental notes and actual notes on uh, on the movie. Um, I, I, I actually really like this. I think it's emotional. I think that it has a lot to say. There's a lot of layers working, uh, working here in tandem. I think that it raises interesting questions. It has a lot of different characters who have different perspectives and different personalities. It does a lot of things that it doesn't have to do, but it does them anyway. And it fleshes out this, you know, not just the mystery element, but the, the humanization of a lot of the characters who are here. It has a great vibe. It's not, like, it, it's, it's that excellent line of being not a horror movie, but like a scary-ish movie or a suspense movie. It really straddles that line very well for me. Um... And I think the acting is really excellent all around. A lot of the dialogue is uh, very well written. There's a lot of subtext to uh, things that people say, especially to each other, because some people from the get-go have these kind of standoffish and confrontational attitudes. And it gives, it, it gives a lot of... I think con it has a lot of confidence in what it's doing for you to pick things up that you might not necessarily get the first time. Um, and yeah, I really liked it i thought it was quite good very well <clears throat> uh for me i was I, I think i was just interested by the i hadn't seen anything to do with poirot in a significant way when the um the Mutter and the orient express came out the 2017 version so i was like i'll just check that out and i believe it got downgraded halfway through from primary monitor to secondary monitor a shame that no film could ever have to uh deal with but unfortunately what happened? And then I remember finishing it, and I think I talked to uh, Fringy at the time about how I was not happy with a lot of the choices in the film. We actually managed to rewatch that semi recently, and it's gone even further down uh, in, in my yeah, view. Right, which um, enjoy, the enjoy, uh, 2017 which Murder, Murder on the Orient Express is the Kenneth Branagh one. Oh yeah, that's the one. I've only it, seen the original. I haven't seen the remake. So. It's uh, it's a really lame movie. It's got a lot of uh. Now, of course, you know, bear in mind, uh, haven't read the book, so only talking about the movie. Yeah, I only the movie, movie, not even the '70s right. movie, just the new movie. No, just well, the this one. There was a lot of things about, like, some really cringy dialogue, mm -hmm. like a lot of really shallow, stupid lines. But that's uh, probably a point to movie. praise this film about, right? Because like that. The previous two have had the advantage, which apparently they've completely failed to make use of, of actually adapting something which is well known, already written, quite well beloved. And so, like the murder of the on the Orient Express is a classically known story, and it's been done well before. And so they had the advantage of doing a straight adaptation and failing to do that. Whereas this one, from what I understand, is not anything like a straight adaptation. The book that it's coming well, from is, I think, it's just called a Halloween Party, which is not 
anything like the events of the thing and actually by it's turning also a terrible name for a story it's also a pretty crap name for a story but essentially by using <laughs> less was material, on that one. <laughs> by using less source material they've actually turned around a better film than the straight attempts at adaptation they've done previously which is actually a point in very much in praise of this film I because agree. there's much more creativity that they've had to bring to it themselves rather than just leaning on stuff that other people have already done yeah, um, Mahler and I watched the, was it the 2010 episode? I, what happened to my intro? <laughs> we are, we are going with the flow. We are a river. I refuse. Thought, Fuck the flow. Bend, I'm back, everyone. Here curve. I am we with my intro. So, I'm setting you up to on, say things. Well, right. A death don't on the don't Nile, don't all right? Raise and, your voice in public. And, yeah. <laughs> don't raise I'm your voice, sir. <laughs> I'm alone in my home. The fuck up. So, Death on the Nile, I put it on second monitor, and, and I don't even know that it managed to survive that. It was so, eh, when it, it came drowned. out. Uh, I did stay for the meme line, and I think I completed it, but I just <laughs> didn't care. Uh, now, what's interesting is uh, Haunting of Venice pops up, and I was like, oh, I guess I'll check that one out. Especially because, like, I'm, I'm not interested in this series at all at this point. But it's a spooky one, apparently, which is good enough to check out. And, um... I think I was actually, I happened to be in a call with Free, and it was on the second monitor, and it kept uh, kept kept pulling me over every once in a while, so with certain lines, to the point where I shared a few of them with Free. I was like, isn't that a good line? You were like, yeah, seems like a pretty not bad. I was like, this That's is That's a strange. good Free impression, by the way. That's really good. I worked really hard on it. That was kind of all my yeah. prep. But it sounds like, it sounds just like him. The, uh, the crazy thing was, I was like, if the dialogue is good, Usually, a lot follows from that, and so it's uh, it's slowly creeped over to the primary monitor. Isn't that nuts? And I was like, "What have you? What have you done? You've you've re reversed the legacy." And you know, I, I finished it. and I was like, "This is uh, something's going on in this movie." I think more than I gave it credit to assume, like more than more than I thought was ever going to happen. And so yeah, I looked into it, and uh, Platoon is correct. This is a Kind of an original story. It's taken pieces, and by that I mean essentially names from the <laughs> story it's adapting. And I was curious to see what the TV show version of the, you know, the same like like what what episode they created by adapting the same story. But yes, me and Rags watched that. Um, quite enjoyable, and it's a uh, you know, yeah, it's um, all right. David Suchet. Did you say his name was or Suchet? David Suchet. Suck it. Suchet. Touche. Yeah, David, um, very, very good performance as Poirot. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but the story itself, I was, you know, I thought it was good. I just didn't find it as interesting as A Haunting in Venice. Um, it's a lot more flat. Um, of which. Straight. Yeah. I gave this a rewatch with attention to detail, and I have all kinds of things to go over, things to appreciate and criticize. I think that this was. Surprisingly, done by, as far as I can tell, the same team that did the first two, but it is noticeably an improvement from the other two. I don't know what happened to the um, the writer, I guess, because, I mean, Kenneth Brown has been directing for so long now, it would surprise me if he, you know, learned, quote-unquote, like, how to direct a film better between two movies, but it's not impossible, I suppose. Um, he's made fun of for his work in Thor because of the Dutch angles. While I think that the angles, I've checked a few reviews, are made fun of slightly in this film. I think they have so much more purpose. Not that they don't have purpose in Thor, um, but it was something that struck myself and Rags quite quickly when re-watching this, was uh, the choice for where the, dis not distorted, like angled uh, view of any of the scenes went when that mainly takes place versus not. It uh, felt very deliberate, a lot of the choices, both yes. in script and in direction. And yeah, I would have a lot of compliments to... The performances and the themes. <gasps> womp womp womp. Gadzooks. Yeah, we should Gadzooks. talk about themes someday. Uh, we should uh, well, get together. Well, one last thing before we start about. talking about almost anything is uh, I recommend this film. So we're about to spoil the hell out of it, which means yes, you best go watch it first if you find what we've talked about to be something of interest to you. You may not enjoy it, but you also may. Who knows? So consider that yes. before you start listening further. I second um, this. I really like this movie, and I think you should see it if you're interested. So we will be spoiling the fuck out of this movie, which means if you want to see it, leave now. Go away. Be gone. Mm -hmm. And then watch the re-upload once you've watched the movie. Yes, which so, will promptly be placed to those upon of you, Mula. To those of you who are departing to watch the film immediately, immediately, I salute you, good sirs and madams. We will see you later. But I know of you staying, there will be a selection of people who are like, eh, I'm not convinced. And so maybe you will be as we discuss it. Maybe. Who knows? 
if our word means nothing to you. But fair enough. That's fine. That's all right. Yes. That's good. Um, but yeah, um, I'm, I'm pretty much ready yeah. to start talking about it. Is there anything else you guys want to talk about first? Yeah. Uh, remember, uh, this is a little bit of setup and payoff. But you know how earlier I set up that I had a drink in the freezer and then I was talking and the chime went off? Uh, I'm in the payoff stage where I need to go and grab aforementioned a beverage before it freezes in the freezer, thus the name. So I'll be back in a moment. Uh, Lil Platoon, you talk about you talk about your favorite rock formation, and I will return shortly. My favorite rock formation mm -hmm. um, is probably uh, a Geo Dude, I think, because it's it's a hardy little Pokemon, um, and like the design is pretty cool. It evolves into it evolves into a Graveler, um, which is kind of shit. But then it evolves into a Golem, which can basically be a tank in your party. Uh, so yeah, my favorite rock formation is definitely the Geodude. I was about to say Geodude's well, the you... coolest looking out of the three of those for sure. Yeah. What are the names of the other two? Graveler and Golem, I think. Yeah. Ah. Uh, yeah, I I don't remember them really. <laughs> I remember what? Um, hold on, wait. Let me refresh my memory. We aren't. Isn't everyone supposed to remember all of the first 151? Most of the second, like the 200, whatever the fuck they added in gold, and, then and then nobody complicated. remembers anything after that. <laughs> yeah, that's about uh, it. Like, yeah, I, I remember him. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say, I'd be surprised if you did. Guy. Yeah, little rock guy with his arms going. Yeah, look at me go. And then he gets a movie like Rocky, but instead it's called Geo Dude. How long does it take to retrieve and, uh, a drink? I'm here. I was there actually. I wanted to wait. I wanted to wait until Fringy was done before I. Because uh, he's talking about Pokemon. I got. I got a. I got some Pokemon cards lately. Uh, recently, I got um, Charmander. Well, maybe I should go in order. I got Bulbasaur. I got Venus. No, Bulbasaur. Bulbasaur, Ivysaur, and Venusaur. And I got. Uh, what the? Oh, Charmander, Charmeleon, and Charizard. And I got. Squirtle, Squirtle, War Turtle, and Blastoise. They sent me two Blastoises by mistake, but that's all right. They're very cool. Yeah, they're worse mistakes. I love. Do. It's good nostalgia, you know. Good nostalgia to finally kind of have. They got a display case for them. They look quite nice. Boy, I sure do love Pokemon. So, um, probably not going to do this the way that we do a lot of breakdowns. I would prefer to probably summarize the basic plot relatively quickly. Okay. And then go yes, back through right. and talk about different elements of it. So, uh, I guess what's interesting is this is the third film in Kenneth Branagh's Poirot series, and it is uh, it begins with him having been like he's retired, which is uh, you, you think like oh it's coming to a close almost. Then his um, I mean maybe his tenure as, as Poirot, which uh, I think they want to make a fourth one, and this one's done well enough that I imagine they they could be prompted to do so. Certainly, okay. it was funny. I think when I was talking about it, I mentioned it ending on a on a cliffhanger, and someone was like, "I can't remember if it was in a stream or not, but I think it could have been when I was streaming one of the games." But someone was like, "That's not how, like, why the fuck do you need that in a who done it?" Like, a, "Oh, come back next." So I was like, "No, no, no!" In like a in like a good way, like in a way that he's reinvigorated, ready for case of <laughs> not like they did. They found the Joker card or uh, some kind of fucking reference to some evil killer and he's going to get him next time. It was nothing like that. It was like a much more positive one. Back when stories, you know, could bait the future in a more broad and uplifting sense. But um, He's back to work. I think Kenneth Branagh has talked about the possibility of doing, I, I hate to use these words, but an Agatha Christie cinematic universe. Oh. Um, because like she weaves plenty of different characters throughout all of her many, many different creations. They actually burn through one of them in this film, though. That's Ariadne's character, because like she pops up quite a lot as kind of a stand-in for Agatha Christie herself to explain like the basics of detective novel writing. So it's kind of like a meta character, but as we'll see in this film, like she doesn't come out of it particularly well. But I quite well, like the idea of Poirot Miss Marple crossover at some point in the future. Having looked over uh, some of the people's reviews of this, most of the negative ones I saw reference to how upset fans were with what they've done with Ariadne. Oliver. Uh, she's not a character they wanted to see fill this role, uh, considering the source material, which, I mean, I'm just not familiar with the source material, so I can understand. Me neither. But uh, I quite like her character in this, obviously, uh, yeah, the role she likewise. fulfills. Um, also played very well by Tina Fey, who you just don't see in much drama stuff. More comedy lady, at least as far as I know. I don't see her in much at all, actually. She's in 30 Rock, right? 
Yeah, she was. Uh, I feel like I haven't seen her in a movie for a while. She was in Mean Girls. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I guess that means that she would have been in the, the, the remake one that they did, right? Oh, maybe, yeah, that could make sense. Um, oh, that came and went, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I think it made a lot of money, though, so... Oh. She wrote Mean Girls? That's cool. Did she? Okay. I did not know that, if that's true, even. I just read it from chat. Anyway, he is retired, Poirot, and he is uh, 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 met by Ariadne, his, his old writer friend, who uh, invites him to a palazzo where she believes that a uh, woman is going to perform a seance that uh, she has seen previously and believes to be real, and she thinks it will defeat Poirot, or rather that uh, she wants Poirot to defeat her. She wants to put them together, and uh, uh, she's also expressed like an, a, a thing of how she's dried up on books. She wants ideas, inspiration, she wants to have a hit, so this seems like a really good idea to her. Which, um, as with most things told by any character in this film, you get like the half-truth at first, and then you get the full amount later, which changes a lot of context. In any case, they end up going to this palazzo, and the uh, Michelle Yeoh plays, uh, I think her name is Joyce Reynolds, is the, she's the medium, and um, portrayed extremely well. It's always nice to see her in more and more stuff, because I think that everything every all at once has basically made it so her career is now just, like, just rock solid. She'll have no trouble getting roles that she wants. Though, as far as I'm aware, she's in Star Trek Discovery, like all of it. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> oh. She was also in that one of the... Oh, she is. Was she in like one of the Witcher shows or something? She was in some uh, fantasy yes, show. Blood Blood Origin. Origin. Was it Blood Blood Origin? Origin? I think yeah. it was, yeah. Um, so, you know, not, not all bangers. <laughs> it's a shame, but uh, I thought she was really, really good in this. In any case, um, you know, they, they do the seance. There's a lot of evidence of strange, spooky things happening that are almost unexplainable. And uh, as the night moves on, there are two murders. Horrifying. And by the end of the film, Poirot reveals, despite many different difficult circumstances and all kinds of players involved with all kinds of devices upon this fateful night, who the murderer is, and uh, we reach the end. I guess that's a sort of a summary of, of what to expect. It's not so, yeah. too far outside of what you may have expected in general. It's, um, I think it's a decent blueprint for a whodunit in terms of a broad sense. You know, things turning out to not be as they seem. I think so. Yeah. Um, well, I guess it's an interesting one in, in that it is trying to, you know, tease the supernatural elements to be like, ah, yeah, there so are some things maybe you can't explain, ooh. That's, that's uh, what's awkward for me. Someone, I've, I've seen it said before, people don't like uh, him having to go up against the supernatural, and that might be very fair from, you know, having consumed a lot of his source material, the stuff that he's in, that he, that's not something they ever touch. And a friend of mine even said that they weren't a huge fan because this film essentially makes it fact that the supernatural exists, which I don't agree with. Uh, I don't agree with that either. And, and you know, I said that to them, and, and they were like, oh, well, you know, I guess you can interpret it that way, but the, him going up against it at all just doesn't seem like the kind of story you should be having for him when it's the complete opposite for me. Uh, I was actually more interested by this story because of the fact that you're putting someone who is definitively, like, lives in reality against stuff that he can't quite explain. It makes it much more I challenging think it's just to a, him. A fun idea in its core of uh, if, yeah. if you have a character who is very intelligent, um, and you put him in a and and the many characters are kind of looking at the situation like you know as a viewer would look at it, which is I wonder how he will handle something that is dealing with uh, elements that are sort of by their very nature uh, more difficult to explain logically that just don't appear to. Uh, uh, don't appear to be congruent with like the you know the laws of reality as we understand them. That feels like a fun sort of place to put this kind of character because it's a kind of challenge that you wouldn't typically see them have to deal with. I think uh, it, it works. Sorry, well, because it works really well. I think it's just right up until the end point because it's not. It's more of an Arthur Conan Doyle type story in the sense that, that the supernatural is involved at all. It's something that Arthur Conan Doyle quite liked doing and had no real trouble putting Sherlock Holmes against things that seemed to be supernatural and in some cases actually were supernatural. I think Agatha Christie did it a couple of times with Poirot, but the whole point of it was always supposed to be that 
he's so intelligent that what seems to be supernatural ultimately is revealed not to be. This is just people being very, very clever and also very, very scummy. So he can see through it by the end. But like, there's not a complete absence of supernatural ideas in there. It's just that they are, in fact, grounded in reality. Um, and I thought that worked pretty well in this one because the, it's a fairly common place in, in detective stories this sort of thing happens. It's just right at the end when they do broach the prospect, at least, that the supernatural is real, which is when I, I sort of slightly switched off. I didn't hate it. It's just that I could think it would have been more satisfying had it not been. But that might just be like over familiarity with the way these stories usually go. Um, for me, that was the furthest they can possibly go without breaking. And, you know, that was the thing that the friend referenced, actually. They said that uh, it's, it becomes fact that there is a ghost that kills someone at the end. It's like, well, no. What we have is the perception of an unreliable narrator, right? He was drugged. We yeah. don't know what he actually did see. It could very well have been her backing away from him and she falls over the edge, but he interprets it as the ghost chucked her off sort of thing. Um, we saw that a couple of times throughout the movie where he was seeing something that wasn't there. The very overtly well, explained I think, it. Um, I think even the some of the lines that were said in the ending feel like they're kind of addressing the that's up to you whether or not you think that was real. Uh, yeah, which I think is a so bit more I preferable. I just yet. I totally I, understand I and appreciate a definitive no. There is no supernatural. It's like, okay, you could tell that story, but I also like the angle of just being like, we've got all the explanations for the people who want it to be absolutely real, but we've also left enough room for the people who maybe want to believe a bit more in the supernatural that you can. Like, uh, it feels like a bit more fun to be slightly open, but uh, I really do think that if you were, if I was forced at gunpoint to choose whether or not any supernatural shit exists in this film, I'd say no. Likewise. I don't know I how strongly agree. they stress it in the, the previous versions of this. So Poirot's big shtick, you know, all the way through his many depictions, his utter faith in the grey cells. He always mentions the grey cells. Like, he's got immense faith in, in rationality and his ability to understand human nature. Um, so I think it's... I, I get leaving it ambiguous at the end for the audience's point of view. I think... I, I don't know how well they stress the grey cells shit in the Kenneth Branagh film, so maybe it's just not as big a part of his character in these, but leaving it ambiguous for him, I think, is maybe slightly out of character, because they also tie that into his, you know, rediscovery of faith, don't they? So it's like, he's seemingly accepting of the possibility that there is a supernatural explanation for it. And I don't know, the Poirot's that I've seen probably wouldn't be in that way, but, yeah. I think it's, by the end, the she, does, can work. she does say, right, you saw something and he says, I was under the influence, my subconscious yeah. mind assembled facts ahead of the rational, which is something I think this movie does very well like actually uses a rational, normal, human, sort of mechanical thing as a way to imply the supernatural, but it isn't. That's, um, mm -hmm. I would actually argue that's, a, that's a, a, a prism of this whole film that I'm actually pretty appreciative of, is that a lot of elements are trying their best through writing and directorial uh, aspects to convince you that normal things, they present normal things in a way that makes you feel like they're not normal at all, which I quite like. Because uh, by the time you hit the end, a lot of it is it makes complete sense or can be explained, which uh, he does explicitly say is the thing he's here to do. And I feel like by the end of it, it's reaffirmed even just by moving that uh that uh cup and saucer on the table, uh, uh, yep. symbolically. Things get put back in order by Poirot. Is what he does. There is a I think the film does a really good job at establishing that. And obviously going into these, you don't necessarily know exactly what to expect, but it really puts you into the space that the characters are in where they're in this palazzo, it's night, it's Halloween, spooky stuff is going on, how could there possibly be a rational explanation for it? Then, you know, all the events occur, and then by the end, you know, you're out in the sun, and it's the next day, and um, it, it's, it's very, it feels not claustrophobic or trapped, but it just feels like it's really excellently sort of contained as a place it's mm -hmm. it's like it's it's a good it's got that haunted house vibe to it that leans into the oh is are there spooky supernatural things and sort of stuff so that's it's an element the film does really really well um i think the 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 notion of like the light revealing all or whatever uh, there's um lines that relate to the well, maybe I'm getting a bit too far ahead. We could talk about some of the earlier stuff first. <laughs> but, like, this, is what yeah. I mean. this conversation is going to be a bit of a darting back and forth. Uh, kind of, yeah. Because um, a lot of things will harken back to previous 
previous events, things you might not notice the first time. Um, you're not gonna. I don't think you're gonna. Be, you're not gonna be able to pick up everything on a first watch through. And I think yeah. it was kind of definitely designed in that way. There's a deliberateness to the way that this is shot, um, and sort of, I guess, structured as well. Even from the first seconds of the movie, you're treated with this very off-center, dreary, uneven, things aren't quite right imagery. Yeah, which is taking place more so uh, in his subconscious slash dreams, right? If that's how we to believe that, because the daylight sort of cinematography is all very strict and static and symmetrical even at times. Um, Yeah. One could even call it safe uh, in terms of just, there's an implication at the beginning of the film that he has figured out everything. Everything is in order and everything is protected. He's in a little fortress. And it's partly due to um, at least what this film posits, which is that he's been around death so much that he's, he's had enough, retired, and now he's living a life of what one could call indulgence. Just uh, taking care of himself and, and he's happy and safe. And I think that the opening you know, five, ten minutes captures it quite well. I mean, it's, it's overtly stated by Ariadne as well. She says, I mean, happiness uh, is not satisfaction. Yes, I like that. I thought you would like that as well, Fringy. That sounds like a line that you'd like. Yeah. yeah. Love. It's, uh, it's, um, it makes you think, don't it? Hmm. <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's right at the beginning of the movie, so that was, uh, it's kind of like, you know, if it was like in the first portion of the movie, whatever sort of lines that pop up like that, it's like, ooh, we're doing, we, we're setting up theme here, aren't we? You know? <laughs> well, being in Venice, as she describes as a gorgeous relic slowly sinking into the sea. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. His, yeah, it's like his protecting mm-hmm. of himself is slowly killing all of the potential he has. Yeah, like the the potential he has as this agent in the world for good. Yeah, and of course in that scene you have her explaining her desperation to get a good book because uh, hers have flopped recently. And that's, um, again, like something I was trying to imply earlier was that she gives you good reason for why she's so obsessively trying to get him involved in this whole thing, but she simultaneously is running essentially a whole project on him to trick him and to then write a book about how she successfully fooled a man who she helped build the profile of into being a genius, which she clearly has a bit of a bitter resentment for that because he's still famous, he's still sought after while she's uh, slowly faded away, even though she had 27 bestsellers, I think she said. 27 bestsellers, but the last three flopped. They were not so Small beer. Small beer is the way they were described. She wants a big beer book next. I actually, I like that misdirect. That was quite well done, I thought. Um, is that you, you kind of get used, once you've seen enough of these murder mysteries, you get used to the, the scene in the room where Poirot stands effectively on top of everybody else and just relays exactly how things are. And then you kind of think, oh, okay, so that's the mystery solved. Um, but the way that they, they do sort of the, the preemptive version of that, which is mm-hmm. that it actually is not quite that. He's correct, but this is not the, the crux of the mystery. Um, and it, yeah, it goes back to that point. Every character in that has the, the one essential sort of setup beat, which is going to have to be paid off and exploited later on as a misdirect i think everybody has at least one kind of misdirecting moment that's quite satisfying also like the, the little things when um you know he's, he's writing down lists when the investigation has started and he gets slightly frumpy and affronted when like the, the people he's speaking to assume that he's copying the version of him that she wrote yeah um that was quite a nice touch i like that yeah because a lot of it also the influence is presumed that he's like stolen it from her books when a lot of what have she's written about, at least in this form of the fiction, is going to be inspired by what she saw of him, which she does explain at one point as well. And to contrast between this uh, Poirot and uh, the awful Benoit Blanc from the terrible <laughs> Ryan Johnson movies, um, I do not believe for one second, as should no sane person, also believe, but there's no way that I believe that this is actually a famous detective that anyone would give the time of day. Whereas this movie, very early, establishes that he is a well-known name. People do know who he is. People wait outside of his house hoping to have him solve their mysteries. Uh, and then, as Little Platoon sort of uh, set up a bit, his, the, I suppose the, the quote-unquote faux reveal at the B, you know, sort of the near of the mystery, it lets you know his process and how he looks at things and his way of going about stuff. So you can very quickly respect this character and get into that by believing he can really exist. 
you believe the reputation. Kind it's of not funny just that a you uh, explain that because uh, the beginning of uh, the 2017 Orient Express begins with him solving a mystery, uh, but that one's played out. Plays out. It's obviously meant to be like, oh, look at how impressive he is. But like, it was kind of cartoonish. A little bit, uh, yeah. At least in that movie, like it was, it was silly, but it was essentially trying to achieve the same thing of uh, establishing that he is, he is good. He is good at what he does, uh, and you can see that for yourself rather than essentially just having it be asserted by the writer. And he's got an he's got an actual personality as a I this is this is which is fine. It's becoming sort of I guess a discussion on our protagonist, you could say, um, Hercule Poirot. But he's I really like him in this movie. He has a personality. He has mannerisms. He's not cartoonish. He is a person that you can believe is a real person who has been around for decades. He's an older man, uh, an older gentleman, and he has this incredible talent for logic and picking up on details and connecting dots. Um, so there's never a moment in this movie where you're like, ah, that, that person couldn't really exist. This is just the, the silly detective trope. They do a lot of work to establish and get you to believe him, as they do all the characters, I would say. But particularly important for your protagonist, who's... Uh, doing the mystery solving. Yeah, I think there's a sharpness to him that's never lost, and I quite like how much like self doubt he has. But mostly in the scenes where he's alone, which he does, the recuse yes. himself to the bathroom a couple of times to have a moment because this case is incredibly stressful and he's been drugged, which he doesn't know. So nothing is quite as it seems, sort of thing. But then when he's in front of other people, you have Ariadne almost throughout the film undermining him first in a friendly jabbing way, and then later as like an actually aggressive sort of tearing him down kind of way to help cover up her role in this uh, story. And I like how because he takes like, it. That goes in a bit of an arc, that doesn't? Because I, she, she eggs him on it at first, and then so you, you can kind of get the sense that he's getting too close to to her particular hidden truth when that moment flicks she stops saying things like oh he's back or he's on it now and starts saying oh no you you've clearly gone too far you're, you're clearly losing too your far mind. Gone. Yeah. losing your mind well, yeah, stop it now but even earlier when she's like uh wow you know the the doors blowing open that this that is like it's unexplainable oh wow imagine the name of the book you know like uh uh, the woman who you know stumped Hercule Poirot and he's just like what the fuck no like i i i haven't even had like a second to think you know, because she's she's so desperate to get to that, which is the uh, the medium and her plan wins. Like it actually defeats him. Which um yeah, that's another compliment I'd pay to the film. You have three characters being the cop Joyce and Ariadne running their own sort of racket here. Then you have Leopold uh, and everything he had with the blackmail and his father running. Then you also have Rowena's in, in, you know attempt to get rid of the blackmailer. Um. These are all significant, like, designs upon what's happening in this house, but they all aren't necessarily dependent on or aware of each other. And they're all happening at the same time with different clues and different motivations and different lies. And that's why it does kind of impress me, this film, with its dynamism. You have Poirot having to unfurl all of these different uh, plans from all these different people that, you know, when you're watching it, and, and especially for him, you assume there's one big deceit going on that includes some or a lot of or maybe even one person but it's actually like several plans at once the duel have like a common core being the uh, the, the initial murder more multifaceted mystery rather than just the singular yeah you know who who done it in the sense it's like ah uh, but there's yeah there's another game at play uh which especially in you know talking about how they have a similar core but they're in some sense disconnected in a way that that uh kind of works in favor of the film by going for a supernatural thing that you can have a lot of things happening that don't seem to have an apparent connection and that, and really all that does is it contributes to the sort of sense of like wait something is wrong uh and but further motivates him to actually figure it out and it's super fun in a subversive way as uh, platoon was pointing out when you what 20 5 26 minutes into the film where he does his patented like here's the truth i've revealed it all even in a Having yeah. like people revealed in the scene, and uh, it was on a second watch through that I started to really appreciate. Uh, and I actually think it's better than the other two films. Um, his performance as Poirot, I feel like you get a big sense of his um, frustration with being tricked, and like how good he feels to be able to point out what is true. He's got quite a righteous indignation, but the second that things get worse, so to speak, you know, at first you have Michelle Yeoh's performance, which he's a bit confused by, and then the doors blowing open. 
things falling over, the disappearing toy. He's like, I can't actually explain any of that. Fuck. Like, it's a cool way to undermine Poirot earlier in the film, to have him be like, right, I've got all my pieces, I'm done, and then a whole bunch more of the Jigsaw's revealed. And he's like, shit. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's cool. And then, and then having, like, the line sort of address it, but the, the response kind of, like, from the film broadly being, well, yeah, but just because I can't explain it right now doesn't mean that it's, you know, like, give me time, <laughs> like, let me figure it out. Because he, even though it shakes him, he's still got the belief of, I can figure it out by doing what I normally do. Yeah, well, it kind of keeps you on your toes, keeps the tone uneasy. You don't, there really isn't that sense of, as he is solving things sort of that first time, you get virtually no time to sort of enjoy the cathartic element of, you know, the detective has done it again before things, you know, sort of ramp up once more. Uh, you don't really get that until the end. You're constantly kind of on your toes, looking around. Things are, you know, shifty. And I think it does a good job of making the audience go like, whoa, 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 whoa. What is going on then? Wait a minute, yeah. Because I like, oh my God. it's like, that was clear evidence that the medium is fucking with us. But simultaneously, is she fully fucking with us? And, uh... Again, as with a lot of what I believe, I essentially think that they work to do all of it, uh, everything in the film, have an underlying uh, mundane explanation. Maybe mundane isn't the right word, but the fact that she believes she is absolutely hearing voices and translating, you know, trauma from the dead to give them peace, to let people know what happened to them, that whole thing, while the film offers that she's a very traumatized woman. That makes her woman. feel better. Yeah, it does. She does. The, she does the way that her. she. Yeah, the way that uh, she gets over her. I guess we'll kind of bounce around character to char character to character as we sort of progress, but when you listen to people give their reasons for what their histories are, how they feel about things, what gives them satisfaction, you can sort of understand all of their actions better, which is, I mean, it's like good basic character stuff, but it's really nailed well in this for everybody. And the way that I kind of had mentioned earlier, it's not at all necessary for all of the characters because you have a good, basically like a dozen characters and they're all distinct and different and they have their own motivations and reasons for things and relationships with different people involved in the story. So it's, it's just all, it's all very neat and flavorful as a movie. There's so much more flatness in other stories uh, that focuses too much on maybe just Poirot, or just a couple characters. Mm -hmm. Whereas in this, I think they go beyond. You have this big, rich cast. Well, I mean, we could start We're with talking only... about Joyce, because she does, uh, she's only in the first act, so to speak. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, I, something I was thinking about while we were talking about, I guess this includes her, is uh, the, the idea that, like, every character in the story is given they're provided like a they're provided an actual explanation for why they would be more inclined to either believe or disbelieve or present believing or disbelieving in the supernatural elements which is cool because mm -hmm. it feels like you could get away with just having the characters believe it just because you know it's like oh well you know i just think there's more to the world than that or whatever instead of having there be either reasons that are rooted in you know like the, the more fundamental philosophical beliefs or um, things that they're trying to present as part of their own personal schemes to kind of cover things up. Um, uh, I guess it's interesting. Yeah. Well, it's it's the the setting itself. It lends itself well to this the to the attitude that a lot of characters have. This is takes place in 1947. This is Venice. Venice is in Italy, allegedly. And uh, you know you got the Vatican City in Italy. It's you know Europe. It's the 1940s. People are very religious. It's it's that part of the world. So. It's not unusual for a lot of characters to just have this sort of attitude. And it's not unusual, just the same, for other characters to say, nah, it's all bullshit. Or for people to take the fact of, like, oh, I might be, you know, religious in this element, but dealing with ghosts and spooky things, no, 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 don't do that. Yeah, I'm not about that. So we do get that good, you know, a, a, a diversity of, uh, of opinions here regarding that. Yeah, we even get, like, not just different reasons to believe or to not believe, but the people lying about whether or not they actually do, right? Like, Leopold yeah. spends the whole movie trying to fan the flames on the ghostly element uh, somewhat. He's, and and well, he's... Uh, discredit uh, Joyce as well. 
Well, yeah, it's interesting because he clearly believes in some supernatural element in one sense, but he's like, yeah, Joyce is a fraud. Yeah, she's yeah. a liar. Um, which is the same. I mean, that's, I mean, it's not, that's every religious person thinks their religion's correct and the others are wrong. That's, that's just, it's a normal thing to see. So this is like a different take on that element. A lot of people who believe yeah. in the supernatural also believe in fraudsters. I mean, every religion warns of false prophets. Um, so if we were to start with Joyce, I found that, uh, and this, this applies to throughout the movie, there's usually one sequence that gives you a lot of information about a particular character and then it makes them slot in extremely well. Uh, it's so easy for a character like Poirot, and I think the audience somewhat, with, with a medium to be like, yeah, you're, you're, you're full of shit, uh, obviously. And their conversations, almost every line that's shared between Poirot and uh, Joyce is excellent as far as I'm concerned. Uh, stuff that, th that was some of the lines between them was some of the stuff that was actually like dragging me toward the film. I was like, that, that was particularly interesting. Um, Even, yeah, the when they first meet and after the seance, there's just a lot of it really does give you the sense that these lines were chosen very deliberately. They take, they take advantage of opportunities. You have Poirot, his skepticism about things, the way he sees the world, contrast that with hers and what she's doing. Is she real? Is she not? What does she truly believe? Um, they don't waste these exchanges and interactions. Every, every like, conversation has something of value. There's no, there's no real, there's no chaff in this movie. Um, and with her, they do a good job at sort of making you wonder what's the extent of her own belief is she a fraud does she really believe she can do it if so how is that possible there's this yeah. uneasiness about her she, well, she kind seems of... like... sorry for... oh uh i was just gonna say that uh it, it seemed that she uh she actually had a lot of uh answers to kind of like poirot's yes. questions and jabs like she was prepared to deal with the kinds of things that uh, he would say to her. Yeah, like she's been doing this, like she's been doing this a while. These are questions she's heard before. She's used to the skepticism. She's not antagonistic to it. She's not like, oh, I can't, I can't believe you don't believe that I do. But she's used to it. So she has good, intelligent answers to things that are meant to make you think about stuff. Um, I think one of the best lines or short exchanges would be when she says, essentially, it's sad that you, when she's talking to Perot, she says, it's sad that you don't believe, you know, in, in these, like, ghosts and supernatural and stuff. And he says, yeah, I, the truth is sad. Um, you know, it's a yeah, they, it's, it's very sharp sort of cutting of their two They bob ways each other, like, the world. him basically calling her an, an opportunist, preying on people. Um, and then her counter is, you don't believe in the soul. Like, that doesn't address what he's saying at all. Even if he does believe there's a soul, it's, he's saying you're lying to people. But, but it's like, it, it flips it back around on him immediately as like a flaw in his perspective. And then him saying, I've lost my faith. And then, you know, the, the oh, how sad. But uh, yeah, the, as, you, as you point out, it's the kind of thing that you like to hear that both of them aren't backing down. Instead of like some it's shitty line about how, no, you're wrong. Because like, the, the order of operations makes that curious because you, you're right you, all of that is present but quite quickly you know upon seance beginning Poirot does reveal that the very quite simple mechanical tricks used behind it because he's seen these things a thousand times before um which ordinarily you'd expect would just rubbish the medium entirely but actually you know she continues as, as though she is a true believer even after the mechanical trick mm -hmm. has been revealed um which slightly I, I can't I don't know exactly how to feel about that because like you're right. I mean, it, it does pose the question about how true her belief is, but also, I mean, does that not also mean that she is simultaneously quite a, a shallow, dull, manipulative kind of bitch that she's prepared to uh, <laughs> I think, I think, amplify her claims I with think they this do a, kind of trick? Well, you've got her two assistants, one of which says, you know, he thinks that it's real. They just play up the showmanship element. To she help does, people believe. She's a little, yeah, she, she herself is a bit cheeky. She tells, you know, Poirot, lighten them up, you know, lighten up, enjoy yourself, that kind of thing. Um, she's not necessarily against, you know, money and fame and stuff of that nature. And there's a part of her that does believe. But I like the idea that it's not like fully in one direction, where it's I'm not fully a fraud. I'm not fully the real thing. I, there is an element of realness in it. And there is also the element of we play this up and... I don't think it's necessarily from her perspective done maliciously. 
as she said, it, it does give her great catharsis when she can make people feel better about the way that she can, uh, that, that she contacts people. Um, so it's one of those, it just sort of, uh, it seems like an organic kind of, well, you know, it, it works out for me, it works out for them. We're willing to not lie, but bend the truth, because, you know, she doesn't think she's lying. So um, I like that element of that, that middle ground that we have with her. I've had flashbacks to that South Park episode, though. Like, who's oh, who's the medium guy, the biggest douche oh, in the universe? Oh, <laughs> damn um, it. I, yeah, I can't remember. Oh. Uh, Edwards? Something Edwards? Um, damn it. Jonathan uh, Edwards? Crossing over with Jonathan Edwards? That might be it. It's an old yeah. show. Yeah, it's a show. And then he says, oh, but, but I'm bringing happiness to people. Like, you know, I'm making them feel like their relatives are still out there. It's like, no, you're, you're being a dick. Life is difficult. Stop doing that. You are the biggest douche in the universe. Well, we <laughs> well, have the um, yeah, they do have we, that. We get recognitions. Forth. We we get from multiple characters too. Recognitions of, like, oh, I'm I'm making this person believe that you know the daughter's soul is still here, and someone's like, yeah, you made her believe that the soul is there and in torment and stuff like that. So there's a lot of exploration into the reasons why people disapprove of things. Um, you have the you know purely religious element from, uh, or the, at least the mostly religious element from. Uh, the um, oh, what's her name, Semenov, Olga Semenov, and you have the more like it's it's just a cruel thing to do to people to make people believe certain things from you know Poro and the um the chef forget his name um, gosh, so many names there's a lot of characters, but yeah well explored stuff and I I was like no one no one's like zero or a hundred in this everyone feels real because real people typically aren't like super on the extremes. They've got that personality that mixes with what their goals are, and that's where you get a good character, where well, all those things uh, mix. It's balanced in the sense that it feels that everybody, it, even, if they, even if they line up on it's real or it's not real, the permutations of them believing that it's real or not real are slightly different, as though to kind of cover all yeah. the, the bases that you could have of like, it's real. It's 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 real in the sense that it's real and isn't that cool. And then it's real and that's bad. Like that's this is yeah. not something that we should be doing. Or um, yeah, yeah she's a charlatan. Like she's just full of shit. And I'm like, it's, it's just bullshit. Um, yep. And multiple yeah, characters like, have that perspective. That's the thing. It's the it is that permutation element of multiple characters have the same general perspective but for different reasons and in different ways. Exactly. So two people could think that she's a total fraud, but for completely you know, different and unique reasons. I, this person might have a connection to this. This person might be deeply religious in this other sense. This other person could be like, now she's just in it for the money, blah, blah, blah. So it's not just two camps of it's true and it's, or, or it's false. There's all these places in between. And some well, people you can imagine are clearly willing to be swayed more than others. It's, uh, I mean, an interesting way to, I guess, contrast is in the case of um, uh, the the son of the doctor, his view being, uh, yeah, I, I think I believe that the, there's, there's supernatural elements, but she's a fraud, versus um, uh, Olga having the view of, I believe it's real, and therefore... And it's evil, yeah. Doing, it's yeah. bad. Evil. It's yeah. like that's that's kind of cool that you could have them, you know, both essentially believe in the same thing, but that it manifests in one of them believing that she is real, that she's real and uh, doing something wrong or, you know, I guess on a like spiritual sense uh, versus what she's doing is wrong just from a more normal sort of human day to day interaction sense. Um, that's like. That's that's got to be you know that's worth something right when you when you have all of the characters have a perspective that's uh that's unique and informed yeah I think so uh... you can imagine I think one of the good little mini tests that you can do for whether or not a story has good fleshed out characters if is if you can imagine two characters in the story who haven't talked with each other if you can imagine what that conversation might look like so. In this, even though everyone kind of interacts with each other in their own ways, if you were to take something like The Lord of the Rings, can you imagine, um, I don't know, can you imagine Pippin and Faramir having a conversation? It's like, yeah, you can, because these are well-fleshed-out characters, and they, you know, converse and talk, so... Um, it, it's kind of like a good little, like, uh, why'd you choose two test. people who did have a conversation? <laughs> I know, I know, I was just telling <laughs> names out. There's a lot of Lord of the Rings, okay? Just choose, like, Gimli um, and Sam. I was about to say Faramir and Sam, and I was like, fuck, they talk too. And 
Gimli and Sam. Yes, you can imagine Gimli and Sam talking. You can't imagine Legolas and Frodo talking. Legolas says, and my bow, and then the conversation ends. As it should. As it should. He's a man uh, of few words. But yeah, something about the scene between Joyce and Poirot after the seance where she explains, and this is, by the way, I'm willing to sort of go over it because I'd be curious if I could be convinced as to how what I think about it as a foundation, but a lot of the trauma for most of the characters, or at least a selection of the characters, does relate to the war. But of course, the uh, era does imply a, a direct connection, right? And that um, part of her trauma is the as a war nurse she would have been surrounded by people dead and dying days after days and it like destroyed her brain you know for lack of a better more psychological term and she would have heard all kinds of screams and voices in her head and until she started to share them as actual like connections to the dead with people she didn't feel coherent right and so like but it was at least somewhat accurate and then would have caused a lot of people to feel better, feel make herself feel better. And as she explains this, because Michelle Yeoh is excellent, she's crying. Like the, it seems very much real from her perspective, and she can't see anything but positives coming out of it. And so when you have mm -hmm. someone like that who's lived that life and come to this p place versus someone like Poirot, I think it just creates really interesting conflict to have both of what two people who consider themselves to be like essentially, as she puts it. Um, people who can speak for the dead or to the dead and for the sake of making the world a better place, but at the same time kind of consider each other their worst enemy. Like when she meets him, she says, you're to prove I'm a fraud, essentially. Um, in, a, in a similar sense, you have the way that, a, a good way that this film, in, in many ways it's very much background and flavor, but in some ways having this be 1947 and after World War II, is the element of PTSD and the mental effects of war are still not really understood. Um, yeah. They're still being discovered and studied. The nature of war has changed. And so people have the, these sort of things occur, especially now that you have these large scale conflicts, you're going to have relatively more large scale, you know, elements of this, uh, you know, the, this mental um, you know, element popping up. So if this took place further into the future, then you might not be able to have the same excuses of it's not necessarily a misdiagnosis, but these are two, you have two characters here who have elements of post-traumatic stress disorder in some way. There's, they're not specific about it. You have yeah. obviously the medium and you have the doctor and you even have Leopold specifically saying they call what he has battle fatigue, but that's not what it is. He's not tired. He's broken. There is, they don't understand what it is, and it kind of means that this lack of understanding can lead to more open-ended, um, improperly diagnosed and treated people, and that leads to things down the road. You know, he doesn't get the, you know, medicine's not where it is today. We don't have the things that we have today. When I think that one could refer to the whole thing as, like, the ghosts of war, right? That's the haunting element of it. I yeah, think yeah. that's kind of the thing Mike Flanagan tries to go with in his haunting stuff. It's all past traumas that are actually experienced between humans as opposed to spooky ghosts just going boo. Yeah, well, it's it's, uh, it's actually something to, to jump basically to the end of the film because one of the lines I found most interesting in terms of, uh, I guess, uh, tying everything together uh, of like how to reconcile whatever you might perceive as the supernatural elements that aren't explained uh, with what could be explained rationally, which was, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but it was uh, in addressing the fate of, uh, of, um, it was Rowena, um, that, uh, he said something along the lines of, you know, we, we all have ghosts and whether real or imagined, like whether real or supernatural, you know, it, it catches up. The idea being that there's like, you know, you could just view it as it's, it's, um, that there's like, there's always, you know, consequence, right. That follows from, uh, from events and choices. Um, and and that and that has an impact on you, uh, and and that the that you got to like you know work through it and, and move through it, kind of addressing the idea of like oh well the ghosts you know it, it, they don't need to be real it could just be like the specter of uh kind of like I guess human psychology or something along those lines. Yeah, it's the difference in perspective which is the interesting one. This is the thing I think that maybe stuck in my craw slightly is that it's very easy to see with. Michelle Yeoh's character and, and with the father who both directly lived through and experienced the war 
and their form of PTSD is is therefore born of very personal experience, of effectively inaction. Even if you know she was technically a doctor, but you know that's still inaction if you're in war. Whereas Poirot doesn't serve in the Second World War. He's too old to have done that. And so his response to trauma... Well, the origin of his trauma is a curious one, and his response to trauma is as well. Because you can say with her character, she's trying to make sense of the world that she has to live in, because that's what she had to do all the way going through. In his case, it, is it disenchantment with the world? And he's removed from it in a sense, but he's watched it happen again and has concluded the best way to deal with this is just to lock himself out of it. And then again, you have the Doctor who's closer to the to Michelle Yeoh's character because he was in it, and so he's locked himself away as well. I, I guess my, my problem was just I'm not sure I have a full grasp on what exactly Poirot's trauma is, if it's not he, just general civilizational disenchantment. He has said there's a number of things. There is an element of, uh, they bring up how um, death follows him wherever he goes. He's mm -hmm. a detective, he solves murders, he's surrounded by death. Um, you have him saying almost... Uh, Forget what he said verbatim, but it was something along the lines of the, the cruelty of human indifference mm. that he's witnessed over the years. There is, of course, you see the effects of the, you know, the, of these two wars, even if you're not a part of it. Um, and e even in a similar way, him and his bodyguard used to be a cop, and the bodyguard said he quit the force because he just uh, finally saw something and he was like, nope, don't have the skin for this, and he had to essentially step away um he even uh, in poirot was a, a police officer as well uh, in his past so that's a line that they you know sort of connect as well like you understand you know you just see things and it's just you know a bit too much for sometimes i think um, he serves in the first world war i think so he's seen action on the front lines it's just I mean, again, maybe I'm carrying in like things that don't actually belong in this analysis because they're not part of this this universe of the character anyway. But like, he serves in the First World War, which is an incredibly deeply traumatic experience. He also has this experience as a policeman, as you mentioned. Then throughout the 30s, he's the Poirot everybody knows. He goes around solving mysteries, happy little detective chap. Second World War happens. I mean, it's That's murder. the it's, cue for him too. It's murders, and like it, he, the way that he talks about it, there is an element of, um, like you, you, it's. I think it's really uh, intuitive to to sort of look at his character in terms of he sees a lot of people who have been killed, a lot mm -hmm. of people who have been murdered, and he sees the effects that it has on the people around them, and that probably takes its toll. And I think the way that he talks about it is, I mean, I I, I think it's I think I mean, it's pretty well established in this. I don't. The um, biggest effect I think that's had on him is that all of those events have made him stop believing that a god would have any control over this universe. There's no, as far as he's concerned, no order, no justice. But I think the key word he uses is there would be meaning if we had a god. That's where he says that there's yeah, too much we would have of everything, the opposite says. in the world, right? Like the, the crime, the wars, the indifference that he concludes no god, no ghosts, and then with respect, no medium that can speak to them. And um, these elements are often part of different conversations, but they all kind of slot yeah, into well, the play. Yeah, well, my assumption is mm -hmm. that he's lost his drive and instead will indulge in life for his own whims until the end. But by the time you hit the end of this film, that, that you know, part of that theme is him understanding that he's running away from his ghosts, right? That he's not addressing them, he's not understanding them, and he's not moving on forward from them. And that I imagine yeah. his meetings with Joyce would have changed his mind too. That her, despite the fact that he kind of hates everything she represents, she's her explicit goal is helping people, like which was what his goal was. And it's like, we're, we're, even if there is no God, that's not exactly not meaningful. But at the same time, I do think that a lot of things are put back in place by the time you hit the end, not because he believes in the supernatural, but because uh, you know everything that he goes through in this film reaffirms the notion that all these different characters are in the pain that they're in. So many people died because of the fact that they're not addressing the the things that they haven't, you know, understood in their own histories. Um, I, I would argue that a lot of the uh, effort in the script writing is to try and connect every character. And I think that um, Joyce is like one of the best sort of foil representatives of, of uh, mirror opposite to Poirot while also existing in a similar fashion to him. That's why, like, their conversation, I think, probably got to him quite a bit. Um, but, uh, you know... That's sort of the point of the, the end scene, actually, is in a way to redeem the spirit of her character, in that he, she's wrong, maybe in her methods, and maybe in her beliefs, 
but in taking action in the world to help people understand yeah. their situation, he comes back and says, well, the way I can do this is restart my life as a detective and, and help make sense of these crimes. Is that what we're saying? Wait, sorry, was that a question? <laughs> I missed that. Yeah, no, no, I'm just trying, yeah, I'm just trying to make sure I, because I, I, I'm, I'm still working through this. Yeah, no, I, I, um... I swear, like five minutes before coming live, but so it, would that be a fair summation then? So yeah, like he effectively is redeeming the spirit of what she's doing by going back and recommencing his work as a detective, is that? I'd, I'd say it's more so focused on him than like essentially, I, I guess in a sense it could be that, you know, like whether her methods or whatever, she is like an active participant in the world and doing it in her way. And he has a way of doing it, which is being a super smart fella and uh, solving cases. That mm -hmm. that that it's like um, the whole the whole story. The kind of purpose is to reinvigorate uh, Poirot to to help people again. Sure. Okay. As someone said, um, I'm not saying you can't do a story where Poirot has a crisis of faith, but that sounds very close to if bad thing happened, why God read it atheism. Dude, uh, uh, that's <laughs> that's not very fair, is it? <laughs> I think um, the film does a pretty good job of putting him through, possibly, especially with what time we're in. It's like, what would he have had to have gone through and know about to have his faith in God questioned? Like, well, we know where we could start, and um, yeah, the supernatural then being a vehicle for him to really question exactly what uh, is correct and incorrect about his decisions that he's made. Um, I thought that the film was filled with very interesting quotes that um, made me well, think a little bit that I'm surprised I hadn't heard before, even though it's something I think about a lot. For example, in the um, a part, another element of this film is that the Palazzo is a place where during I think they said was it during the war that it was um, uh, uh, doctors and nurses took care of children. And then uh, the plague. Oh, the plague! Yeah, the, there's there's the old. So all this takes place on Halloween, spooky because mm. it's uh, Americans have brought the tradition to uh, Italy, and so it's Halloween night, and this takes place in a palazzo where the owner of it, her name being Rowena, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. She is invited. Uh, a bunch of uh, there's like going to be a big party for kids for orphans. So they've got, you know, games and candy and stuff like that and spooky stories. And they tell the story of the orphan's curse, essentially, which is back in the day, this used to be an orphanage. Then the plague happened and plague made people afraid and paranoid. So they locked up all the children in the orphanage and they all died in there. And so the spooky spirits of the kids are still there and they're, they're haunting the palazzo. And if they're a nurse or if they're a doctor, they're going to get you. And they'll leave the the mark of the the children's curse, like claw marks, on you. Um, yeah, because they say the like the spooky setup story. The children were locked inside to die, starving, clawing. Yes. It's just like that's damn. <laughs> um, yeah, fucked up story. Yeah. Well, and, and he says uh, Poirot says, "Is this not too frightening for the children?" And um, the writer says, "Scary stories make life less scary," which uh, is a very simple and almost. You could argue immature line or maybe childish, but I would actually go as far as saying there's a lot to dig out of that uh, with the surrounding movie, especially by the end of it. I think part of what Poirot is doing is protecting himself from anything and everything, essentially. And uh, life becomes a lot less scary when your life is reading the newspaper, eating pastries and enjoying Venice. And um, what he's running from, of course, is all of the cases. And I think that the nature of having gone through this experience has opened him back up to being like, oh, fuck it, let's do this. Let's get in, let's get stuck in. Like, even if a case goes horribly wrong, goes to places that I uh, would never want to visit, that doesn't mean I shouldn't do it in the first place, right? Um, which is something that I think got to him partially by what uh, Ariadne says to him. She says, um, like, you don't, you don't have friends, you have admirers, you're a fool, an ego, a black cloud that lures death, and you know it, that's why you quit. Like, damn. I think, uh, core. well, yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> wherever he goes, death follows him is a thing that he might end up thinking about because of the fact that he is so interested in solving cases and justifying or, or bringing justice to situations. Um, yeah, and I think that's pretty well addressed. This is the thing, I can't speak on it 
from a wider understanding of Poirot as a character. But like, I would even go as far as saying the man in this film isn't quite the man in the uh, Murder on the Orient Express 2017 film. No. Like, they don't feel the same. Um, I way the, prefer uh, the oh, character in this film. Real. It yeah. feels more real. The the one in that film felt cartoonish. A little bit, yeah. Uh, and and part of it really is to do with just the, the quality of dialogue in this is so much better. And some of the thoughtful things many of the characters have to say, even down to the fucking kid. It's just, it does make you wonder, like, what happened? It is the same guy who wrote the films, and obviously, yeah. same, you know, Kenneth Branagh, same director. And well, I mean, there's... it's six years, which is not... You know, that's that's some time, but it's not that much time. As Platoon mentioned, uh, there's more reason as well for this to be worse, being it's an original screenplay, from what exactly we can tell. The adaptation is from... very thin from the original work. Exactly, compared to trying to pull more directly from the original source for that something that already exists. Then the thing that really does free them up to do the things that we're all you know enjoying about this film because there is you, you do sort of have to run with the assumption when you go say and watch the tv show or i guess if you read, i'm not familiar with the books but i guess the same assumption holds is that everything sort of resets after the end and to a large degree this is a guy who if you actually try and put it in a straight continuity sees probably hundreds of people murdered in horribly vicious ways and starts the next story as though he's absolutely psychologically fine um, so if you're doing a straight adaptation of one of those effectively like periodicals, you might be hamstrung by not being able to deal with the psychological consequences. Whereas mm. in this one, because they are free to do that, they're allowed to ask themselves questions that the original stories don't necessarily do, which is how does this affect Poirot as a person? Um, and that creates this this fuller character, which you have to do in the in the film because the film is obviously not in anything like the same style as in, like an episodic TV show or anything like that. I um I like the line when a crime has been committed I can by application <laughs> application of order and method and the slow extinguishing of my own soul find without fail or doubt who done it. Yeah, that was that was kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it feels like recognizing what genre it's in, which is like woohoo, fun, actual. Yeah, it's his an, it's his inflection when he says it. You know, it's uh, you know, it shows that he's aware of that. You know, word. And well, hey, you know what? What's kind of funny is, um, I, I like I said, I, I don't like the the uh, 2017 Motor on the Orient Express, but he did say something similar at the beginning of that film that, like, that that there was a, a certain um, there was a something that he lost or suffered by seeing the world as he does. That, that there's something about it that's um that's just kind of like not it, it just kind of like inherently overarching all the time not fun about seeing the world the way that he does so i guess it's kind of interesting that they had that there in that film but in this one they actually kind of like more so do something with it that, that there is a degree to which there is a, a a toll that's taken by doing this kind of work you also have some funny lines too um Anybody thinking of any over their head? That did, did you find yourself smiling at all with any lines in this? Uh, uh, I, I did, but not. I couldn't. I couldn't recount it to you. No. So, <laughs> what? There. Were, let me see. Well, one for me was I, when he says, "You woke the bear from his sleep. You can't cry when he tangos." That she says, "That's not an expression in any language." He goes, "We continue." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, <what? laughs> it is good. It's. I do like that. Um, I will say though, I really like from a, just like a filmmaking artistry perspective at the beginning, when all the kids come into the palazzo and they draw up the sheet and they have all the puppets and the sound effects and everything and the narrator, it was really like, they didn't have to necessarily do that for the movie, but I feel like they really did a great job at making this like this whimsical, spooky kid story Yeah, that, um, it was just, it was really neat to see that, uh, it was just one of the elements of this movie that really make it feel like it's. You know, real and believable. Well, yeah, and they and show the effort they put in time. to having it happen in a way that's believable that they could have done it then, and then they didn't CGI that. That's all being done. Yeah, they show the puppets and the sticks, and they have the little sound yeah. effects, and the guy with the, you know, everyone's well, got their old costumes. Old costumes, man, bring them back. The, bring back uh, those old costumes. It's something I'd want to talk about uh, a little bit. I was actually, like, uh, we. it was mentioned earlier, but I was... Uh, more consistently impressed with the filmmaking, you know, the cinematography and the sound design and the editing in this film compared to the 2017 Murder yeah. on the Orient Express, which is like pretty fucking dull. 
uh, in terms of a lot of a lot of like bland, boring cinematography. Whereas here, it felt like there were a lot more. There was a lot more use of light, uh, disconcerting, strange angles. One shot that stands out was the one where it was like they had the camera mounted. It was like they had it mounted to Kenneth Branagh, like in front yeah. of him. Like the, when he's rushing know, around. Like when you get the, the... If you go like in theater mode on Halo 3 or something, and you have the camera that sticks to the player, like that kind of... That, I'm not sure what the name of it is, but yeah, I know what you mean. Um, yeah, so, it's really focusing on his expression and his perspective as he's sort of hurriedly moving around and he's in some kind of... Not necessarily distress, but I guess worry, it, or he's under, it, it, under a lot like, of strange kind of angles that uh, you don't see a lot um and it, it just felt that this film was actually utilizing the filmmaking a lot more to bolster the story whereas um it didn't really do anything for the orient express if anything no. it kind of uh there were times where it looked pretty bad uh like s some really shitty green screen whereas as you oh, mentioned yeah. before like a, in this film it's it's uh it's a really cool practical set uh, lots of uh, lots of cool props and everything. It's Apparently uh, called a snorry it's, cam, it's... by the way. Oh, okay. Well, now snorry I know. Cam. Otherwise known as chest battle. cam, body mount, body mount cam, or body cam. But snorry cam is the like around their chest and then yeah. you know held up like a reverse GoPro. Yeah, they used it in thing. the Gentleman actually. There's a couple of examples I remember from. Just in the... It, it really creates a, cool a sense of disorientation of everything around you except the focus of the character in specific of where they want to go what they're experiencing yeah. and yeah similarly this, go ahead uh, th this part of the film i think is one of the couple of times where he's just he doesn't know what the fuck is going on he's so confused especially and, with the uh, it helped bring basement. you into the 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 actual very much disorientation that's going on with him because of the uh like the hallucinogenic uh, honey that he had consumed. Yeah. It's like actually messing with his mind. It's like it's kind of bringing you into his headspace. You know, it's just like, oh, it's a filmmaking, like helping build the story rather than, you know, just allowing the scene to pass by just normally. It seems to me that um, he very reasonably assumes, like the audience does, that the most likely person at first with the basic information we have is probably um, Maxime, I think his name is, the boyfriend. And it's very much the obvious red herring. Then we get to the assistants who he almost like pushes at a confession out of which she like, runs away and it's like, oh, that's, that's pretty sus. And then we move to, um, could it have been Ariadne considering she actually had a whole bunch of lies. She set up the medium. It's like, oh, this, this is a big old deceit that's happening. And then, you know, once the film gets closer to its climax, it's actually, which is a fun reveal, I think. The one person I, that no one would expect, but simultaneously has no motivation that's been explored. Well, this, uh, I, something that is important, I believe, to the genre of whodunit is the ability for the viewer or reader to reasonably conclude who actually did it based on all of the information that is available to them, rather than doing any crazy shit where you, like, reveal this brand new information that the viewer couldn't have possibly been able to glean from what happened before to figure out who did it. Yeah. Um... And I felt while watching this, because it was about, I think it was like two thirds of the way through, was when I was thinking like, hmm, you know what, I, for the exact rationale that you provided, we've been provided pretty good reasons for basically every character but her, that tells you something, and, and, and gives you reason to conclude, hmm, I think Rowena was the one who'd done it, and so when it's revealed, it's like, yay, I get the fun of... Yeah. Actually, getting to participate in the whodunit compared to something like Glass Onion, where there is no point. There's just yeah, no point. It's, yeah, it's yeah, it's a fool's errand to try and work with. It. You can't work with it. A good mystery movie and story, there, it's almost collaborative. That you want to have, you don't want to hold the hand of the the viewer, the reader, no. but you want to have this element of like you are, you like, here are things you for you to notice. Here are things for you to pick you know? up. You, know you want, you want, it, you don't want it all to hit at the end. You want to set up the things, uh, and uh, you you want to set stuff up. You want to have things that are dropped, hints dropped here and there, and this film does a good job at that. You notice the little things, um, little. It, it it's well, not it, like it, it's a film that rewards you for paying attention to the nature of uh, for the things that you should be paying attention to in the Who Done It story. You know yes. who was where, when, and why. Uh, 
what reason would they have to do uh to do the crime um like how could they have how could they have managed to do it all of these sorts of like little if you're paying attention to these elements as you're watching the story it's providing you and then of course think about the whole idea of misdirection which the film obviously in this case it deliberately did it was trying to direct it very quickly you know early on in the film they try to rule out rowena as a as uh being possible because of the alibi um that feels deliberate you know starting with like ruling yeah. her out first so that it then starts to focus you in on the more obvious candidates like um maxime was the ex-fiance he feels like the obvious red herring of yeah i mean he, like he seems like a likely candidate it's just everybody has a, a reason. Uh, she's the only one who didn't have an apparent one, but there was. Well, when um when they established um, that Maxine was only interested in money, the first thought I had was, "But he's here. Why would he be yeah, here?" Exactly. Yeah, exactly. He's exactly. here. Well, the first time we first the first time we meet him, he says, "You know, I lost too, Rowena." There yeah. Was that, yeah. That line of him Which, saying, um, "Like he's emotionally invested in this," and, and that's an important one to actually because uh because it was it was when he said. When he said that essentially the reason it fell apart is because Rowena couldn't handle the idea of like him being a part of uh, her daughter's life, like that that she that her daughter wouldn't be all hers. It was that line where it's like, hmm, you know, yeah, this has, well, that's this the clever thing with like, his character, right? Like, he's introduced specifically to take you that to both introduce the motive, but also lead you away from putting the motive on the right person. Because exactly. he delivers that all important line, but because he's much more obviously suspicious. You actually go further away from the truth before you get to the truth at the end, which obviously the reveal they do that. that it's the fact that the mother can't abandon her daughter or feel she's being abandoned by her daughter. They do that in microcosm in the scene with um he cuts himself and then she says, Honey's a great antiseptic. He puts it on, licks it, and says, uh yeah. oh, it's not wildflower, I can't place it. And right after he does that, the the slip of his like photo of her falls out of his pocket and Pyro's like, ah. And it's like they needed to get that little clue out and then be like, look, 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 look at this photo. Oh, isn't yeah. that interesting? And it's like, I think, yep. it's just That's stuff like that I enjoy. It's yeah. like the most important scene in terms of laying out all of the information that you, you know, like in the most condensed space to actually figure it out. Uh, but they misdirect, so, which, you know, it just tells you something about the nature of the writing and the, the, the storytelling that they know, oh, we're giving away too much here. Misdirect, get them thinking down that train of thought. Which is kind of interesting because it can be hard to know how people will, um, yeah. I, I, how, you know, you, everybody kind of knows what I'm talking about when you watch a film or a TV show and a character like picks up something or puts an object down and the camera, camera lingers yeah. on that for a couple of seconds, you instantly, it's like, oh, that's important. Like it, it communicates instantly that that's important. And that's like a difficult thing to deal with when you're doing a story like this where you're deliver. Th there's a degree to which the, director needs to simultaneously guide the viewer towards the right answer while also you know guiding them away from that answer yeah, as making well, sure it's not too conspicuous out. exactly that's and why so um that's why tricky. that's why dialogue works so well for this sort of reveal because people just talk talking is normal it's it you know talking fills the screen in a way that it's a different sense that is uh that you know that you're experiencing you're not focusing on uh, dialogue or sound in the way that you focus on a visual object in the frame. So when you have when they go up to the garden uh, at the top of the palazzo and Rowena is saying, you know, all this effort for a teaspoon of wildflower honey or whatever she says, she's just like talking to him. She's just talking mm -hmm. to characters, and you don't you don't know that it's conspicuous until later. You know when Maxime you know points it out, and we get the other little reveals when you get uh, so uh, well, dialogue used really attention. well. Yes, yes, and it really on, does. On a rewatch, it's like, oh shit. Yeah, because yeah, even like it all... the pet name for her that gives away that the medium knows more than one would expect, which was information provided by Ariadne, not known by Rowena, assuming then that she's the blackmailer, because Rowena probably does believe she can speak to the dead, and that's how she's discovered the truth, which is not actually how she knows. She's trying to run a racket which cost her her life, which I think is so interesting. I'll try and talk about more of these elements in a minute. The reason I brought all this up was that that very play that the nickname is from is where she got the inspiration to poison with honey. And it's also uh, the where... Yeah. It's also where uh, Leopold found out that that was a potential because he's read basically all of her books. And that's uh, one of yeah. the ones in her library. Isn't it's like... Cool? Yeah, it's really you know? cool. And it's really kind of something that is... 
you know, not. I don't think many people who watch this are going to come away with thinking about that. It was like, but it is work that was done in the script. It is. And there. it's not easy. That's not easy to have it all line up that uh, tightly. Um, that's that takes a level of uh, forethought and consideration in terms of constructing a mystery, which feels like that's got to be worth a lot. When again, I I know that we're going to keep bringing it up, but like Knives Out and <laughs> like Glass Onion are being held up in high regard as being like, oh, they have revived the whodunit genre, and not only have they revived it, but they're some of the best examples of the genre. That's grim. That's fucking grim. grim yeah. <laughs> all right. We've because we brushed on it, and I don't want to forget saying it, because um, it, it's actually slightly relevant, and I suppose coincidental, because Mahler and myself recently watched Ghostbusters. This is Afterlife. going to somewhere, I promise. Ghostbusters Afterlife, and I caught, um, I thankfully could not finish <laughs> Frozen Empire because I had other things <laughs> to do. Um, talking about the character of Leopold in this, the son, the young, the young man, um, the, the, the boy, essentially. Um, this movie does what a lot of movies can't seem to ever do, which is have a realistic, believable, non-insufferable depiction of an a child. very young character, yeah, of an intelligent child who's well-read, uh, and who is clearly very smart. Um, this film, I think, does it really good, and I'd like to point that out specifically because in my mind, I have Ghostbusters Afterlife in particular still kind of in my, my, my recent memory where it portrays a very young character who is conspicuously incredibly good at fucking everything and she has an insufferable personality and I want her to die. It's got insufferable but dialogue. Le it does. I hate, I hate her so much. I hate, I hate her. I hate her. I hate her. Uh, but Leopold in this is very interesting as a character. His relationship with his dad. His... Um, kindness towards other people, even in the more subtle lines, like when we first meet him and he's in the chair reading his book and someone says, hey, you should have some cake. And he says, no, the cake's for the orphans. Um, you know, he wants them to enjoy it because he doesn't, because uh, he's, he's not a selfish guy. Uh, he prefers certain stories other over, sto uh, over other stories. He reads um, spooky stories on Halloween because he think it's he thinks it's thematically appropriate. You know, a an uh, a, a, a a holiday like this calls for spooky stories. He prefers the more you know serious things as opposed to Charles Dickens, which was recommended to him by Poirot. Uh, Poirot says, you know, a boy your age wouldn't Charles Dickens be more appropriate? And he says, Nah, it's it's Very silly. silly. Uh, yeah, it's silly. And uh, Poirot almost likes... goes to agree as well, which is like a subtle yeah. way of putting them on yeah. the same intellectual level, which I quite liked. Yeah, yeah, I like that. There is uh, also, I think, the reveal of, you know, uh, Leopold's full involvement in the mystery, which he doesn't say uh, in front of everyone. He just says in front of uh, Olga, and it's almost like a personal conversation between the two, where it's like, hey, you know, I know, know what you've been up to, you. Uh, you're a smart guy. But he's still childlike in the sense of, like, emotionally, he's very, you know, he's vulnerable. He tries to protect his father in the fight that he has with Maxime. Mm -hmm. He, you know, has looks of worries and concern on his face. He's still definitely a kid, just a very, I think just a very smart one. With all of that in mind, part of what makes him very believable is the fact that we understand he's had to grow up fast because of his dad. Like, he, yeah, he exactly. recognizes dad... what's happened to his dad. Yeah, his dad even says, you know, like, I, he laments that I should be the one, you know, looking after you. Uh, in fact, it's the last line they share, is um, his dad says, I should be the one looking after you, and Leopold says, you do. And multiple times during the film, Leopold checks in on his dad whenever when his dad has an outburst at the autopsy, um, and he, you know, sm smashes the, I think it was the chair, Leopold hears it, he's close by, and he's there on the balcony, he looks down, and he asks if things are okay. He checks in on his dad at the party to make sure things are alright. He's always, you know, we, we actually see that, where he is around checking in on his dad. Um, it's become, like, you know, habitual out of, you know, the care that he actually has for him, and that is shown both ways. It's very efficient. Like I said, there's no... Things in this movie seem very deliberate. Um, and I well, think it's, what scene could you point to and go, yeah, I probably didn't need that. <laughs> everything establishes, yeah, either tone, sets a scene up well, a character, a motivation, a detail. It's all well, in service to something. Know? Yes, yeah. everything's in service to something. It's not wasted 
This is the anti Snyder movie. Mm. It is. There, there's there's uh, just a point we're, to we're everything. Rebel Moon Part Two: The Scargiver is coming out soon. Oh, oh you're right. Boy. Rebel it's Moon. Good. Somehow when I imagine everyone's going to want us to give our opinions on that one. Yeah, yeah. Coming the, out in the middle of uh, April. No, yeah. I'm not yeah. ready. Soon. And and Get the director's ready. cut for Rebel Moon Part One. Oh yes, God, it's not going to be six through. six hours or twelve hours or hours. two days. Oh no, both yeah. of them together can, though. What would that be? Oh, God, oh, the day that extended. would be the day. That we are both, yeah. Or maybe it's like an eight-hour saga. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah, they'll just say, yeah. "Don't worry about the time; it ends in Y." And like, it was oh, even fuck. more of the scene of the dude flying on the the the, the Griffin, the Griffin, the Griffin, Hippo, the, Hippo, the, Griffin. Hippo Griff, the yeah. Eagle, or yeah. There was even more time, and that was really a holy well, shit. Happily, the, the Pyro <laughs> film has taught us how to make mind-altering poisons from rhododendrons, which I yeah. might consider doing before watching rebel moon part two it might make the experience more fun oh i'll have alcohol at the ready i i don't know if i could face another Zack snyder film lucid i don't know if i could do it i got my limits i might draw my line in the sand here and say listen you know um, no more on the note of uh um, just just yeah. listening to people and what they'll say and stuff they after he, the attempted thing on his life, right, where, where he's almost drowned, which I like as well, by the way, on the supernatural side of things. Even uh, Leopold says, like, you died even if it was just for a second. So now you're, like, you know, uh, connected to the, the other world. So he, says, just to... he says if there are spirits here, they'd be wise to, you know, be near you. And use yeah, you. yeah. I think that helps that anyone watching this and hoping for more supernatural elements is just a aspect but and, it, yeah, when he's... and it's an element of something that you can believe all of the things that leopold thinks you're like oh i bet that's something that he's read in like stories he's read in books there are parts of plays it's mythology there are these elements that he's picked up and has become a part of the way that he sees the world he is he is influenced by the things that he reads which again if you're young um you will probably be more likely to be influenced by the things that you read. And so it kind of owes to the fact that if he was an adult character, there would be a difference. His being young is a meaningful and important element of who he is in this story. Also, it, is funny it also to allows him to be overlooked, right? So he's, he's overlooked. And so his great benefit is that he's probably the only character in it who's not distracted. That's the first line is, you know, don't, why don't you go and join the party? And he says, well, parties are frivolous. Um, he has to pay attention to his dad because of his dad's condition. Uh, he is fully focused on whatever he thinks the most important thing happens to be, which allows him to notice things no other character can notice, which is sort of the, the, the final reveal in the movie is that his his involvement in the entire plot. And mm. he spotted something that he, even his dad didn't spot. And his dad was, you know, theoretically in a better position to spot it. But that's because everyone assumes because this kid is quiet and intelligent, he sits in the corner reading books, that he's not that important. So they don't try and involve him in plots. So he's free to notice all of these things that even Poirot, who is the subject of these many distractions, can't do. Isn't that interesting as well? Because it means that uh, you would never, like, he is essentially ruled out of uh, suspicion in terms of involvement in the plot, but he is actually very significantly involved in being kind of like the catalyst for it all happening in the first place. Yeah. yeah. And like there's a, even the scene when Poirot yeah, comes yeah. out of the bathroom and he says, uh, I assume you, you were leaving me till like, like I was lower on your list or something, um, which is the kid's line you know, to confirm that even Poirot doesn't really consider the kid to be particularly important in anything here. So yeah, that final revelation is that he's the one who pretty, he kind of masterminds the entire thing, actually. He kind of did, yes. And obviously it didn't go exactly uh, as he intended. Uh, well, and that's why it was important obviously. to tell him, don't blame yourself, because obviously yeah. if he hadn't done the blackmail, his dad would be alive right now. Yo, I've... <sighs> yeah, it was... Which sucks, was he? but he, he couldn't have known that. I'm trying to remember the line. Yeah, I was like at the bathroom. It was Leopold. You'd mentioned it earlier. I wish I could remember it. Basically, Pro was like, everyone's on, you know, everyone's on my list. But he wants to be thorough. You know, it's it's that way of not like saying, yeah, you are like you're specifically on my list, not being that open about it. But there's this element of the only you got to be thorough. You know, was, and then he still uses that to gather information, find out what's going on, writing things down. I like um, him. I like the uh, just really good exchanges, kind of every everywhere. Well, what I was bringing up about the um the way Poirot absorbs information, right? Like after uh, Joyce is killed, 
he's just sitting down nursing his sort of his head and just looking around the camera keeps panning back to his eyes like uh just following around each person who's talking you have like the notion that joyce killed herself because she was that type and the assistants are like no she's definitely not the person to do that and um uh, Ariadne said she talked about a murder. Maybe she knew something. Just a, you know, it certainly spices it up and could be a motive. And then uh, you have Maxime say, "You still think she's real? Like she made up the whole thing to impress the author to bait the hook on a new income stream?" And then she goes, "Well, why is she dead?" And he says, "Gravity." Like obviously, meaning he thinks it's suicide. Like it's the kind of shit that um, you know, he's just paying attention to what everybody is expressing. They genuinely believe right now. But it could be a combination of something they're claiming to cover themselves up. It's just keep listening, you know? Just let everyone fucking keep speaking. Because obviously the second you find someone dead in this place, everyone's a suspect. Yes, I mean, he's, it's, it is Poirot who locks the doors and says, Nope, no one's leaving. Yeah. Uh, and because you brought it up, and I think it is worthy of a bit of repetition, the camera work in this is very good. There is very little, if you were to watch through this movie, there will be a point for a lot of people where you realize things are off. There's an uneasiness, not just in the tone uh, and in the music, which is actually very good, subtle, it's not overbearing, um, but people are constantly to the side of the frame. There's always empty space behind people. There's a shadow behind them. There's a shadow to the side of them. Their face is on the left. Their face is on the right. The camera angle is a bit too high, or it's a bit too low, or it's from the ceiling pointing down, or it's an odd angle that a human couldn't possibly have from, like, a corner or something like that. Um, it'll be off kilter a little bit, like the camera's been rotated just slightly. Um, and obviously, there is the element of when for Rose faces in many shots, there is a very slight sway and wobble. It is subtle. And I didn't even notice it the first time watching this movie. But the second time, I noticed that a lot of times when Poirot was the one who was in the frame, again, typically either to the left or the right, but never in the center, um, there would be a, that very slight camera wobble that wouldn't necessarily be there on the person that he was like, having a conversation with when they cut back to them. Cameras are constantly shifting in the perspective. It's a very dynamic and snappy kind of change, that is oddly subtle for how conspicuous it is once you notice it. You get that sudden realization like, oh, this movie shot really weirdly, but not in a bad way. You just kind of notice it that things are off. Um, it is, it's a, it's a thing I really like about the movie, and it goes to show that things aren't wasted in this film. There's a clear, deliberate direction to using the camera's visual element to tell a part of the story and to play into the themes that are being explored. I think there's a distinct difference between shooting at night and shooting at day as well. The uh, control of oh, yes. the camera. Um, there is a scene at the very beginning where, forgive me if you've mentioned this specifically, uh, I know we talked about it when we did a rewatch, um, but it's very, there's a scene when, he, when at the very beginning, it's still the daytime, beginning of the story, Poirot's at his house in his courtyard, he's sitting down, he's got his nice pinstripe suit, he is in the exact center of the frame. You've got the sky up top. You've got all of these ordered buildings behind him. He's at his table. Everything is normal. Everything is structured. Everything is in its place. And it creates this obvious distinction between where he is in terms of his frame of mind, but also you know, physically in his own space, between what happens throughout the rest of the movie where... He's not quite right in the head, and he's got some doubts, and there's some spooky shit going on, and they're in this dark palazzo at night, and it's Halloween. Oh, boy. Uh. So, and then visually, at the very end, it's the next day. You know, daytime, things are bright, people are out and about, and the movie ends with this big, sweeping, grandiose shot of Venice and him on the rooftop and getting back into the swing of things. Yeah. So, it's full of color as well. You can even see it in the frame that's on screen. It's like yeah. very vibrant, whereas there's uh, very clear, strong, darker tones. Uh, not not just obviously in the lighting, but the color scheme uh, in the in the palazzo throughout the whole, like lots of like green or like dark green kind of yeah. dark yellow oranges, um, a lot of those sorts of colors, as opposed to the much more like naturalistic, vibrant 
uh, colors of the outside daytime world. And also, it's the uh, they play really well into the believability of the palazzo through the kinds of lighting. Sometimes faces will be illuminated by flames on the wall, lamps yeah. that have colored shading over them when they are... I remember it's a very whitish light that was in the kitchen when um, uh, Poirot, Ariadne, and Olga are talking in, in the, the kitchen area, and the light is a very flat white coming from up top. There's always, like, for how dark the movie is, it's like a good kind of dark, where rooms are... It's, it's like... It's illuminated rather than big... Yeah. You know, sort of set studio uh, lights to light everything. It's not that bullshit darkness where it's incredibly bright, but you just make it blue, and so yeah. now it looks like it's darker. It reminded me of Resident Evil 4's remake, where how the lighting wow. in that was really good. Um, yes, there were different colors and light sources that would give off different moods, and as he progressed through the game and different, like the castle in particular, certain levels and certain areas, depending on how you know dank and dirty and well used they were, they might have completely different, you know, just vibes and decor and lighting sources. Um, you feel like you travel in this movie when you don't. This movie basically takes place in a manor, in a palazzo. But you feel like you go to a lot of different locations because it's shot dynamically and because they make use of many different light sources and because it's, it's decorated well. The um, Alicia's room, for instance, high ceilings, painted with trees, um, you have the, you know, the bathroom, small, boxy, you know, painted a different tone of green. You have the, you know, the, like the library rooms that have all the paper and it's more reddish and brown. Um, there's a lot of, you just feel like you go to a lot yeah, of different right, places exactly. for being in a house. It feels real and it simultaneously feels big and small. And it's, uh, yeah. I, I'm sorry, I gotta mention it because I saw it earlier that I, I was really fond of the, uh, the cockatoo. That was, that was a good yeah. name. Yeah. He was really good. I, the cockatoo. I, saw, I hope man, seeing I, more I, stuff. Saw, uh, I saw maybe thousands of cockatoos <laughs> over the last couple of weeks. You see them all the time, but they're they're really neat birds. Sulfur crested cockatoos. They're just uh birds. yeah, they're just pets over here, pretty much. They're not wild, so. Well, yeah. I mean, a lot of uh, a lot of pet birds come from Australia. Budgies are from Australia. Cockatoos mm -hmm. are from Australia. Uh, from different parts. Look at look at that bird. He's so majestic. Uh, don't let him shriek into your ear, though. That might actually make you deaf. Uh, yeah, they're they they're are, loud. They they are very loud. Look at that, they're, and it's a yeah. fun reference to uh, dude, that that jump scare, <laughs> the original jump scare in uh, in Citizen Kane. Mm -hmm. like, it is a like, it's a good it's a good callback. Yeah, keeps, yeah, I like keeps it. you up and it's, awake. Uh, which yeah, it's it's fun. It's the first thing I thought of. Uh, well, I figure it's got to be a reference to that, right? Because it's the exact same bird making a loud noise. I think it's, but one percent likely that it's not. <laughs> I guess it's, uh, yeah. I guess it's possible, but I would doubt it. I assume, especially yeah. being Kenneth Branagh, right? He's a, he's a, he's yeah. an artist that's been working well, fucking like his whole life. Well, I, uh, I, I think I mentioned it to you, uh, uh, yesterday that it's it i got the impression distinctly that like i this must have been his passion project like doing the uh the poirot films the fact that he's done three of them you know very quickly well yeah and he's like, open to four so it. i'd be curious because um, like obviously doing another one now. <laughs> what's funny is if he does another one i will want to check it out when it comes out now as opposed to yeah, yeah, I look well. guess. my look my expectations yeah. will be high so certainly higher than they were before um, when um, let me see. When I'm uh, just kind of going back and thinking about a lot of the shots, it's it just sticks out oh. to me that this is such a visually interesting movie. And you mentioned it being a passion project. So when I see when I see shots like near the like near the end when they're looking back at the palazzo in the house, they're clearly off to the side, off in a corner, and you get this just lovely kind of ground view of the canal, of the colors of the buildings of the water and its reflections you see the you know the physical location of them having these worn stairs and the worn stone and brickwork and i can't help but think like man when they were there how do you not shoot this how are uh, you you want to tell this 
you want to tell this story and you just like show up to these, you know, relatively mundane places in Venice, but it's like, wow, we we're in Venice. We can make yeah. so much use of this as a setting. Having so... been there, I don't the run. There's no such thing as a mundane place in Venice. <laughs> it's like it all looks like this. So oh, it's, it's the Venice porn thing I was talking about earlier. It's like you can't not use it in a sense. But the, the, the thing that impresses me most about the film is that it doesn't over rely on it in a way. I like the, the, inter the interior stuff in the house is more interesting just because of the, the really innovative and creative angles that they choose to sort of exploit the sense of, of mystery and dark alcoves and corners. It's like wherever the camera is, some little ghosty person could be hiding there watching you from just to drum up that sort of sense of paranoia and the sense of the unknown. The shots like this I like. It's just like, but it's just Venice. It, everything there looks like this. Wow. Well, it's it's say. that in other other movies, I feel like a lot of other people would just have close-ups of the actors with them in the middle, standing on the bridge, and you might get some buildings and stuff in the background. But this is very, very deliberately like, look, they're they're up top, they're up there in the light, they're on the top of the bridge, they're in this space in Venice, and it's um it's so much more interesting than what a lot of films just. Just I mean, it's more interesting do. than uh, is Murder on the Orient Express, which uh, looks Ugh. pretty fake a lot of the time. <laughs> uh, it looks pretty... It, it's that... Now, uh, I, I feel complicated on how much I hold it, because I know that Venice now looks, you know, very, 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 very similar to what Venice would have looked like in the 1940s. Uh, whereas, you know, Istanbul now compared to what it would have looked like in the 1930s by comparison, but th there's like a lot of pretty bad visual effect shots uh, for like environments and uh, Murder on the Orient Express, a lot of really bad blue screen, like they didn't even bother just, it seems like they didn't even bother making like a snowy set that they could just sort of be on. Um, so it was really nice in this film to actually like, make you, use you couldn't of dress real up a train, you know. Like, no, I, I, it's, like it's bizarre. It's a it's a really weird kind of fake looking world. Whereas here, everything felt super duper tangible uh, because right. they were just making use of a place that actually exists. Uh, yeah, there was uh, a good period. You know, uh, I, I assume it's period accurate stuff. Nothing stands out as being wrong. You you see the nuns earlier on, people in the streets, all of the, all the, like the Halloween masks and stuff were clearly old timey stuff. Um, you had some, you know, some soldiers still hanging around. You have the, I think in the in the beginning there's a scene. It's when Ariadne and Poro sit down on a bench and she tells them about, ooh, I come to this seance thing after the palazzo party for the kids. Um, and you have like this little wall of old photographs that probably relates to this war. You have this old monument with a, it had this, I forget what it was specifically, but like this little Italian colored thing placed on this little monument. Um, you had just a lot of, just a lot of cool details that you didn't have to have, but they, they could have had just a mostly empty courtyard area with not much going on, but instead they filled it with people dressed period accurate couple soldiers, stuff like that, references to the war. Um, and it, it, that stuff adds up. It goes a long way to build a vibe. And you know me, I'm all about vibes. I'm a big mm. vibe man. I'm the big, yeah, I'm Beebs. big in the vibe. I love him. I love Ebus. Ebus. So, uh, we mentioned it earlier, but something I quite enjoyed was the nature of the subconscious and how it's kind of simultaneously making him freak out, but it's also something that's really reliable and kind of gives him an insight into how his brain works the um when i know he's interviewing it, i was thinking about that earlier but i i didn't know it yeah when he was interviewing maxime um he looks at the invitation right which we eventually find out was sent by ariadne and uh because she she thought that would just be a really good sort of uh addition to the situation he's like a little bit of tnt to throw in to make it more dramatic but um he looks at the note and we've seen a couple of, like, reference this earlier, but he just, he pulls the word apple out of the several words that are there. Um, but he doesn't even know why. And he, and you got the apple being worked on by Maxim in the scene. And then he, like, almost faints. And she's like, oh, God, are you okay? And then he walks away. She thinks that he's struggling and just getting maybe old or has, like, problems, whatever. But he's just like, why do I keep coming back to the apple? And it's um, it's a really cool thing that totally is a phenomenon that totally takes place, which is your brain has picked up on something that it is desperately trying to push it into view for you, which is that... Yeah, uh, no. Mahler, re remember, but everyone remember, what did she say when they first met on the roof? Only apples until supper. <laughs> yeah, and uh, the 
uh, bodyguard, right? He presented an apple when he said, your friend is at the gate. And uh -huh. what, what's been picked up by his brain is that it's very strange and super coincidental the nature in which all of this has taken place and the role Ariadne probably plays in it. And the apples are just a symbol that's been connecting a couple of things altogether. And yeah, so it's he was like... bobbing for apples when someone tried to kill him. So that's really fresh and big in his mind. There's one on the table. You know, you've, Maxime's cutting one. It's you, when you think back on like, oh yeah, there's been a lot of apples in this movie. And I didn't even like notice it necessarily. It's such a mundane thing to just have apples around and to have people mention apples. It's like, it's just like the stand-in thing for fruit, basically. Well, um, we even have a clock in the film that has back. the uh, Adam and Eve snake and an apple. That's uh, right. Cut to every once in yeah. a while. And so it's just like, yeah, so what is the realms of this fucking apple? And then he figures it out. It's just like, yeah, what, why do you, like, you guys are aware of shit that you shouldn't be, and the organization of this is more impressive than uh, it should be able to be. And, like, that's the there thing was... that my brain was pointing to sort of thing. There's a comment in the chat that just says, Apple is Norse-related. Yes. <laughs> like, oh, it makes me <laughs> laugh because, like, yeah, yeah. The it, apple. It's true. Very the true. apple is behind it all. Apple, um, but apple yeah, it's just related. his brain being affected significantly. Like, it almost kicks the uh, subconscious into a, a gear that makes him think he's seeing things, hearing things. But the, that, right, you have that angle. And then you have the little girl that he keeps hearing, and then she, he actually sees her. And it's right before he cracks the whole case that he sees that the girl that he thought he imagined was uh, looks just like the one in the pictures, which is one that he previously probably saw and was seeing um, as a result of that, like his brain piecing things together, right? So what I guess I was trying to say was that something that could be explained by a normal phenomenon up to this point was almost being treated as though it was him seeing shit from beyond the supernatural or whatever, right? Like it's like, how do I explain any of this? And it's like, oh, it's actually pretty easy to explain, at least somewhat. Um, and it, like, it, like I said to me, I find it really interesting as a process that we have like a brain under the brain that's thinking away and absorbing information and passing it out because we can't, we have a limit on how much we can process at any one time. Um, it's the same thing of when someone asks you for an actor name, you don't have it, and then like a day later it just comes to you as though it was a sent to the second brain to work on. It's something I find interesting. <laughs> Another thing is I've seen, I don't know about you guys, but I've seen scenes in films where I'm like, something's bothering me here. I don't know what it is. Like, uh, something's yeah, wrong. I mean, that's, that's plenty of times where you just have the intuition of like, hmm, the fact that I feel that something is wrong, and then generally it starts to coalesce of like, oh, that's why, that's why, that's why. Oh yeah, this movie sucks. No, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> it all just sort of comes together. Yeah, and I thought it was cool that they implemented that as like an angle for giving foundation to the supernatural but then it was just like no it's just you just think it's like no pretty pretty straightforward sometimes it's yeah your subconscious brain he's there picking things up but the conscious brain he's like where is it well i can't see it's, i can't make sense of it to open your They're... third eye second brain It'd be nice to talk we're, to him. we're talking talking about subconscious stuff is a, a detail i noticed in a second watch through is when he sort of when he hallucinates seeing the young girl, he sees her at the same angle as the photograph that he noticed earlier. So it's, really, yeah. So that, the photo the photograph is of her well, right. kind of from behind. You see her face where she's it's kind of like over her shoulder, but she's looking to the right, and it's extremely similar to the only angle that he gets a close up of her in his hallucination. To the point where it matches the photograph very, uh, very neatly, which is a really interesting kind of piece of detail that he's. Yeah, and I think this recollection of the memory is so. Like, that has to be so reassuring close. to him, isn't it? Like, oh, that's why I saw that in that way. Because in that scene, right, Ariadne is like, "There's no girl. Like, you're seeing shit." But at least now he knows how it came to be that he saw that the way that he did. Oh yeah, like when he picks up the photo and he looks at it, they it lingers on his face where he's just like, hmm, think it's all coming together, and he's piecing it all, you know. Then they have the little flashback where it's, you know, but yeah, well, and also the um, cup and saucer being knocked off the table, leading him to the other side of the picture, and the uh, the notion of the the tea that only happened because the tea was left on close to the edge, and that only happened because of the rushed way it was delivered to the girl at the time, and that 
the room should not be changed in any way, shape, or form. Maintain it exactly as it was, right? Which uh, we were talking about before the stream, but it seems kind of on theme. The uh, the 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 downfall of Rowena, uh, not not to mention the beginning of all of the trouble, comes with her inability to move on. She cannot. Yeah. She, she remains with her ghosts. She can't like deal with the trauma she has to, and so. In a sense, her inability to allow the death of her daughter to really sink in and to move on from it, keeping that room the way that it was, allows clues that existed to maintain existence, and that allows Poirot to have slightly more in, uh, you know, clues to work with, which I think is the last thing he sees before he basically unveils the entire thing. There is um, also, I don't know if it's intended... But I believe in the half of the photograph that had Maxime in it was the one had, that had the vast majority of the flowers in it. Behind him, they because they took the photo in the garden with all the flowers and stuff there. So all of the, you know, those particular flowers were there behind Maxime. Uh, so I don't know if that was to mean anything or anything, but the half Quite that possibly, had yeah. at least in it didn't really have any flowers behind it. But they were very prominent in the half of the photograph that had Maxime in it. Um, but so I'm willing to believe that a lot of stuff in this movie, I, I wanted to just go uh, give this film the benefit of the doubt that things are deliberate and there is a reason why and that there's, you know, there's, there's a reason for things, essentially. Well, so much does seem to work, right? Like, um, I find the second murder quite, I mean, all of it is tragic to an extent. It's just that, like, the nature of a man who, when he describes his story, right, the trying to nurse skeletons back to life and accidentally killing them because you gave them the wrong food and drink without realizing it. To the point where he wants to kill himself, fails, and then lives with the trauma and the guilt. Um, combined with, uh, if you notice, like he's got a conflict with Maxime, and Maxime says that he would never kill him because he has a son. And that uh, it, later on he says, like, don't break down in front of your son. I think he's very insecure about the fact that he's failed as a father. And then the fact that, like, he wrote a letter before he was going to kill himself, right, or even tried. You've got all of that, and, and um, Rowena would know all of this, and so uses it to kill him, which is really fucking sad when he wasn't even blackmailing her, he just loved her. Yeah, it's pretty, uh, pretty sad, I know. He's a doctor, right, so he's going to know exactly where to stab, and probably how to as well, and then all to save his son. Because, you know, he just believes that that's the case and everything. And then just the fact that he's dealing with suicidal thoughts anyway. Uh, it's, uh, I forget the actor's name. One sec, I think I wrote it down. Oh, it's, uh, isn't it Jamie Dornan, right? That's it's, the uh, one. What was he in yeah. that was, was he in something cringe? Uh, I don't, I don't know. Like when he was I much younger, because the think. thing is, I've now seen him in this and uh, Anthropoid. He was in, uh, Anthropoid, that's right. He's excellent in both. <laughs> Oh, he was uh, he was in Fifty Shades of Grey. There played, you uh, go. Uh, <laughs> well, so that's, that's interesting because, like I said, I haven't seen any of Fifty Shades, but I've seen Anthropoid of this, and man, he's uh, does his job very well. <laughs> that's <funny. laughs> hey, look, all right, <laughs> it's, it's hard being an actor. Okay, you gotta take what you can. It's get funny sometimes. how many actors have to break away from the thing that got them like other the jobs cringe, you know uh, yeah that's right the cringe was just the launch pad you go from 50 mm -hmm. shades of gray to madam web oh yes you propel mm. yourself into a, a masterpiece of a, a movie what we call an upgrade Dude, that, madam web exists that's the film that exists was made came out not too long ago guys remember madam web shamefully i do but the, <laughs> it just the way that um like the villain in that just has absolutely he just makes absolutely no sense and yet he's supposed to have this this you know all powerful computer like he it the contrast with this film being that I, I, it actually feels kind of blasphemous to compare this film with Mad well any good film with Madden Web but this one in particular but like the, the way a lot of this works is because it doesn't stem from maliciousness it, it is a tragedy more than it is a crime story it, it's certainly in the back ground it is because like the, the initial inciting death is an accident isn't it it's not a deliberate yes. murder which allows for mistakes to be made on the part of the person who will go on to be guilty which allows for the hero to start piecing things together without relying on gross incompetence from the person that they're trying to to root out um 
which was by way of contrast with Madame Web, where the complete like opposite is the case because the villain is just an absolute clown. Actually, um, I was going to mention something that I think there are a couple of stretches in in this film's plot. Uh, one of them, it might just be me not understanding exactly how the events go down, but that the mum is feeding her essentially a poison to keep her in a more childlike state. And what kills her is overdosing on it, which happens because she relinquishes control that night to the housekeeper who doesn't know about the poisoning and so feeds her more of the tea, which uh, I'm all fine with. But then they are a little bit spotty on exactly how everything happens next. So the housekeeper hears voices and she walks away out of fear of like, she wants to go and inspect, see what's going on if the spirits of children around. And at that point, um, yeah, she believes it. Yeah, she's, Rowena she's, wakes yeah. back up and goes to check on uh, her daughter, who she finds is dead, and then quickly enacts the plan of of uh, putting the mark on her back and then throwing her into the water and then pretending as though she ran off herself and did it. I was thinking to myself, so Rowena waking back up, which isn't un unrealistic, I suppose. It's just that she had to wake back up in the time frame that the housekeeper both was away but also hadn't realized the daughter had died which you know the body goes cold a bit of a, yeah it's a yeah. bit of a stretch isn't it there's uh, well, there's a very specific possible? amount of time i don't think it has any cause and effect it's more so just that was lucky that it worked out that way for the story to happen was olga maybe getting up and leaving uh maybe the, her stirring might have woken up the daughter you mean the mother who was uh Maybe. There was yeah, I, sorry, I, I, wakes up, uh, is, um, to discover what happened. They don't give you a lot on how it all happened. I think the best faith assumption we can have is she heard voices, ran off to inspect them, and her running woke up the mum, who then checked on the daughter. The daughter's dead. She fakes her death, and then the housekeeper comes back. That's probably the most reasonable way that happens. Yeah, I'd say there's there's yeah. a level of coincidence there with being the yeah being some of the timing. Well, there's and one other thing too, on. which is the housekeeper is described as carelessly putting the honey in the linen closet. Had she not done that, there's a good chance that the honey would have been gotten rid of by the mother and thus would not be given to Poirot, which would not tip him off as to the nature of the honey having done this. At least not from his point of view. He could still have surmised that from the flowers. He wouldn't need the honey. Yeah, we still have that element. The bees in the, you know, the basement, the old hives. You know, what she'd said about wildflower honey. Because remember she says, um, I thought my... Yeah. Uh, closets were bare or whatever. I think it's the idea she was trying to get rid of any and all possible links to anything related to the poisoning. Um, but yeah, you know, that's pretty. it's pretty tight uh, upon thorough inspection. I th I'm surprised at how much is actually functional considering the amount of varied dynamics we've got going on here for different people doing different things for different reasons. Who, uh, like, I never would have assumed the person who wrote this wrote uh, the first two. And by that, uh, I mean just screenplays. No, no, that's, well, yeah, the, the, wrote those and wrote some other films that are, are not Yeah, no, so his great. history is not reassuring. He's written a lot of he bad wrote, shit. Uh, he wrote Green Lantern. He, uh, he wrote he loads wrote of Heroes. Like heroes uh, Beyond Season 1 is absolute shit. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, Jungle Cruise, the riveting... <laughs> Wayne Johnson, Jungle, and Call of the Wild, the uh, the one with Harrison Ford that nobody watched, and he's uh, he apparently he's going to be writing a uh, Bioshock. So yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, we'll which see. Is interesting because it's like you know one one strong screenplay out of well, what's funny of, is um, if yeah. someone said like, could the person who wrote this film with no other information whatsoever, do you think they'd be a suit for writing a Bioshock film? It's like potentially. With only this film, maybe. But, yeah, only uh, only, only considering this film. Like, yeah, because like, I think look, right? <laughs> if there, if I sense an underlying and clear element of passion for what you are doing, that gives me great optimism because that passion for writing can be applied to all kinds of different stories. The worst thing is probably it's not just what's you know a clear lack of talent. It is. A clear lack of caring. That's why well, yeah, we, like Taika Waititi is just like radioactive when it comes to yeah. his involvement in things. It's like, oh shit, you might just not give a fuck and don't even care that you're ruining things. And that's awful. It, 
yeah, it's really bad when the, uh, that there's it's one thing to write something really bad, but you can yeah. a lot versus um exactly. your indifference. Right. Yeah, Snyder, he's one of those types of people. Like he probably cares a lot about Rebel Moon. Yeah, uh, there's a noteworthy badness to it, which is at <laughs> least something. Well, yeah. it's compared to compared to the kind of empathy that you get from a lot of writers on Marvel films, for instance, who write stuff that's bad and seemingly aren't like passionate about it at all. Like not even just like not passionate about, you know, the Marvel stuff, but don't seem to have much of a passion for storytelling in general. It's like really lame and off putting. Uh, and I guess it's interesting because I don't know that you write something like this if that's the case where you you don't like care uh, about storytelling. You know, it's mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I mean, so, you know, and look, sometimes sometimes a, a really great filmmaker makes a bad film, and sometimes a really bad filmmaker manages to make a good film. It's hard to tell whether it's a, a fluke or if it's a deliberate, like all sort of the product of very deliberate, thoughtful, considered writing. But the yeah. thing is, is that this film is a little, it's a little too tight uh, to be the kind of thing where I'd just be like, ah, oh, well, he just locked into it. I don't. It's I weird. Don't yeah, this one's way. like weirdly good in the sense of how much attention to detail and care and passion was pretty much in every single part of the filmmaking, you know, um, mm. arsenal here. The sound design and the visuals and the script writing and, you know, all the story stuff. It, it's a complete package in terms of giving a shit so obviously you know as Mahler said the next one of these i will be interested to see when it releases and my expectations will be high i'm like anton ego after the ratatouille uh, i will be hungry <laughs> for more oh my, my god expectations will be high but that's good because you know like i'd look rebel moon is it it is what it is it is no there's nothing more or less that could be rebel moon but I know that the next one will be shit. I would wager a gajillion dollars. It will be shit because there is a clear pattern here. Um, but How dare you? But the thing is, if it is good, we'll be ready for it. <laughs> if it is good, we will be. Good, I will. I will be stunned and I will be happy. I will be happy and stunned. Yes. Uh, I'll be like, wow, you made something that I liked for the first time. I'll be this confused. Decade. I'll be shocked. Oh, it actually will have been more than a decade. Oh, the last thing, I haven't seen Watchmen, but the last thing I liked. Was clear up some confusion. Some people were saying, like, surely the director is relevant too. So Kenneth Branagh directed all three. Two of them, yeah. as far as I'm concerned, are bad, and one of them is good. What does that mean? It's like, well, I guess it could mean a lot of things. I have no idea whether or not the writer did a better job, or if he did a better job, or if because the fact they weren't working from an adaptation, maybe they have more time. I can't know. All I do know is that this film strikes me as having been made by a different set of people, or the same people with a different set of principles. Now, uh, another question was, wait, do you think Kenneth Brown is like a bad creator? And it's like, no, I have a huge amount no. of respect for him, both as an actor and as a director, but I can't uh, deny that some of the stuff he's made that I think is shit, but some of the stuff he's made I think is pretty cool as well. So, you know, it's, I, I'm fine with that being the reality. Uh, it's just it's just curious to see this this combination make three films in a series and one of them is just so different than the other two, as far as I'm concerned, both directorially and, course, and uh, screenplay. What's curious about it is that the one that has pan... Now, to be fair, I haven't seen Death on the Nile. Maybe I'll watch it just to round out the set, and also because the memes will maybe be funny. Um, but what's interesting is that the film out of the two that I've seen that is the best one that he's made of these this uh, set is uh, the one that is based on a far lesser known... Uh, version and not very directly compared to the adaptation of probably the most well-known and well-regarded uh, uh, Poirot story, Murder mm. on the Orient Express. It's just interesting how um, uh, aside, it, it's just very, it's a very um, bland film. That one is anyway, uh, and just like a lot of the the way that it's made, uh, it almost seems like having a much more distinctive and clear twist on the formula of taking the detective story and injecting more of the like horror and supernatural elements into it like doing that just openly calls for a different approach to it because you're trying to create uh feelings of like suspense um and uh and uh and horror and um like dread apprehension these sorts of things and it's like it invites um a different approach perhaps 
rather than playing it very conventionally. Or, or it could just be that it's like, ah, oh, he's starting to get his mojo, he's getting into a rhythm, he's figured out how to do the uh, his version of Hercule Poirot. Um, yeah, because like I said, I preferred the performance and the writing for the character in this than... Uh, I did. I, I mean, I thought, I really like him as uh, Poirot, I gotta say. I really like him, yeah. I, uh, I like I him a lot. Uh, pretty charming. I felt, yeah, it, it feels like he's starting to... And so you something know, that like, I think is curious is the budget was sixty million or around that, and the gross worldwide was one hundred twenty-two. I mean, there is interest for the film, somewhat. Yeah, clearly. I mean, that's not a small amount of money. Okay, it's not probably the best that they could ask for, but at the same time, no, for a film like this, that must be okay. And that that would have made it one of the few successful uh, Disney films of twenty twenty three. Actually, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is this is. Don't give them so, ideas. Stay away from this it's, Disney. Twentieth century Claws studio. Away. My bad. Twentieth century studio. I, I I gotta say, I don't know if I've ranted about it before, but how? What the Go fuck? For it. Why would you get rid of the name like twentieth century Fox and be like, ah, nah, now well, we're I mean twentieth century studios? What is that? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, man. I can't explain these things to you. But uh, it's because it, it's interesting. The uh, budget for Death on the Nile was ninety million, and it grossed one hundred thirty-seven. Oh, oh and they this is that much was more successful. One, then. Yeah, yeah okay, if that was enough to yeah, make this, then surely we've got a fourth one on the way. I would imagine. I uh, hope so. I, 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 I do hope so. Enough. Yeah, but maybe I'll feel differently when I watch Death on the Nile. I'll be like, <laughs> oh shit! All right, <laughs> like, let's, not, let's not try this again, shall we? Well, yeah, ninety um, million. Ninety million with that mean they had to, it's a lot of champagne, so you know it's stuff stuff costs a lot. Uh, a Niles worth else? of champagne. That's how I measure champagne. Actually, is in Niles worths. For instance, like last uh, New Year's, I had one point three Niles worth of champagne. It's very. Oh my! It's quite. It's quite a lot, but you know it's a special occasion. Yeah. You know, it only happens once a year. Um, things went well. Things went really good. Is there anything else you would like to say about this film before we wrap oh, it up? Oh, I am it out sure of, uh, there is. But... I'll throw it out as a minor complaint. The uh, jump scare in the mirror with the loud noise yeah, that was, was a little bit cringe. It would I agree. Been better if there was no noise at all. No sound. Yes. Violent. No sound. Instead have it be quiet. Like, it's, um, it's not the just the around. sound, too. It's the nature of, like, everyone knows this is coming. You know it's coming, Kenneth. Yeah. <laughs> everyone knows. <laughs> It's, it the, play it's more... the, I look at a mirror, and then I look away from it by kneeling down or whatever, that as I slowly get back up, you're like, oh, don't do it. Don't do the thing. And it's like, blah, 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 and you're like, oh, okay. If you're, yeah, if you're, if you're trying to get into Perot's state of mind, you want to have it be like it would be in real life. Like, if you look over, and there's like a bug next to you all of a sudden, and you make that little jump, like, oh, there's a bug right there. Or you turn around, and maybe there was just someone standing there, and you didn't know, and so you jumped just a little bit. Um, there's no sound, there's no and there's no, like, suit camera focusing in. Everything is totally normal. You aren't expecting it. That's the whole point, that you aren't expecting it. Uh, so just play it, I mean, straight. Play it like it would be from Poirot's perspective. Where he sees it, his eyes go big a little, and he turns around, and there's nothing there. And there's no music, no stingers, no bazingas. No, it's just, wow, that was really weird what just happened. And you can have his expression... Please do more of that. Also, I don't like sudden loud noises. No. I just don't. I don't like sudden uh, loud noises. Well, the thing is, is it's it's um, I uh, I recently rewatched The Shining, um, which has fucking excellent sound design, and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of I guess what you could call like loud noises in there, but it's it's kind of like um, there's a difference between doing the whole silence and then like suddenly a loud noise versus the soundtrack and like sound design throughout the film has like these sort of um <clears throat> not sure like how I would describe them. You you know what I mean when I'm talking about like the the music and the shining, how there's a lot of like weird, disconcerting like strings uh that come in and out of it that are constantly yeah. like, oh geez, all right, I don't know about that. Uh that doesn't make me feel comfortable. Uh those sorts of things. Um, as opposed to the much more conventional silence, 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 and then, you know, and then just back to normal. It's kind of like, at this point, can we stop doing that? <laughs> Everybody knows how it works. Everybody it's an knows annoying movie thing. Really quiet. Yeah. It but, makes um, me think of your movie as a movie and not like the story experienced. Yeah. Kind of, for that moment, it kind of pulls me out of it. And I'm like, uh, don't do the movie thing. 
I, it's 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 fucking up. cheap and, and and easy to do. It's the same thing. It's the problem with like modern horror generally is that it goes way too much on the, the guaranteed sort of physiological response to stimuli. Like it, it, horror is gore and jump scares as opposed to unsettling or mm. uh, like super even, even like the, the vague supernatural things in, in in this film, which get you sort of uneasy in yourself. Which has got much more in common with an old style ghost story than it does with what a lot of the modern horror genre, uh, words horror genre has become. Um, I, yeah, slower paced, quieter, and actually be clever about what you're doing and don't just say, ah, it's disgusting, therefore it's horrible, or ha, made you jump, lol. That's not well, yeah, it's, very uh, scary. It's not, it's not like you earned any. It is, it is normal. It means that your brain, your body is working properly when if you hear a sudden loud noise, you kind of like jolt. That's just like. That's just something that you do. It's not. It doesn't mean that you were scared. It means you were startled, which is a very different thing. Yeah. Mm. And it's just it's easy compared to the idea again. If you think about a film like The Shining, right, the gradual building of uh, a sense of unease, turning into like a persistent sense of dread. Um. It's yeah. It's uh. It's 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 lame to just do like the which I guess is interesting because generally this film does do a good job of um building a sense of uh, unease mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's a much more like natural and and uh i guess you know for lack of a better word a likable sense of unease well, it's funny yeah, that's why it stands out that's me. well perhaps yeah, that's, an equally uh, uh weird thing stands out sort of nitpick level just eh, i didn't like the one obvious use of cg in the skeleton that reveals the bees it's oh, like yeah, it just looked yeah, bad yeah <laughs> And it's like do, do couldn't what? get like just kill, get, just like get a real skeleton, but just, not real bees. Yeah, get a real child. Bees. Yeah, just kill yeah, a real child. Kill a real child. You have to wait a few hundred it. years to make sure it rots the right way. You know, I'm just saying, make sure you get it right, and then I bring everyone like, back. Um, I feel like you need to to maybe help with like making better horror films. Obviously, there are there are great horror films, but there, there's a lot of bad ones. There's, uh, yeah. damn, there's a lot of bad ones. Um is for people to think about films that aren't, uh, I guess, what would be conventionally considered horror films that have scary moments or scary imagery. Um, I, uh, like, it, it just seems like if there was more of a recognition of the kinds of uh, horror that will manifest in films that aren't, you know, mainly trying to scare you, uh, like a scary expression or certain framing, like a shot, a kind of shot that is just, like, uneasy or a certain sound cue or elements of sound design that aren't strictly from like the kind of you know stereotypical horror film but seeing more of that and then trying to inject more of that into horror films rather than just <laughs> jump scare um or just gore like you were saying as well platoon that those sorts of it just help i don't know what it is but like jump scares have infected <laughs> <laughs> I just hate like them, I hate the... them, I hate them. It's they're all got to the point as well where you know they're coming, which completely defeats the object. The, the, yeah, this, I of... can't put my finger on exactly why it is. Maybe I need to get off of the, the weird opium poison thing, but like you just know you, you're watching a certain kind of film, there's a certain kind of shot in a certain kind of corridor, and you think, ah, there's something around that corner. Oh, look, there it is. It's uh, both yeah. sides. It, it double dips in how annoying it is because you're annoyed that you're going to be surprised, and then they surprise you. So it's like, <laughs> ugh. Like, but it's it's mm. just you're startling me. You're not. Uh, it's funny. I guess, I guess it was a mini Kubrick arc. <laughs> I recently rewatched Full Metal Jacket as well, and um, you remember the 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 scene. I guess what you call like the end of the first uh like portion of the story, the first part, right, with Private Pyle and the uh like the expression on his face is 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 kind of it's very disconcerting. And it's not, like, played with all of these loud jump scare cues. It's just, like, this is, like, a scary thing that's happening here. Just getting completely absorbed yeah. and brought into that moment without well, the need to do any crazy jump scares or... If we're going to appeal to this, we should recognize there's a reason that they do this. And it's because, like, Outlast will be what I come back to. It's, like, yeah. it works. Unfortunately, for the vast majority of people, they like a bit of a... Whoa! They, they, they go, oh, that was scary. And you're like, was it, though? <laughs> was, was that scary, or was you just getting grabbed and shaken? Were you just startled compared to something where you're like, oh, that's, uh, man, that's just uncomfortable, you know? Yeah, that's there's... just, like, an uncomfortable thing right here. As you can see from us all calling it being surprised or startled and not I was scared, it's just become, like, that thing that we well, yeah, know. It's, it's... 
it's just it's not it it's like uh platoon said it's like you're kind of waiting and expecting to be startled and it's it's almost like there's kind of this uh fuck you you're not getting like this out of me i'm gonna be so prepared for you to startle me that i'm not even gonna be startled yeah, you get bored um, <laughs> you're ready to get startled yeah i'm preemptively annoyed at what i know is going to happen oh what do you know it annoyed me i was annoyed waiting for it and annoyed when it arrived which uh, I suppose what's interesting about the conversation, you know, Soma's got plenty of moments that go like, oh, oh, geez, I saw a thing and it scared me. Um, but I'm obviously much more amenable to, uh, to, I don't like calling them jump scares because there's so negative a connotation attached to it. But I guess Good. being startled <laughs> in well, Soma, um, you know, when you're running over my and there's a Amnesia Soma videos, I think. I can't remember if it was those or if it was the Machine for Pigs ones, but the natural jump scare versus the prepared one being the big room lots of fog there's a creature in here he's on a normal rotation of his own well, programming distant. you have to find your way to get around basically if you are running you turn a corner and there he is on his very natural walking cycle and you create a jump scare by doing that like that to me is top tier jump scare but that's not yeah you know, that's a cutscene that be. starts up. Yeah, that's just, that is it. There it is. You've just jumped into something and you are scared of it. It's like, that is the best kind of jump scare possible, I think. Hence why... Because you can have a similar... You want to um, have that happen because it's terrifying. So when you force it to happen by locking, With say, in watch. the game, you, it's like, make uh -huh. sure, you know, move this thing that's in your way and your character puts his hands and he goes, ugh, ugh, and then some guy grabs you and goes, oh, and you go, oh my god. It's like, yeah, that's a joke. And it's like, ugh. Yeah. <laughs> it happens in a lot of games that aren't even like spooky where you'll be playing a game and your little soldier man's running around and you could just you'll turn a corner or you go in a direction you don't notice like a horde of enemies or a horde of something and you're like ah oh, nope and you just turn around and go the other way and you're like ah oh. different on the same level but it's the you know the same concept when... of just that's what would happen you you look or you look over and you see a bunch of bad things and you nope out of there in because the, like in... ah Outlast, when you like, there's a part where the floor's given way so that you can only shimmy across a very small amount that's across from, like, it puts you in reach of a whole bunch of prisoners in cells. And you can start moving. You see some of them aren't moving at all. Some of them are kind of close. Some of them look unhinged. And then the oogly boogly man grabs your penis and you're like, oh my god. And he's scary. And you just go, like, oh, 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 the camera shakes and you fall over. And I'm just like, yeah, I knew that. What else was going to happen? You guys don't do anything else. You just go, <laughs> oogly boogly, ah. <laughs> There's, um, there's the basement in The Last of Us Part 1, that basement. Is it the hospital basement? Like, it's all flooded, it's really dark. Oh, um, that's true. Part 2. It... No, because yeah. I've not played Part 2. There's definitely a basement oh. thing in Part 1. I think oh, right. there is. There is, yeah. And it, like, that, that always sticks out as a fairly good example of what you're talking about. Like, you know that there is some horrible, dark shit here, and you know it's going to fuck you up in some way, but you don't know precisely what or when. And it's the dread of anticipating it which makes it horrifying more than the actual, you know, being mobbed by giant yeah. mushroom creatures. Like, that's a pretty good example of the uh, diagetic okay, jump scares, I guess. I well, think the Descent has a really good one the first time oh, you, yes. uh, you yes. meet the, the Crawley Boys. Um, that might unironically be the best movie jump scare in history. I think yeah. it might be. It's, it's, it's kind of my go-to for just perfectly executed one. Um, oh it's my just, god! So well, it's so good. Someone in chat mentioned the flood, and now I'm thinking about no, 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 uh, no, no. Well, next week, no. next week, next week. No, we next. About, uh, we could talk oh, about in Halo gosh. Combat Evolved the the steady reveal of the flood where you're just walking through. That's right. It's not a jump with video scare. Games, with video yeah. games, it's like super interesting because of environmental storytelling yeah. and the fact that you can navigate the environment at your own pace, but walking through the in a labyrinth of Halo and seeing all of the, like, this weird goo on the walls. The tonal like, build-up, yeah. The swamp, yeah, this disconcerting the sound. The fact that all the, you know, Covenant were running away from the place that you're going into, and as you're going in, all of these breached containment facilities and this weird pus on the walls and everything gradually building up. It's really... It, it's patience, man. Like it's seriously, you will. There's be a rewarded. reason why we remember it when that game came out like 36 years ago, and we still remember how we feel when we play that and why it works, even on a real replay, where you get that appreciation of, oh, we're like playing a different video game now. Yeah, exactly. Okay, it's all a great right. Twist. Uh, oh boy, I then... sure do love Halo. Yeah. Next look, all right. Next next week. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Gee, Fringy, don't. <laughs> Guy, you're making me so eager to 
Mm. All right. No, it's good. Well, it's going to be great. Um, Look, it's fair. We talk about something we like, and then the next week we talk about something that we despise with every ounce of our soul. It's just the... Uh, little bit. It's, it's nature, you know, balancing everything out. It's give and take. Mm-hmm. We, there's probably a lot about... There is a lot about A Haunting in Venice that no doubt we have skipped over, didn't talk about, haven't... It hasn't come to the forefront of our minds as, you know... As we have these pretty much these ambient, mostly unguided uh, discussions, there's a lot of stuff in this movie that, yeah, we just haven't brought up. I would highly suggest you give it a watch if you well, are yeah, interested in a I would suspense-y, too. yes, suspense dramatic mystery kind of movie. Estimation. Uh, I did like it before watching it, but uh, the conversation has brought me over to it is definitely in the category firmly good. Firmly in the in the in fact very good territory. I think I'd be tempted to say it's uh I would it's say just, it's, it's quite impressively good, constructed. Yes. Yeah, it's uh, a lot of work went into that movie, screenplay. Absolutely, it's just you're just full of appreciation for it, and you're so glad that it exists. As I said, not just as a foil to the god awful Ryan Johnson movies, but it's it was just a really fun experience to watch the movie. Um, yeah. I'm actually going to be curious. I've, I've recommended it to my parents, so I'll be curious what they say. Because you know, with people's parents and movies, sometimes you, it's the grab bag of who knows what. So we shall, um, we'll see, we'll see. But good stuff. A haunting in Venice. Let's hope the next one is a real banger. Yeah, I hope it is. If there will be another one, which is I hope like so. Will. I hope so. And now. The first time in a while, perhaps we should uh, we can we can read some super chats since this what? episode is not quite as long as uh, as it can be when we're talking about something that's absolute shite. Wow, a live super chat! This takes me back. This takes me back. I mean, to crazy. me, they're all they're they're kind of live to to us in a way. But in a way, this is a huh? Wow, yeah. I like this. Reminds right, well, me and, of and. Of course, yeah. I want to give a chance to yeah. Mr. Platoon if he would like to um, eject, since this is a uh, an intermission of sorts. Completely up to you, sir. Unless, of course, you had anything else to say about A Haunting in Venice as well. Um, no, I think I'm going to give it a second watch. I think I was probably slightly cooler on it going in, but actually, this is the great thing about being here, is that you learn things about it that you didn't pick up on, so I think I will go and give it a second try. All right. but, um, very much enjoyed it, yeah. But no, I, I'm happy to stick around. It's EFAP. You can't quit after... <gasps> That's Less right. Than three hours. That's just wrong. That's right. That's and some right. people do. They end up in jail. That's <laughs> great. Well then, I shall get started. The first is, message is: This is what I love about EFAP. Listening to four men talking about playing with their chickens. True. Yes. We have a bit of a was, you know expectation of that, and we didn't want to um, upset anybody by not including it. Boy. Love chickens. Mm-hmm. More Stellar Blade mm-hmm. is a girl's game. You should have played MGR. The main protagonist, Raiden, is a man. Or Raiden, right? Is a man. Probably say, probably also high dog. Hi. Oh, well, Raiden is the one from Mortal Raiden Kombat. Mortal Kombat. Raiden is Metal Gear Solid. Correct. Raiden is Metal Gear Solid, yes. Yeah, and... that's right. And he chops him up with his sword. I have played spicy, spicy, uh, spicy. Revengeance, right? Rising Revengeance, is that what it's called? Yeah, Metal Gear Rising Revenge. <laughs> Great fun, name. Fun um, garbage day. title. Metal Gear Rising Revenge. <laughs> I played a bit of it. I should play it again someday, like to finish it or you whatever. You should play it. You gotta, you gotta see Armstrong. You gotta fight Armstrong. True. Because part of what makes. Well, me Fring, you missed out on the play. Stellar Blade demo came out. It was great. It's okay, actually like not bad. bad. <laughs> uh, well, I saw uh, the the state of play. They showed some gameplay for it, and it's like, yeah, it looks like a sort of fun Devil May Cry esque action. It's game. not just boobs, or ass. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good. It's, it's also about. ass. Yeah. It is also just in, in Raiden's defense, I think it would be really mean if, if everyone's association of Raiden was just revenge and whatever the fuck it was called. Also, Sons of Liberty, which is the actual good Metal Gear game that he's in. Oh, oh my god. Wait, so, yeah. wait what do you think of Metal Gear Solid 4? I don't know if I've played 4. I, see, fact, I, I don't think I have. I believe he is in that. I see. I don't think he was in 5, which is the one that I played. Uh, he was in Ground Zeroes as like pre-order uh, DLC. I remember that. The, the, oh, you remember mm-hmm. Ground Zeroes where I they charged do. like forty dollars for her? <laughs> oh no, wait, they reduced it to thirty, but it was like three hours long. In fact, I think I'm overestimating its length. I think it was shorter than that. <laughs> now that I think about it. Um, 
opinions on Smiling Friends season two premiere? I haven't I, seen it I yet. I really enjoyed it. I, thought I haven't it was awesome. seen it yet. I got the a... ending joke with Mr. Boss. It, wait, 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 wait! I haven't seen I, it. I haven't seen it. I won't say it, but it, just, I really. Joke was funny, right? <laughs> it was I know. Really I want to experience it naturally. Are you like spoiling that? This funny a jump scare. It was, it was it was really funny. Uh, it's a good joke, and it was a good episode. I enjoyed it a lot. I'm really excited for season two. I'm I'm a big fan of Smiling Friends. Right? Yes. I'm I'm very impressed by it in general. Would like lots more directly injected into the brainstem or whatever. it will be great. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that would make me oogly goo. Mm -hmm. Now let's be real. The chat is guilty of being epic. Also, Mola, I believe I deserve a banning now that I've sub uh, subbed in double digits. Oh, they mean because of the Hassan arc, this is actually a reference to. No, once you get to triple member digits, that is, uh, we don't just ban you, we, we hunt you down and kill you, because that's it's just yeah. inspired by Hassan himself. Working class Andy. Yeah. For an update, yeah. for anybody who's not aware of this in the EFAB fandom, he's been uh, losing his mind because his audience is shrinking and nobody cares about <laughs> the creative things, according to him, that he wants to do. Um, He's very angry oh. that there are subreddits that make fun of him for losing. Uh, what what in, in a mind like Hassan's, what constitutes a creative thing? I don't know. He went out I and swam. He swam in, in some, some swam. place. Swam. Yeah. Well, like swam. he jumped in the water and, and did like some like freestyle or something. Yeah, there's a, an exchange where someone suggests he should go out in the water and swim. And then he says, I fucking did that already. It goes to show none of you pay attention to what I'm actually doing. It's, uh, it's like, man, okay. he, he is like really big mad about uh losing viewers though isn't he Jeez. yes didn't he yes. start a, he's starting a podcast with idubs or something uh, <laughs> like man uh, you had a the amount of videos about <laughs> like... the fall of idubs <laughs> like, dude I, some people don't even know he was once upon a time the most invincible person on the internet he could literally do anything and he'd be fine like uh idubs could be the poster child of fall from grace yes I suppose Boogie has that title, right? <laughs> Boogie's, kinda... Boogie's, uh, Boogie's sort of so, yeah. there, but because of Idubs was just like super funny, edgy. People were constantly quoting him. The memes and the gifs were all over the place. You had the content cop stuff. He was just this kooky, crazy guy that everyone liked. And now things are different. Um, so, ugh, ooh, ee, oof. not good. Uh, main villain of the Deus Ex guy is a guy named Bob. Uh, yeah, yeah, Paige. Hmm. Good. That's right. Could be William, he's, he's right? Wacky guy. William Page. Well, I guess it'd be full name, yeah, I suppose. Will I am Page. Hmm. Uh, quote: Spiders are like weird oracles. J. Bo Ragsons. Interesting. There's some wisdom in there. Oh, I thought of a wise thing. Ooh. Uh, the other day, it was sometime yesterday, I forget when, I was thinking, and I had a thought, and my, my nugget of wisdom was, you cannot clean your butthole if you clench while you wipe. And I thought, hmm, there's a lot of wisdom in that. All right. The more you tighten your cheeks, Arkin, the more shit will slip through your fingers, like that kind of thing? Something like that. That's... I think okay. I think that is a really good phrase that a lot of people can draw something from, and I'm going to leave that there because there's a lot of there's a lot of wisdom. A lot of themes. There's a lot of wisdom in that. A lot of themes in. That. When That's will we get EFAP Gaming Helldivers Two? Hmm. Not I impossible. I don't know, but I'm definitely down for it we because have I'm a it. big fan of Helldivers Two. We have Fringy, Mahler, myself, some others. We have played the Helldivers Two. Yeah. Rather fun I am game. Definitely. I'm definitely down for the Helldivers EFAP gaming. Hey guys, I'm turning 21 tomorrow. Gonna try some Alcatisms. Wish me luck. Ooh, Good luck. You'll have plenty of fun. Congratulations, you made it to 21. You avoided death you for 21 it. years. Hooray. Good job. Yeah, good job. Have fun. Bringy Soylent Green Goo is people. It's people. Bringy, is this true? No, not. No. Nope. Okay, okay. Not there true. Okay. I'm glad you addressed the allegations so quickly. Mm -hmm. We have it on record. Definitely not people, but they not are impossible. not people. Shout out to Ross Scott's efforts to stop games from getting killed. 
If you purchase the crew at any point, do your part to help stop games from getting killed. Stop killing games. Oh, that... What's I the crew? That's to do with, uh, the crew was a racing game by Ubisoft that was like one of those sort of, you know, shared world. You know, like how Destiny, the division, they're all all interested in like the shared world thing. I think it was like a shared world, always online racing game that I think recently got its server shut down and delisted, I believe. So yeah. I presume maybe it has to do with like the idea of making the game still available or something along those lines. Well, yeah, I mean, keep gaming alive. I am on board with that. Game's pretty cool, but I think they're probably not in trouble in terms of staying alive, just staying good. Uh, oh, it's just game preservation is starting to become a big oh, yeah, that. Uh, part of the conversation, especially with always online games. Uh, my GF and I just broke up. Thank you for a very welcome distraction. I'm sorry to hear that, man. Uh, sorry to hear that, dude. Yeah, that's, uh, that's all right, though. That's... Yeah, it's, it's, it's what happens, you know? Part of the thing that we're able to do. Escapism. Part of life. We uh we can get you in a position where maybe you can just be thinking about a spooky haunted house where a Belgian right. detective has to solve a mystery. Um, I don't know if I would recommend this movie for the situation you're in, but it certainly may very well be gripping, and it may give you a perspective on life in some way, shape, or form, I would hope. You know, a good take way. away the wrong lessons from this film though, right? Which is that if you can't let someone go, you should definitely poison their tea. Oh no. Maybe that's not the right lesson to take away. Yeah, we'll avoid right. that one. Uh hello there. Has anybody watched HBO's Hi. Six Feet Under? It's a family drama set at a funeral home. Sound familiar? Great character work and ending. Never I've never watched seen. that, I'm no. afraid. No, I haven't seen it. Nope, that's a no from everybody. Hello all. Will there ever be a Chernobyl breakdown slash praise? I think it's one of the best pieces of media ever made, yet it gets no EFAP attention. To be fair, 99.9% .9 of media gets no EFAP attention. Yeah, I really yeah, I mean, like Chernobyl a lot. Um, that's right, we've talked a lot about... Uh, it's recommended come up pretty it a lot, yeah. With Craig, yeah. Yeah, and especially when we watched The Last of Us, it would have come up a fair few times, because it's uh, Craig Mazin. Yep. I agree that it is excellent, but that we have given it attention compared to a lot of other stuff. There are things that we think are amazing that we haven't even mentioned on this show, probably. That's right. Name one, Mahler. Uh, here I go. Here I go. I'm about to... Are you ready? All right. Ready? Yep, right. I'm ready. I'm about oh, to yes. say it. The okay, Man Who Would Be it. King. I am... Oh, yeah. I like that movie right. a whole that bunch, a and movie. I don't think I have ever mentioned it on EVAP before. <laughs> I don't think you have either. I also really like that movie. So there you go. All right, Fringy, now you. Oh, what, a film that we've never talked about on EFAP that I really like. But it's like top-tier yeah, media. Well, something yeah. excellent. Yeah, something excellent top that we have not that mentioned. We've never discussed. Mm. Like, ever, in any capacity. Can I you feel come like up it with come up at least one. I feel like a film would have come up at least once if it was a film that, that we've... Hmm. Give it a go. Top-tier film that we haven't really discussed at all. Uh, and games be our games. Uh, sure, TV shows, well? games, whatever. Uh, I mean, have we ever done like a full blown? Have we? How often have we talked about Super Mario Galaxy? Because I love Super Mario Galaxy. I'm sure you've mentioned. We've definitely covered videos covering Mario, Mario oh, Galaxy. So, right? Yeah, definitely. Uh, right. I mean, it's not. We're not allowed. Was to I'm surprised that when jump. tasked with doing something obscure but great, you went with Mario. <laughs> hey, look, all right, Super Mario Galaxy. It's a great. Okay, like, give me rags. You go while I think. All right. Of a for example. Um, I'm not sure if I ever mentioned it. Let me double check the name though. Uh, All right, while you're doing that, little platoon. What do you, have you got? What, what have you never referenced, but you simultaneously think is excellent? Um, using the word excellent very broadly, there was a film on. I think I put it on last night. It's called the Night of the Big Heat. I think it's called. It's a horror film ish, um, with Christopher Lee. I think it's a Hammer film from like the sixties. Hmm. I say excellent advisedly. It's more one of those moments where you get to the end and you think, what the fuck was that about? Because um, the basic premise is that these alien creatures have somehow beamed over via satellite to Earth. Their temperature is rising, and these people have to try and kick out this plan to stop them. Um, and they fail. But at the end of the film, it just starts raining, and the, the creatures die. And you think, well, but that was bound to happen anyway. So what, what was the big drama? <laughs> well, and it was one of those sort of things I just sat there and kind of laughed at. And in a weird way, that's 
fun and excellent, so I'll, I'll nominate the Knight of well, the Big Heat. Well, since you saw it last uh, night, that doesn't really... <laughs> the point is that... I, uh... It's been out since the 60s. It's I been, see. It's been around for ages. I've thought about a... Uh... Uh, it's a it's a it's a game that I think I may have only referenced once before, but it's uh it's it was it's called Road Trip Adventure on PlayStation Two. I don't know if I'd say it's excellent, but I remember really enjoying it, and I feel like that's a game that I've never seen get talked about ever. There you go. Like, that works. It came out. It's uh it it was fun. It's uh it's it's like a world where there's it it was cars before cars and interactive. Ooh. Yeah. The cars didn't have, like, eyes or anything or mouths, but the cars were alive, and I lived in a world that was, like, constructed for mm -hmm. cars, and you would drive around and go on adventures in this in this world, and it felt like it's a really big open world. I'm not sure how big it actually was. Uh, but, so, but yeah, Road Trip Adventure on PlayStation 2. And Rags, what have you got? Well, I think I've mentioned Elite Beat Agents. I think, uh... How about Masquerade, the 2012... South Korean movie directed by Chu Chang Min. I really like that movie a lot. I don't think we've. I I don't know if I've ever mentioned it before, but it's a movie I really really I like. I think that counts. I don't think you've ever referenced it in a way of, like, a point of praise or criticism to something else. I don't. I mean, you have at least. I don't think so. Yeah, because I can't tell. You never know when things just get offhandedly remarked upon as existing. Um, I think I've talked about. Um, the Princess and the Goblin, the 1991 animated movie that I watched as a, a young lad that I, I quite liked a lot. There is... I have mentioned Little Nemo Adventures in Slumberland, mm -hmm. which will be a part of a future EFAP arc. Mm -hmm. But that's all, that's all I'll say. Um, mm. I think I have meant... I'm trying to think of like... Um, what about Final Fantasy Tactics Grimoire of the Rift, the the DS uh, Final Fantasy game? I, I quite liked that a lot. Uh, now was... you're making me think of uh, another game that I think I've never meant. I really like Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Blue Rescue Team on uh, Nintendo DS. I never I really played those. I never played the mystery dungeon ones. I don't know anything. It was fun. It had like a story them. where you, you were a human who became a Pokemon and you lived in a world like it was a Pokemon world. It's kind of funny how it's unified. You know, the first game, it's like, yeah, it's a world where the cars have a little society. Uh, and in this one, it's, it's Pokemon. They have their society and you go on an adventure and you discover, you, you untangle a mystery and it's, it's really fun. Okay. Uh, I really like blue. Uh, yeah. Uh, Pokemon, blue uh, Pokemon games getting, getting bold, trying to have a story. Huh? You just make me think about the story of like you growing up as a Pokemon or whatever, just get around collecting whatever you need to live and stuff. And then some guy comes along with a creature, beats you the fuck up and captures you and forces you to fight. Other things. <laughs> like, no. Well, yeah, think about uh, it from this perspective. What if you are the lowly, you know, Pidgey or Caterpie, the level two fucker, and you're just like a Pokemon trainer's first Pokemon that they catch. And, but then over time you grow up to be this really strong powerful pokemon who's got like fame because in the world it would be that pokemon would be basically as famous as the trainers a lot of the times so you would go from just living in the grass just being a caterpie or whatever and then you you your trainer beats the elite four you become a pokemon master you've got fame and fortune and bitches and all that stuff and it's like this from zero to hero journey from the pokemon's perspective uh, that you know, it, that's certainly a way to look at it. But what about the really heartrending moment, though, when you realize that your time is up and you've been sent to the box on the PC? <laughs> oh, yeah. you've been replaced by a fucking dragon dude. That's sober levels because it could be simulated that it you're really happy. Is. It's like, are we? Where are we? What is this? Is this real? <laughs> like, what I is joked real? about it at the beginning of the EFAP, but the Pokemon world is a world of horror, mm -hmm. <laughs> really. So we just, ah. Uh... Look, I just collect. I was. It's buy some cards for nostalgia, man. You yeah. know that's. You're not uh, trying I'm to abuse nothing. Look up a blast voice. Just gonna look at look at Hydro Pump over here. The, a brutal Pokemon with pressurized water jets on its shell that are used for high speed tackles. Level oh, fifty two, number nine. If you got hit by Blastoise and his cannons, that might actually just like tear the flesh from you. If yeah, it was really probably. powerful uh, blast. 
Some things that I've noticed, especially looking at these original nine cards, um, I'd have to go to the case and pull out the specific ones, but like um, you would have a trio like um, Bla uh, a Squirtle, War Turtle, Blastoise, and you did like the three evolutions. And you'd have different illustrators. It wouldn't be the same illustrator for all of them. So you'd have like Ken Sugimori has done a lot of art for Pokemon. And he would do like the first and the third, but the middle would be someone else, or like the inverse of that, or he'd only do the first two or the last two. So the way that they kind of organize this seems odd. You think you'd want to have the same guy, you know, do all three to keep an interesting sort of visual style for the evolution, but it's not something that often happens, and I wonder how those decisions are made. Well, there's a lot of really good Pokemon art. Um, I've I, while looking around for cards, shopping for cards. Um, there is a lot of real, I think magic has like the easily magic has the best, uh, card art that I've seen, but there's a lot of really cool, fun stuff. Cause you, you can't really have the same style of art on a Pokemon card that you can on a magic, the gathering card. It's just totally different vibes, you know? So it's, it's, there's just a lot of great, a lot of great Pokemon art. I just want to say shout out to all the different styles and things that they try. They can, they can get downright experimental sometimes and. You know, I appreciate that. Anyway, that's why we haven't covered Chernobyl. <laughs> oh, Blastoise, how high is he? Because now that I've got the card in my hand, what? how high is Blastoise? Do you know? You mean how it tall? says the height and the weight. Yes. Aren't they all, like, deceptively small? Because everyone's idea comes from the, the, the cartoon show where they blow them all up or something. Not literally blow them up, but blow up their size. <laughs> um, like love grenades in their mouths. No. Aren't they like way smaller than you think? Like one point like is he like one point eight meters or something? I what is that in feet? I it has I feet and inches know. listed on the card. That's a sensible thing to use, but I don't actually know what the corresponding thing is. Let's go meters to feet. You said one point eight? Yeah. One point eight for Blastoise. Let's check. That is not too far off. But it's too high. Too tall. It's, it's too big, isn't it? That's five too foot big. Ten. He's shorter than 5 foot 10. One me 1.8 meters is 5.9 feet. So you're off by a bit. Not too much, but you are off. You, you've, you, you think he's taller than he really is, which I don't blame you. I was a little surprised when I looked at it too. Officially, I'll tell you, this is official from the, the 1999 original running. So, yeah, he's five foot three. Hmm. Blastoise is five foot three. He weighs 189 pounds. Pretty they're sure actually, my mom is taller than that. That's just, that's They're actually not right. specific. They said 188.5 pounds. So, we got decimals for our poundage here on Blastoise. Good that they've done that. 188 point. It is good. It's world bu world building. Do you know what kind of Pokemon he is? Or is he type? Aspect? Yeah, type. Not just not element or type, but like like kind. So not just water. No, not water. But what what type is he? Like like kind. I don't even know what it's actually called. Like for instance, a. I think I know what you're talking about, right? Where, like, the different Pokemon... Yeah, there, it's like... There was a type, but there was some other description of the kind of Pokemon that they were that wasn't... He, oh, category. So, like, a Feraligator is Big Jaw category. Oh. Oh. Okay. Um, I was going to say Hard Shell. You are... One of those words is correct. Ooh. Um... Shell Cannon. <laughs> <laughs> not not a bad guess. Is it uh, Big Shelled? No, it isn't Big Shelled. Okay, but that wasn't a good it guess is, then. It is Shellfish. Oh, oh okay. He is okay. A, he's a Shellfish. Uh, he's clearly a turtle. Turtles yeah. He's clearly shellfish. a fucking turtle, but they call him Shellfish. Because okay, well, a turtle is not a fish, so... Uh... That's yeah. yeah, it's it's very strange. Very strange. The world of Pokemon. I like the idea that the Pokemon guy wrote that here and he's like, You motherfuckers, Pokemon ain't real, okay? I can call it whatever the fuck I, I want. Know Pokemon's, not, you know, Pokemon's not real, and I know that you can call it whatever you want, but I still object to calling him a fish when he's clearly a reptile. Exactly. Interestingly, Squirtle's category is tiny turtle. Yeah, see, that's more accurate. Yeah, which is like, yeah, it's a turtle and it's small. It's one foot eight. 
What is, uh, so what does that make war turtle? I'm wondering, that's, uh, I'm wondering if that's small for a turtle. I guess it depends on what because some turtles are fairly small, but some of them are chongo. War turtle's category is turtle. He go you go from tiny <laughs> you go from tiny turtle to turtle to turtle shellfish. To fish. Yeah. Uh, it somehow turns into a, a, a wait, is a is a is a lobster a shellfish? Yeah. Okay. Right. So basically it's just the crabs and lobsters and they're they're shellfish, I see. Oh, All right. Wasn't it the old YouTube video Pokemon but with animals instead? And monkey evolves into Steve from accounting. I'm sure that's a thing. <laughs> I think um in the first generation of Pokemon, I learned this. I learned this the other night. It was the other night. last night. It was last night. I was talking with friends about random things. Pokemon came up. Only one Pokemon in the first generation is a a a pure is a is only grass type. He's he's pure grass type. Only one Pokemon in the first generation is. Do you know which one it was? Dragon. Mm. No. Dragonite, you mean? That was close. Not to be confused with Dratini and Dragonair, but tra no, though it's not. There's oh, only one fully evolved. Tangler or something? Oh, fully evolved. Oh. No, you're right. Tangler. Oh, it was Tangler. How did you know that? Because uh, I remembered it thinking that's surely not... That I thought that was a... Po it confused me at the time because I remember thinking it was a poison thing, but it never was. Well, almost every grass Pokemon is going to be dual type with poison. I think Executor was the, the exception to that. Well, basically, executor, basically every grass or Executor. Yeah. By the way, shellfish are not yeah. fish. No, they're well, you saw not... Blastoise. So Turtles, we that. Blastoise, right? That's a separate but category. Blastoise is also not a shellfish. Okay, like even we if know. shellfish yeah, are not yeah. fish, he is nor he's fish a nor he is a he is a reptile. That's right. Over he the hedge. Categories, are important. Categories yeah. are important. Categories are important because you have we set up patterns: tiny turtle, turtle. Shellfish. It's um, what was yes. the super chat? The 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 <laughs> nature of covering Chernobyl. Um, we oh, we yes. praise it Chernobyl, and recommend it enough. It's just that it doesn't it doesn't get the coverage that perhaps someday. You know what? When they have a second one, that's when we'll do it. Chernobyl two, because uh, obviously it's just a matter of time before another one happens. And so then when they make the show about it, we'll cover them both. Um, Chernobyl would explain how a turtle could evolve into a shellfish. Oh, uh, that's true, yeah. Also, someone there's a lot of fun, interesting, weird, strange Pokemon facts out there. Someone in chat has one I want to point out. The only dragon move in the first generation was Dragon Rage, which only did 40 damage every time, no modifiers. So dragons being weak to dragon was meaningless. Hmm. Oh. Which oh, makes that, you right. wonder when people are going through and, like, all of this stuff is specifically done. So it, it is interesting how that happened. Uh, All right. This one says my work here is dumb. All right. No. Well, you don't know. You sending us money is not dumb. Maybe they want to be dumb. I think it's great. Maybe they want to be dumb. Mm -hmm. Oh well, well maybe, but it isn't. Hello, Fringy, Mauler, Rags, and Little Platoon. Can I ask Hello. you a question? Yes. Including that one. Well, they or said they. I don't know. I've asked it. Oh, 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 there you actually. go. Oh. That's mm -hmm. that's a that's one of those mildly clever things that you could do is you say can I ask you two questions and then they say yes, and then you ask them a question and they're like what's the other one and it's like that was the other one, and then you just leave it there and let it simmer, and then they fucking hate you. No, no, they don't hate you. How then? How come? How come everyone loves me then? Because I am intermittently mildly clever. And everyone loves me. Nobody tell so, him. What are you trying to say? Maybe it's in your delivery. Maybe it's your like your tone, your inflection. Yeah. Maybe, maybe. you do the reveal. You're like, that was the second question. And then you roll your eyes like Mean Girls, and then you walk away, and you fart on command. Mm -hmm. I had a when I was uh, when I was young. I had a cut. Well, I still have a cousin. When I was young, I met a friend of my cousin who could inhale air through his butthole. It was very strange. Mm -hmm. How you did have he to, like, discover get his... this power? I don't know. I can't remember the answer. Did he have an uncle he, that told him to... with great power comes great responsibility after knowing that? 
I don't want to talk about his uncle after he discovered this power. But he was on. He he'd have to get on his back and he'd like lift his legs up, and then he he could, he could suck air into his butt and it made the strangest noise. But yeah, um, I could imagine yeah, that's, that's not going to make a normal noise. <laughs> yeah, it was very odd. Um, that's one of those super pow- It's one of those powers. I'm not going to call it a superpower, but it's definitely a definitely a An power. ultra power. Yeah, there's probably a furry out there who's going hmm. Anal I'd be curious Israel. for little platoon's answer to this before myself and Fringy share our response because we watched the film recently. But I don't know if it's sort of reflective of more than just the specific thing they're talking about. But they said, "I recently watched the 1974 Murder on the Orient Express and wasn't impressed with it. Uh, the main problem is that Poirot just trusts all these murderers that the person they killed actually was who they claimed him to be without any independent evidence proving that to be the case." Um, I said, well, yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't have an answer for that because it's been such a long time since I've seen it. I genuinely don't remember. Um, okay. maybe, uh, since I rewatched with Fringy the, the 2017 version semi recently, one of my many issues is that, uh, the character of, uh, is it Rossetti? Rosetti? I can't remember what the Rossetti what is... was the mole from Animal Crossing. Hmm. He was. Yeah, but did I he go on the that. Orient Express or no? Yeah, yeah. Everyone gets to the town by train. So yes, okay. Mahler, so the guy the from Animal Crossing, Crossing uh, I don't know yes. that they had enough information on him to condemn him. We were simply told that was the case. Uh, and Poirot's <laughs> POV, I think what they want you to do in the film is by the, the case was so public, the evidence was so clear that everyone just knows definitively that he was a bad guy and he needed to be destroyed. Um, but that's not as satisfying, I think, compared to knowing... We, like, the audience don't actually find out what his motivation was, at least not in the 2017 version, which I thought was a big miss. It's like, surely knowing... Like, the story as they tell it, to remain relatively spoiler-free... Feels a little weird, um, once you get all of the accounts from everybody of what he did. It sounds super villain level. And, um, someone said when watching it, I was like, what is, uh, why did he do it? And it's like, I don't know, uh, unless I miss something, I don't think we get to know why. He's not a nice person. Um, he does speak to a couple of people in ways that are very assholy. And what he says to Poirot in the one conversation they have, I think, is not reassuring of him as a, uh, like a good guy or anything. It's just that when you consider what happens to him and whether or not that should be punished, it's a bit like, hmm. And it gets complicated. I also have seen the uh, original Murder on the Orient Express. Wasn't a big fan of it. Felt way too on the rails for me. Oh my god. <laughs> Get it? Be careful. At the end, a lot of people trial. will assume that you actually are not a fan of it. Um, well, I mean, at the end, it does pick up steam, so there is that. Oh! Yeah. Oh. Reassure the people before they start writing comments about how you misunderstood the film or something. Uh, no, I'm just, I'm just gonna leave that one there. All right, and instead, fine. I'm gonna talk about, instead, I'm gonna talk about how Mr. Rossetti in Animal Crossing, if you reset your game without saving, the next they time you, you put up the game, mm -hmm. he would not only... Or be there once you leave your house to play he would be there and he would stop you and say you fucker right don't reset your game your progress isn't saved if you reset the game and you don't save you have to save before you stop the game and he would do this in different ways to the point where you would have to manually type in like on the game pound on the gamecube like you have to type out specifically cap sensitive and punctuation sensitive space sensitive verbatim like the message he'd say like i promise i will not reset the game like period cap pro everything and you would have to do that so he was he was you never reset the game not because you were necessarily like really super invested in the game which you were because it was animal crossing those are people's lives in there okay but because you knew the next time you loaded up that game Oh God, Mr. Rossetti, he's gonna be there. The game knows. Somehow it knows. Ah, oh, I gotta deal with Mr. Rossetti outside my. Oh. 
he cared about you deep down. He had he had good intentions, and it would prevent people from resetting without saving. So it worked. It worked in its own way. They made him a character in universe to refer to like a meta thing. I don't think I've ever seen that in a game actually. I think Rossetti is a is a very unique character in video game history for what he sort of represents and who he is. He crosses the 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 barrier between the world of the living and the, the dead. I feel psycho mantis in like isn't it the first middle of the game when he says he tells you to eject your memory card and stuff? So like yeah, the evolved form of Psycho Mantis and Mr. Rosetti are kind of thematically linked. Yeah, he'll <laughs> sell your data to Google or whatever. It's uh, to China, horrifying. yeah. Because he's a mole, so he can dig straight through to China. He can actually get there faster than anyone else because he can go there in a straight line. The rest of us have to go around the, around the whole planet, but he can just do straight line straight through to China. Or actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, please, please do an EFAP movies for Iron Sky. It's easily the best bad movie ever made, and I need your reactions to the ridiculousness. Ooh. Maybe we will. In the Maybe. Future. Who knows? Iron Sky. Um, the response to H-Bomber Guy's defense of Dark Souls 2 is an example of a justified, premeditated murder. Also, hi, Dog and Frog. Hi. I didn't hi kill anyone. I just said a bunch of stuff. It's different. But fair enough. Branagh's weird double mustache for Poirot has always thrown me off. Um, <laughs> it's odd, but it's... We had like a triple mustache in the first one. It was horrible. Yeah, it it's a really look. Bad. It's a look. It's one. not bad in this one. Two is just enough. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just like, enough to be... Great. It's enough to be a thing without being overly conspicuous and like too much. It's not too gaudy, but it's a little... Just a, just a touch of fancy. Because I'm a shallow... Dick. Like I think that is pretty much the reason I've never seen a Kenneth Branagh <laughs> borrow until this one. It's just, I looked at the mustache well, and thought, nah. No, wow, that crazy. he took the criticism to heart and lost the crazy mustache from the first one when he moved to the <laughs> second one, so he, he was like, okay, fine, fine. Everyone's shitting on me for this. Fine. Fine. I won't have it anymore. It's my vision. It's the right yeah. <laughs> he, he wears it how he likes around the house, mm -hmm. but when he gets the knock on the door, he rushes to the bathroom, to the mirror, to adjust his mustache to something more socially acceptable, and then... I already know the answer for this, or possibly everyone here. Hello, EFAP crew. I wish to know what your favorite John Carpenter film is. I'd asked Mola previously, but YouTube flizzed when you answered. Sad face. Uh, well, the thing. I mean, it's just, it's, yeah. it's so clear to me. <laughs> the yeah. thing okay. dominates. <laughs> I do like the fog. The fog is okay, but it's nothing compared to the thing. Do you know the difference between fog and mist? The thickness. What is the difference? It's how far you can see through it. So the so thickness. Okay. If if you can see through, um, if you can see at least, I think it's a kilometer, then I think it becomes fog. But if you can, then it's mist. What if I can I see learned... through it because of my x-ray vision? Well, then um, I think it's still, uh, it is what it is. You're just operating on your special powers. You get to ignore the rules. The rules are the rules, but you get to ignore them because you're super powered. I learned that from Lee Mack on an episode of What I Lie to You. What's your favorite John Carpenter film, Rex? I mean, it's got to be The Thing. Probably. What is everyone's backup, then? With... When The Thing gets Escape murdered. Escape from New York? Sure. Yeah. I like They Live. Yeah, that's fair. I'd probably go with Big Trouble in Little China. I haven't seen that, but I've heard it's very good. Yeah, I haven't seen it either, actually. I need to. All right. Do you think that whenever the, the something bad happens in China, but it's not too bad, all of the people who write news articles have to resist the urge to be like big China in little trouble? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I mean, they've probably done that a few times. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough, fair. That's funny. That's amusing. Uh, though flawed, the Orient Express movie had a better ending than the book. In the film, Poirot is conflicted with the choice he needs to make in the end. In the book, he just makes the choice, and that's it. Still a good read. Ooh. Got some mm. controversial Orient Express Ooh. opinions in here. 
Yeah. I don't remember really walking away from that movie thinking that it was like great or good or anything. I just, I don't know. It just, it's fallen out of my mind. I like, I know I have seen that movie, but I just don't remember it ever being like, Oh, that's a good one. You should remember, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Farewell and adieu to you fair Flemish massives. Farewell and adieu, you massives of Fleem. This is uh, gay actor Michael Douglas making a reappearance. Uh, you have Flemish hands, oh. Mr. Massive. You've been counting grumbos all your life. That's a quote from, I assume, the film Chickpea Grumbo. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, You've got meme hands. And they, they also said, I agree with Fringy. Breast reductions violate the Hippocratic Oath. Goodness. All right. I don't recall ever making any comments on that subject. Well, Even though, as we all know, Fringy is is the he's the most sexual of the EFAP hosts. Uh, but I don't, uh, but I don't recall him ever saying that. He I just I don't remember saying something like that. No, just I, I don't think I've ever commented on that uh, subject. Hmm. Smaller smaller breasts can impact the Hippocratic ratio, though. The ratio. What's that? The ratio of uh, breast to hips. Ah, I see. Yeah, like the hippa, uh, yeah. Hip, uh, oh. Uh, hot take. If a film or show has too much good things about it, then you cannot say it is bad. Um. Uh, I'm, not sure what, I'm not sure what is that means. Is that exactly. a hot take? Is it like a or is, quantity or... of good? It reaches a quantity of good stuff that it, that no matter how bad the rest of the yeah, like relative to how much you know what I mean. Like, is he how, just describing how much bad or good? Is he just describing like something that is good isn't bad? Well, because yeah, or for it to have a lot of good, too much good, then there's no space for it to be too much bad. I guess, like, I would agree with because that. Because I, I don't think yeah. I would describe a movie as bad if it had a subst if it had a a sufficiently high amount of good things in it to where I thought the movie was good. Because I'm not going to say a movie is good and bad. Mm. It'll be one or the other. But what if it has, like, it does good, 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 and then it completely does not stick the landing and actually undoes mm. all of the good. It can be complicated. Did. Quantifiably, that... that's one bad thing to a lot of good things, but it means the film is probably bad still. Well, we, norm we normally say that things are, like, mixed when we talk about that. Um, yeah, I'm trying to go by threads, right? Like individual character journeys. Uh, how strong is the theme? How does the plot line look overall? Like, how much damage does this bad ending do? Is it to everything and everyone? In which case, like, oof, that could have like, you know, like poisons the entire story almost. It, uh, uh, you know, it's it depends. I'd have to have some examples, but I'm inclined to both agree and disagree because that's apparently my opinion. I think so. Yeah, like I, if there's enough good things, you can't say it's bad because, like, yeah, because eventually enough good things oh. means that the thing is good and not bad, right? Oh, just reference Midnight Mass. Oh, I oh. was about to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> look, look. Uh, the first five <laughs> episodes are fucking great. Okay, they're so good. Things get things happen. <laughs> As, oh boy. Even my, uh, yeah, I was talking with some, uh, like I mentioned that family trip, and I was talking with uh, an aunt and an uncle, uh, or an uncle and whatever, relatives, and we were talking about Midnight Mass and some stuff, and I was like, yeah, Midnight Mass, it started out really good, but boy, that's one of the worst episode, last episodes I've ever seen of a show, and even they were like, yeah, like, what the hell happened? God, like, it's probably worth me never watching it again, it made me so fucking mad, like, I can't. I, I don't want to. That's why I can't it recommend it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it makes it so hard to recommend it because the last episode is that bad. I can recommend Hill House. I can recommend Bly Manor. But I cannot recommend Midnight Mass. That's how bad it is. Well, that's what you just said that is interesting episode. that you said you could even recommend Hill House that we've got coverage explaining how bad we think the ending to that is, but still. But still. Mmm. Um, still such quality, yeah. Also, force Fringy to say his Across the Spider-Verse opinions. And they got a little Halo smiley face. Which, oh, Fringy, I mean, what I is your Across the opinion on Across the Spider-Verse? I think it's got really great art and animation. Ooh, Ooh yeah, yeah. There you go, that's you true. got a perspective. Ooh, that is his true. opinion. I agree. I agree with Fringy's perspective. I'm inclined to agree with him as well, so... But yeah. I'll, 
I'll be the controversial one here and say that I do not like the look of Gwen's universe. I think it's garish. You mentioned and, that, and I'm yeah. not sure that I agree with you. <laughs> That's yeah. fair. I know it's totally subjective, mm. but especially when we see all of the other places, I don't agree with the... Uh, or not agree. I don't like the way that her universe looks in terms of its color and detail levels. Mm. Um, Otherwise, I, I can understand how you feel that way. Yeah. So, yeah. Um... All right, my face would hurt sometimes when playing Final Fantasy VII Rebirth because of all the smiling I was doing. Oh. Okay. Fair enough, yeah. All right, yeah. Uh, hi, I'm gay actor Michael Douglas, hi. and in EFAP 278, oh. I got a great chuckle out of Rag saying, why can't he believe anything? <laughs> <laughs> what, is, what is the context for me saying that? He can't believe anything. <laughs> I don't know, actually. I'm trying to think that... that... You've got me curious, because just hearing that without remembering the context is funny. 278 was the one before the themes one. I'm trying to remember which yeah, one so that was. Yeah, so that was, uh... Damn it. I feel like I know the... I know what yeah, it was. Yeah, come on, brain. Useless. I can't remember two EFAPs ago for some reason. That was, um... YouTube says oh. it's the Acolyte, Algo fandom, and... Oh, oh yeah, oh, right. thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah because... I can't yeah, believe what? this, blah, 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 that you said, why can't he believe anything? Yeah, I remember. <laughs> I remember. Why can't he believe anything? <laughs> uh, one thing they well, really... If it's not like a fire, all right, then it becomes hard to believe, you yeah. know, what is real and what's fantasy at this point. Doxastic and voluntarism, peak fire, bro. One thing they really acknowledge in movies uh, with very alcoholic characters is how painful it must be for them to go... To... Wait, is there a second half of this? Oh, how to, painful it is for them to go, to go number two. Oh! <laughs> Wait, is it painful Why is it painful as an alcoholic poo if you're an alcoholic? If... Alcoholics in is chat, there... is it painful to poo? <laughs> is it painful? <laughs> what? <laughs> I, alcoholics? I'm a high alcoholic. funny. I've, I've never heard problem. of this. I thought, I thought it was the way they usually do Super Chats where you put, like, you know, one of two. I thought that's what was happening, so it was like, when they go... <laughs> So it's like, where's the other half? So it's like, no, just go number two. If someone Remember, I was at uni with who had the opposite problem, he drank so much he shit himself. Really hard oh to live God. that down. Wait, so is Mauler reading way too much into that? I read what it is. No, that's <laughs> confusing. Exactly I've never said. heard of, of this. I never heard that alcoholism makes it painful to poo. I've never... No, this is news to me. This is, mm -hmm. Yeah, this is news to me. Um, no one in my family is alcoholic, so maybe I just haven't. Maybe it. that's why Randy was having such a difficult time on the pooper. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, that um, joke is so funny, just having Emmy Award winning you know, television series on the screen while Randy is screaming, oh, hot, <laughs> hot, 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 as he's trying to poop. I will say that every number two means a number one, but not every number one means a number two. Uh, I mean, yeah, obviously on that one, I suppose. I'm sorry, I'm collecting images. We've got to rate Skeptile and Weevil. Okay. Uh, okay. So... I'll do, I'll look up Weevil, and you can do the Skeptile. Skeptile. Hopefully that image works. Weevil, I believe, is the first gen. Oh, right. I know him, yeah. So no, here Weedle. he is. Oh, M3, that's, yeah. Weedle? No, Weevil. Weevil. Weavile, yeah. Oh, Weavile, like he's like a jerk. We Weavile. Because Weedle's the cute little caterpillar thing that turns into Beedrill. Yeah. Oh, is, guy. I, okay, I yeah, don't yeah, know what a Weavile is, so I'm guessing it's after Generation I, 2. I'll show you this. Wait, I, this uh, one seems familiar. Like we've, I really like, enjoy how before. smug. I really enjoy how smug. Uh, <laughs> um, I gotta go with, what's the first one? Yeah, I'm going with number uh, one. Skeptile. Or, yeah, I'm going with yeah, Skeptile. Like Look at that. Look at his face. Look He's at his like, face. Eh, He's got an expression. Yeah, the, the second one is a bit anthropomorphic for my taste. And not in a way that I like. Like, Meowth is my favorite Pokemon. Um, yeah. But I feel like Meowth is, like, special in that they're most human-ish in disposition and kind of, like, expressions and stuff. The bottom one looks like like the face of every animated movie cover you know that 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 smug confidence kind of thing but the first one's a mood and i like his 
I, I don't know. I like him. I like the big I fluffy. Like his mood. Yeah. I like the spiny tail. I like how he stand. I like his proportions. I like his face sells it. I, I just, it I love is, the face. Yeah. And the bottom's <laughs> like, oh. He's you're the, so uh, smug. I love it. I really like it. I want to well, see what are. what is what does he come from? He is a he's skeptile. Greek, Greco, Greco, whatever. What's the that's the his Gen three starter Pokemon's. Oh boy, you can start out with this lad. Well, he skeptile. well you don't start with him. He and his like well, yeah. You know. a, oh, there's a mega skeptile too. So he comes from. How do I from Grovile, final form of Trico. Oh yeah. I've seen this guy here. He starts off as this. Yeah. I like why. that. I like him. And then I... he turns into that. Yes, which is another good at looking. I like him. him. It's almost yeah. like Raptory. He's almost like a like a raptor with the wings I on like, his little uh, I like the Gen 3 starters. They're cool. Because you got Mudkip and uh and Torchic. Um, and we then... talked about this extensively on one of our yes, Super Chat catch ups. Did. Talking about a lot of the starting Pokemon for many generations. So, some of them yeah. really good, some of them really bad. Pretty bad, yeah. So, mixed bag. But I like, th I like it a lot. Yeah. Uh, we got an extinct animal of the day. Uh... Woo! Macro Euphractus, the killer armadillo. And this is an. Artist rendition. Uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, oh my goodness. Look at that guy. Look out for him. I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't want to step on him. Looks like the, the kind of thing you have to kill in Fallout. It's like a, yeah. an armored mole rat. A mole rat with armor, yeah. In brackets, they've called it Armakillo. Armakillo. <laughs> yeah, that'd be um, fine for a oh. fantasy setting. Um, actually, someone has just sent me a message. <gasps> Alcohol keeps your body from releasing vasopressin, a hormone that helps your body hang on to fluid by preventing water from going out in your urine. Damn. Less vasopressin l means you'll need to pee more. But when your body gets rid of more fluid than normal, that can make you constipated. Ah. I see. Okay. We know the lore. We then I the agree with the super chat. They need to portray that more in media. Very true. <laughs> Um, <laughs> this one says, "I love Nathan in South Park. That face." Oh yeah, that's uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. He uh, he's very smug as well. You remember him, right? I don't. I don't think. Shut up, Shut up Mimsy. Mimsy. Oh, that, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, um, by the way, because our extinct animal of the day was the killer dillo, um, this was posted on my server earlier. This is a this is a pink fairy armadillo. Huh. That looks like it's trying to be about 15 different animals at once. I know, and you know what? Right on, man. Good him. Yeah, keep trying. You'll get there one day. Uh, fair enough. Thank you for Funny Shriek on OpenBar89. Also, hi, Rax. Hello! Um, yeah, for those who don't know, I, uh, I, I, was, I was experiencing way too much God of War Ragnarok is terrible at once. Uh, <laughs> I like overloaded but it was funny because I had a couple other things ha happening in the background that were really fucking annoying that nobody needs to know about and it, it, I was literally just like oh because some people got the impression that I was annoyed that someone could prefer the OG games to the new ones so I was like what are you talking about I fucking, I'm totally fine with that it completely makes sense especially God of War 3 of which I have expressed many times that I love um, but yes I think that got made into a short on the highlights channel where I was just yeah, yeah. It's, it's only so many times where you can see this, you hear the same thing over and over and over and over again. And you're just like, ah, oh, here we go again. <laughs> um, here's five dollars. Now, can you please do your Thanks. iconic Gwimbly dance for me? <laughs> what? Yeah, here, just like let me. So, the, like, my headphones are off. Let me do it. I gotta stand up for it. All right. So I got, I gotta make a little bit of, make a little bit of room. Gotta move my. my I feel like he is actually over. doing a dance right now. Yeah, I think so. All right. Okay. Well, you can hear it. There you go. That's the Gwimbley dance. Like, while you do that, your foot's got to be back. But you can't <laughs> look. He's even right. teaching you how to do it. You got you to gotta turn back the other way, like this. Then, whoa, just to, just to give him something about, you got to stick that out right there. And then you spin. And then, oh, 
you wrap up right there, right where you started. It's it's not there, and there you go. That's it. Good stuff. I'm gonna give that a six. I've seen better, I think. Yeah, it's really good. You've probably seen it uh before. You just didn't know that was uh what it actually was. I think that was just a really, really consumable good. way to learn how to do it, really which a lot of people do need. I I've got a I got a thick rug back there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, so you couldn't hear the you know the tapping, but you know you you'd see it. It's in I think that was a good Grimbly dance. It, I do think yeah, so. it, it matches yeah. up it matches up with the way your hands move, which is really the it's it's key. This is a message to your to my future self. You better have finished your outline by the time you read this. Also, hi Rags. Hello. Well, I hope you finished your outline. Good luck. But don't punish yourself too hard if you haven't, okay? Genius takes time. A shilling for the spiritualism seance meter. Well, thank you very much. Oh, yeah, yeah. Seances don't come cheap. I've hardly seen any marketing for this movie. I'll have to check it out. Well, just after you dumbos check out DDLC. I mean, I, I do recommend it, but honestly, like I said, I only was like, I'll watch it in the background while I'm doing work, uh, just so that I get an idea of what they're up to, because the fact that it was like a, a halloween -y one, I was like, that could, that, yes. I like my halloween -y stuff. But like I said, it, it earned my attention the more it was going on. I was like, oh, okay, okay, you're not being cringe, all right, neat. I don't no. think I would have heard of this if Muller hadn't, you know, suggested yeah, no, I... that we watch it, and I'm glad he did, because I saw, uh... It was in it was in front of a movie. I forget which one it was, but at the theater, in in before the movie was an ad for Death on the Nile. But I never saw one for this, so who knows? I'm trying to remember how I knew this existed because yeah, I don't feel like I was marketed about it at all. But uh, maybe it was something somewhere at some point that got me to be aware of it. What's you guys' opinion on the Pirates of the Caribbean trilogy? Aren't there are there more than trilogy? Aren't there like there four? Five. 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 Jeez, shows what I know. Well, I like the first maybe. one a lot. Yeah, first one's great. As far as I'm concerned, it goes Every... really good, good, uh, bad, really okay. bad. Bad. Yeah. What's weird is that not only can I not remember how many there are, but I only remember the first one, and I think I've seen all five. But after the first one, they in my mind have just been like in a they've been blenderized oh, kind of like all the transformers of, movies i remember the set pieces you know fairly well oh yeah and, uh, yeah some of the things i remember uh, world's end parts of the caribbean um the mummy and like hot fuzz would be like three of my top voted funnest movies of all time probably they they're just fun they're really everything's fun. so much fun in them are they still doing that all-female reboot, or...? I hope so. Uh, I think they're doing a reboot of some kind, but I'm not sure, like, the nature of it. I'm and, uh... certainly hoping that they go through with it, because, boy, I, I think sure it's time do for women. money. That's what I think. <laughs> yeah, it's time for women pirates. It... Da, 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 I da, agree. Da, da, da. I adopted a bird da, and named da, da, it Fringled, da, 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 da. though it doesn't have a goo obsession. Oh, oh well. Also, Rags, what, 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 what would you recommend for first AR-15? Oh, I don't know the brands really well or anything. I mean, just uh, your standard kind of AR-15 is the way to go. Um, there's a few things I would recommend, though. I would recommend that you get one that has a, a rail on top, not one that has a fixed, like, fixed carry handle sights and a fixed uh, front post, uh, so that later on down the road, if you want to put on a scope or a red dot, um, you have that option. It's something that I highly recommend that people go for, uh, so that if you find that you're really getting into the hobby and you really like that gun in particular, though putting a scope or a red dot on the gun, it changes a lot, particularly a scope with, you know, what you can do with it and how it feels to shoot and how far you can go. So set yourself up for success. Also, you don't have to pay a lot of money for a good AR-15. AR-15s are very cheap. We've had them for a long time. They're everywhere. You don't have to spend a lot of money, so you don't have to break the bank thinking like, oh, I gotta spend a lot of money to get a really good one. It's like, no, no, it's, it's an AR-15. You'll, you'll be fine. You can, buy a, you can buy a cheap one. It'll be just fine. Um, if you're just, especially if you're just starting off getting into shooting, I highly doubt that the, the, the MOA accuracy of the gun is gonna matter to you. It's gonna be more you than anything else. But um, yeah, go uh, go for that is what I would uh, I'd recommend probably All more right. than anything right now at least. So there you go. Oh, also uh, it's important make sure you know the difference between five five six and two two three. Um, 
because you can put one in you can put one in the other but not the other in the other so make sure you know when you buy that you're buying a specific one and that you don't put the wrong you know one because one's interchangeable and one's not so just know that so there you go uh I've got to say, the Pokedex entries you read aren't always accurate. The entries are submitted by the children who own the devices, so they are more hearsay than hard facts. Unreliable narratatisms. Listen, if a Pokemon is listed as possibly being able to eat my soul, and it was a troll by a kid, I'm still not going anywhere near that Pokemon. Yeah. Um, and I get these from a pretty good site, but I, I guess it's, you know, I guess... I think they mean in-universe, they're submitted by the children... Who have devices unless they mean oh. it can actually be updated by kids on the websites in which case yeah that makes them useless a little bit i feel like it would be a big element not to allow bizarre misinformation about pokemon yeah. like that to persist in the world and you wouldn't want to have like a children's story about how it steals your soul to be the like defining numero uno fact about it on the pokedex you know um it's like, what kind of weird ass science? It's like the, the professor says, hey, go out and, and discover everything about the world. This is going to be our authoritative guide, child, for how the world works later. So don't make shit up. And then Ash just goes and just makes shit up. And that's just how science now works in, in Pokemon. Is that really? That doesn't seem believable. I got There's a lot of things about that. Yeah, it's... I feel like the Pokemon universe started out as a fun little idea for kids, and it had its games and its cards, and then yet there wasn't a lot of planning ahead in terms of how does this world actually function. It just kind of goes as it goes, and goes as it goes, and that's just, you know, that's just kind of it. And I don't know, in a way, it, it's just kind of funky, and there you go. Some, it's just a funky world. The funky nightwear, nightmare realm the Pokemon world is. Finally, the Blastoise catching is a five foot three and yeah. one of these live for once. Thanks for always giving me excellent content to listen to while I work. You too, Platoon. No oh, problem. yeah. Glad you enjoy it. You bet. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Suchet's Poirot evolves through the seasons, starts as a cozy whodunit. The final stories are dark and challenging, and the OG actors nailed the tone shift. Good example of modern audience adaptations. Hmm. All right. I'd be interested to check out maybe some of what I consider the best episodes of the show. Cool. Uh, yeah, yeah could do likewise. Could do that. Funny how what we discuss as writing refers to more than what's written on the script. Uh, improv, directing choices, etc. It all adds to the story. That is true. We do often try to talk about some more things outside of it, including performance. But we usually try and contextualize it as like how it's assisting the story, as opposed to simply a flair of the dramatic or, or some kind of, you know element that we just think is kind of neat that they did we usually try and talk about why it's assisting whatever storytelling choice they're going for uh the dutch angles for example like i said some people have complained about them but i feel like there's a lot of purpose to them in this story to make you feel off center uneased whenever we're uh, in the spookier parts of the atmosphere uh, atmosphere of the film you know and that's a that's not in the script well i guess it could be in the script as a note um but it's not yeah, like a Script and writing is often used kind of as a bit yeah. of an umbrella catch-all term for, you know, the creative decisions of the movie. Visual and aural and spiritual. Does, does that mean it could just have been a really happy accident that he uses the Dutch angles all the time? <laughs> and it just so happens that in well, this film they make sense, but they in the many next in, one um, they won't? In, uh, in the Murder on the Orient Express. Panel, yeah. Nope. Yeah, so I, I think it is something he does deliberately. I remember in the Thor, people talked about how the, <laughs> the, the Dutch angles were yeah. for times where Thor was confused or when Thor was, uh, you know, not like like. I'd have to rewatch it to give a better assessment of this, but Branagh definitely likes Dutch angles, and that's okay. I think that they have a lot of use. Yeah, I I, I do think though that if uh, Ariadne was the one who directed the film, they wouldn't be Dutch angles; they'd be Finnish angles. That's a that's one for the real fans. Funny. Oh wait, that's the one I read. Uh, at little platoon, I can't believe you spoiled the end of Poirot, you bastard. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, actually, yeah, you you did actually just do that. You did spoil I, the I did. Did. of one of the it wrongest, was in the longest back of my mind as I was saying it, and I thought, no, no one's gonna care. But now wow. I realize I've just ruined actually, like fifteen yeah. years worth of television show has just gone down that the drain because I spoiled true. it. Back, All over. Yeah. If I had a time machine. Then I would, I probably wouldn't spend it fixing blunders like that in podcasts. I'd probably be like, I don't know, 
I'm probably doing some other stuff. Hey lads, a warning. During the tribulation, don't take the mark of the beast, which will likely be a chip. If you do, you'll go straight to hell when you die. Uh-oh. A microchip? Yeah, I've, I've heard that the mark of the beast could be... It's like barcodes. You know that thing where a lot of like crazy fundamentalist Christian types think that stuff like barcodes and everything are marks of the beast? Well, what about if it's like a donut? Uh, stuff like that. Then I need it. Um, a, a donut? <laughs> like the mark of the beast is like a circle, like a thick circle. No, like a donut that you eat because it's tasty. Oh, um, I think is, I think it depends on how you maybe pay for the item and how your currency is being tracked in the transactional process. What if it's like Ned Flanders ghost? The of, uh, Ned Flanders devil that offers it to you. If a devil offers you something, Take you it? should be wary. The problem is, how do you distinguish the danger, uh, the angels, the angels from the the devils that's the thing it's i i do recall it as a um as a question post uh dillahanty would uh matt dillahanty would ask it of christians sometimes in conversations is he would ask how are you so sure that god is the good one and satan is the evil one because we never really get their perspective or their say on things yeah it's, when's uh, the devil gonna release his book I'm telling you man bible reloaded oh wait that was a show wasn't it Long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. That's right. I'm going to grab a drink. I'll be right back. Hey, guys. Thanks for all the content and keep up the good work. Well, thank you. And I'm yeah, sure we thanks. shall. The Devil Bible. Was there a... That's probably in uh, Binding of Isaac, right? It's got to be. This one just says, whoop, whoop. What am I to do with this? Raising it. Mm. My favorite jump scare is in Castaway. Tom Hanks peeling his band-aid, then suddenly the plane flips sideways, plummeting fast. The suddenness serves a greater purpose. is isn't just two seconds of nonsense. Man, I haven't seen Castaway forever. Yeah, likewise. It's been a long time. Like my memory's wiped of that film. I should see it again someday. I remember being neat. Who doesn't love Wilson? Best character. That was the bull, right? Uh, well, I said best character, so I figured, yeah. Yeah. And this one says, Major Look. Truly, you got me. Uh, I'm always loving your Steamages. Steamages? Steamages? I'm playing Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Love it, but would love a Lord of the Rings 2 Towers PS2 single or metal two-player uh, Return of the King. Do it, please. I did a full playthrough of Two Towers and Return of the King on Super Chat catch-ups, like... A year or two years ago. They're in there somewhere. I don't know which one it's in, but I did I did play through all of it. <laughs> just like I played through like a shit ton of Lego games. Remember that era for you? I was just playing through loads of GameCube games. I do remember that era, yes. A lot of uh, a lot of double dash. Yes. Random Film Talks video on Arcane is amazing. Even more in depth than the Arcane coverage. If you have seven hours, you should give it a watch. Hearing his take on Huma Duba raise it to an eight point five from an eight point five to a nine. Uma Duba. I think, well, that might be referencing. But yes, um, Random Film Talks video on Arcane. I've not seen it yet. I think I watched the first hour, I want to say. But um, I'll have to get around to it wow. at some point. Have you seen it, Rags? I've not seen them yet. Wow. You know who Huma Duber right. is? Huma Duber? Mm hmm. No. Okay. All right. Well. Uh, best jump scares for me was RE2 and just open the door and I see Mr. X about 20 feet away from me and he turns, sees me and starts chasing. Yeah, that yeah, can work. You know, like, like that. Especially, I always think like stuff like that works better without music. Yeah, because it's just the, the disconcerting with the silence rather than needing the big musical cue to shock you. Yeah, if it's a really good jump scare, I'll provide all the sound effects, okay? That's right. Uh, I like when Fringy says, point being, my late best friend said it in a mocking way that sounded like the monarch. Now I say it when the frog says it. Oh, well, uh, yeah. I, uh, From Venture Bros, the monarch? Like, right, it, it just happens. There's a, a, a turn of phrase that gets in my brain for like a couple of months, and then it'll get replaced with something else once I start to notice I do it too much. It's, it's good cycle. to have cycles. Yeah, it's good to have cycles. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. It'd be good to just not have a thing that I always say. <laughs> like nothing wrong with that for a little bit. Yeah, uh, it's okay to have verbal mannerisms. You know. Yeah. yeah. I suppose. 
Uh, Super Mario sequel already has a release date, and that can't bode well for quality. How would Efab write Mario 2 as an excellent yet faithful film? Hmm. Uh, isn't it coming out like two years from now? Yeah, and I imagine they plug That's in a hell of a lot of effort years, into it. It's three probably years gonna... removed. Shrek 2 came out three years before, three years after, rather, the first Shrek, so, you know. Going forward with these big franchises, we are doing so in a post, quote-unquote, Disney collapse. So I wonder if that will color a lot of things going forward for these big IPs. My. Because um, uh, it very well might. Uh, yeah, I, I, I certainly hope it does. I hope that all these big companies, big projects do so in an environment where they're like, oh, shit, you know, I remember when Disney, you know, was king of the world and they had everything going great. And look at them now. We need to avoid the mistakes they did. Yeah. Well, what would your broad story be for Mario 2? I I'm think sure, that it, honestly. Yeah, I guess broad. I don't know about broad story stuff because the story can be all sorts of things, I guess. Uh, I, I don't actually know. Uh, that Mario Sunshine, not go huge... do it. Yeah, do it. <laughs> go to a place and have all the references or and the clever have ones. Have that be a spin off TV show on Nintendo Plus. Oh, you might. Nintendo Plus. Dear God. I can't handle more. I can't handle any more. Yeah, I don't know. The I don't know that you're gonna be like when you say like a faithful or a, a Mario it's a is complicated um, for the Mario movie, you know. Yeah, because the first one hasn't exactly like copied its basic plot from any particular exactly. Mario game. Um, nor should it necessarily do that. It's complicated to have the perfect Mario film. We'll give it a shot. Like we said, the um, the Mario film was better than I thought it was. Gonna, I thought it was gonna be awful. So I was like, oh, it's not. Highly cringe, okay, you know. Yeah, I quite liked it. I thought it was a fun movie. I enjoyed it. I smiled a lot, and I actually laughed at it. Some we discussed it being, with uh, Little Platoon, actually, right? We did. That's right. And yeah. Tetris did. and 65. <laughs> oh, you're right. I remember that episode. It's the only Tetris reason I remember great. 65 exists, is because it always comes up in relation to the other two. <laughs> it's always a good time for a film. No one remembers 65. Yeah, no, Adam Driver doesn't in... remember 65. No. He was like, he... He'll see that. He'll see a poster for it or something. It'll be like, was oh, it, yeah, was that me? I did that. I did that. Oh, is that? And then he slaps himself. He's like, am I awake? This is a crazy dream. Uh, Oi, Morley, I've returned from Shangri-La, where I was enlightened to the wonder that is Iron Man 3. Time for your unbridled praise to spread the word. Mm -mm. No. Maybe someday, no. though, I'll make the video talking about how it's awful. Because it does come up around so while people being like, you know, I have the through is actually really good. It's like, no. No, yeah, it, it does, doesn't it? It's like, it's, when, it's almost like when people try to create the new narrative for something that has already been decided. <laughs> it's like, you know what? The Marvels was actually, it's pretty good. Everybody skipped it. It's like, shut up. You're a liar. You're a liar. <laughs> You're trying to trick us. Liar. Uh, anyone watched Inner World 2011? I love it. That sounds familiar, no, I haven't heard but of no, it. I haven't seen it. I do not know of this inner, inner world. world. I think inner it's world. about that, actually, funnily enough. But yeah, uh, I, I, I'm not familiar, unfortunately. Fringy's Homeland has a lot of haunting true crime stories, like the backpacker murders in Bal Balanglo? Balanglo? Is that right? Balanglo! I, I don't know. There, there's towns I haven't heard of. And the Beaumont country. children in Adelaide. This stuff scares me more than any movie. Hmm. Beaumont uh, children in Adelaide. I mean, there's, there's lots of some scary, like, you know, true crime things all around the world. Didn't Australia once lose one of its prime ministers because he went walking on a yeah, beach and just disappeared? Harold Holt, he went for a swim and never came back. That was the one. Um, so, yes, Harold Holt. Like the creator just, like, of Yu Gi Oh! Yeah. It, What's the creator? What's the story with the creator of Yu-Gi-Oh? I believe that was recently. It was like the last, I think it was two years ago or so. Kazuki Takahashi, I believe his name was the creator of Yu-Gi-Oh. I think he uh, tragically drowned when he went swimming. Um, in no, no, he went to the shadow realm. That's how this works. He didn't ah, die. That's right. Shadow that's realm. Right. Well, so what the thing with Howard Holt? It's that he disappeared. It's not actually confirmed. I mean, obviously he's dead, but like it wasn't. Like, he just disappeared. Oh, he went yeah, for a swim and he disappeared. He never came uh, back. 
addendum to what I said um, that I forgot about. Chat was reminding me he was trying to save someone. I think he was trying to save a, oh, a kid yeah. from drowning. Right. Um, yeah. And he made an attempt, and uh, he drowned trying to save a kid. So quite a tragedy. Yeah, it sounds it. Like... He could save others from death. I can't, I can't read the next one because of the total. He ran out of life points. Is dead. the correct reference you need to make, but. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm going to read a different one first. Women need to take Rags' as Hippocratic Oath. I'm not sure True. what that means, but yeah, okay. Um, hello, Eve Happers. Is... Yeah. Have any of you seen letters from Iwo Jima and flags from our fathers? If so, what are your thoughts? I think they're criminally underrated and deserve praise. Hi, Rags. Hello. I have Iwo not Jima seen one. those That's, movies. Uh, Clint Eastwood directed that, didn't he? I think I saw that when I was super young. It would have been when my dad showed me, I but I can't remember it. Nope. Well, if he directed it, I bet it's really good. I mean, he's pretty reliable. Um, though I haven't seen all I'm of his... He's fairly reliable. ...his films. Did you check out uh, Mystic River yet, Free? No, uh, not yet. I hadn't seen that before. It's, uh, that film's ending, without saying anything, is so controversial. The amount of discussion on it I checked out is insane. So many people either fall in line with it, feel 50-50 on it, or absolutely hate it. Like, the have it's okay. just everywhere it's uh, kind of interesting to think about it is it is absolutely an ending that when you watch it you'll be like oh shit this would have caused all kinds of fucking problems um rags my cousin used to suck in air with his anus one time my dad walked in as he was ripping out a loud one he said nothing and slowly backed away as he shut the door the uh, correct response yeah sometimes you just yeah you know yeah. You got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away and when to run, as the old lyrics go. I like that song. Disney Star Wars is like poetry. It's cringe. I am dyslexic Michael Douglas actor. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I thought they were going to go, it's like poetry. It's cringe. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. uh, hi. Sometimes. Any of By the way, seen... if you're... Just like, it, if it doesn't rhyme, it's not a poem, and fuck off. All right? You're just talking. It's Carry No, on. it's if it's not metrical, it's not a poem. You can have, like, no, metrically if it's consistent not, poetry. No, if it ain't rhyming, I, then get I, the I, fuck, fuck out. Like, These fucking nerds, man. Just, uh, was it, what is it? Like, five, five syllables? Seven, five. Seven syllables? Yeah. But they don't haikus? Have to rhyme, haikus, are, yeah. haikus are cute. Now, if you ain't rhyming, oh God, you, you right. found your way in here, you can find your way back out. Okay. Hi. Oh, any of y'all seen Gummo? Very odd or Gummo? Ever, <laughs> very odd movie. No. Made a uh, less than one out of ten. It's budget back. I wonder what you'd think of it though. I don't know anything don't know. about Gummo. Who is Gummo? <laughs> Who is Gummo? That's or a good documentary Gummo? title. Gummo. Gummo Who or is Gummo? Gummo? I don't know. Who uh, here's an animal that I didn't wish I knew existed. The tongue-eating oh. louse replaces a fish's tongue with itself. Some parasites. Man. I know that one, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I've yeah. seen these. It's yeah. fucking horrifying, we could do without. We could, not, we could not have those, you know? Yeah, when they came up with that, just... it was like, actually, we're scrapping this one. And God's like, no, 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 I worked really hard. He's like, no, we're scrapping this one. We're not putting this in. They don't need this Yeah, and they're one. like, what are we doing with the unicorns? It's like... Not doing it. No, not doing I it. just uh, nah. We've already got horses. There's so, a glitch where they know, can whatever. fly, and that's just not like it's not weird. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, only virgins can see them, and that's gonna be <laughs> awkward sometimes. So, hi, rags. Oh, that would be if if that if if unicorns were actually a thing, and only virgins could see them. You could like if you passed by a farm that was like a unicorn ranch, right? A unicorn ranch, and if you were a virgin so you could see them, you could no, how would you how would you trick someone? You'd say, Oh yeah, you would just you could just point to an empty field and be like, Oh, it's a unicorn ranch and just look at the other person and see if they'd call you out on it or not. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. But wouldn't they know in that culture to never react to anything that could be construed as a unicorn? Maybe. But what they would also do is they could use that as an objective line, uh, a standard for what does and does not constitute losing virginity. Like if you if you have if you oh like you know what would that constitute put a fake yeah? horn on a horse, 
that be like, you can't see oh, that, can yeah. you? And then if they yeah. go, I, I, I can't see that, you'd be like, oh, why are you lying, <laughs> bro? <laughs> <laughs> or that guy would be called Gumo, and he would have been screwed Gumo. up. Gumo. Oh, there's Gumo. <laughs> he's, Gumo. He's, oh, he's a trickster, that Gumo. Uh, hi, Rags. What makes a good doggo? Um, often, really, first off, hello, but what makes a good doggo is often what makes a good person. Uh, you need to have, you know, good, solid moral foundations. You need to be honest and you need to be, you know, have uphold the, you know, pillars of kindness and responsibility. You shouldn't be selfish. You should look out for other people when you can. You should consider what your talents are and how to use them well, how to make the world a better place. Uh, you know, a lot of the stuff that you'd expect makes a good person, uh, makes a good doggo. Pissing on things to mark your territory. Mm -hmm. That's true. I know many Making people who do asshole. that, and all of them are good. A lot of them are alcoholics, but, you know, just because you, you know, got your issues doesn't mean you're a bad person. So. Um, I would go so far as to say this movie is better than the book it was loosely based on. Halloween Party Damn. is one of Agatha Christie's weakest novels, IMO. Ooh. Oh, Interesting. Wow. Well, I haven't read the book, but I really like the movie, so that's a solid maybe. Mm-hmm. Interesting, yeah. Uh, Monkey Man is the Indian John Wick 4, a.k.a. real shit. I've seen people mentioning Monkey Man. It's a film that's coming out. I, uh... I think it's uh, just Man? come out, so yeah, oh, okay, I'm interested yeah. in watching it. I mean, eventually, we'll uh, hopefully not too long, we'll get Extraction 3, right? At some point, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Well, I'll be excited to see that. If reality is anything to go by, it's probably going to get more and more silly. Um, it's unfortunate. Mm. That's just how it goes. Yeah. Luckily, they, they haven't jumped the shark. The transition from Extraction 1 to Extraction 2 felt like, all right, we are, things are ramping up, but we're not, it's not crazy yet. So, by the way, I'd recommend both Extraction 1 and Extraction 2. As would Good I. Movies. I would recommend them. Sorry to go back to Pokemon, but I must know your thoughts on the wonderful boy that is Sveil. Sveil? 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 Uh, Sveil? S-P-H-E-A-L. If you want to go have a is look at that. Is that the seal one. thing that just, it's like a beach ball, but it has like a seal's tail. I think that sounds oh, familiar. Oh, yeah, let me get you a picture. I got a picture of him here. Beautiful. Yeah, I'll get a picture of all. The isn't there a Gen 1 one which looks like a seal and its name is just Seal? You kind of <laughs> ran, out of, ran out of ideas for that one, didn't you? <laughs> it's Dugong and... Oh, yeah, um... look at him! I like him, yeah. Cool. I like him a lot. I'm a big fan. Look. He's a bull. Oh, yeah, you're, yeah Seal, S-E-E-L, evolves into Dugong. <laughs> I like it. I like Seal. I like him. Yeah, I like. I, I like, like him a lot. I like. No, sorry, Sfeel. I like Sfeel. Yeah. I like it. Yeah, I like. Him look too. at him. I mean, what else is there to say? He's a cute lad. Looks like he's having fun. I gotta look up his Pokédex entry though. Uh, Pokédex. I bet it's. I bet he doesn't kidnap any children's souls in the forest. Probably not. That doesn't seem like him. That doesn't seem like him. But it's always uh, the ones you least expect. That's the rule. Hmm. I mean, he's got vampire teeth, so he must be a predator of some sort. Also, his eyes are facing forward. Um, mm, let's that's see. That's an astute observation. Mm -hmm. uh, Sfeel is much faster rolling than walking to get around. <laughs> okay. When groups, of the, <laughs> when groups of this Pokemon eat, they all clap at once to show their pleasure. Because of this, their meal times are noisy. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, I, re I really like it. Uh, there tends to be a general, uh, consistency on them rolling and clapping their fins when they are happy. So. And, uh, they finish with hi to all of you lads and good job on waking up so early, Fringy, with all love heart. Yeah. Yeah, Fringy, what time yep. in the morning do you wake up for EFAP? Well, the clocks have just changed again, so really early. Back very, to very early. Very early. Too early, one might say. Mm -hmm. By the way, Fringy, Lego released a BTAS set. Pretty neat, building it now. Play Prey 2017. Uh, yeah, one day. All right, I'm still upset about Prey 2. 
that's uh Batman the animated series B test, right? Yeah. But also, yes, play play prey. It is legitimately very animated. good. It is legitimately yeah. very good. Um the Luthan Jedi theory is flawed because it forgets Skeen's line, Sky Kyber. Look at it glow, appealing to the group, not just Jedi, no Kyber. Hi Rags. Hello. Well, I think the theory was tied to the fact that it's his crystal. Um Springy, maybe you can help me out on that because I can't quite remember, but doesn't he give a crystal to Andor? That's his like good luck or some shit. Uh oh yeah, yeah, that's right. He uh he gives him like a Kyber crystal that he has attached to a necklace that he uh can hold on to as, as kind of like, here's an assurance, that's worth a lot of money, so hold on to that, and uh, then when you finish the job and you get paid, I will uh, I want that back. There is a theory from Rich Evans of Red Letter Media, because he enjoyed Luthen so much, he's very concerned that Disney will ruin him by making him a Jedi, that he was a secret Jedi the I whole time. I don't think they will. Uh, and his evidence the was Andor the Kyber weapon. crystal, and the fact that he holds that stick in a couple of shots that kind of look lightsabery, and he worries that that's the setup. Because Disney are awful. I mean, Disney are awful, but it is the <laughs> Andor writers who managed to well, make something Well, what I really said great. here was first, I hope not, but secondly, even if he is a secret Jedi, that doesn't ruin him. Like it, that is also my opinion. I think that if he is a Jedi, I have enough confidence in Tony Gilroy and the writers yeah. and his process that he knew this from the beginning, and it's going to be for a purpose. So. Um, even mm -hmm. if I'm happy to never see another Jedi again, however, uh, I know Acolyte's coming out, so, well, life is disappointment. Oh, well, there's an interesting I, uh... bit of news, isn't it, that, um, Bo Willeman, uh, who was one of the writers on, uh, Andor, is yes. going to be writing the, uh, the, um, James you... Mangold, uh, Jedi origin story film. Do you like how it was, like, said in that post that the guy who wrote... And people, yeah. The, uh, he wrote that. He wrote the Arc to five uh, prison arc. Yeah, one way out yeah. and Luther's speed. Like, yeah, it's, I love how yeah. universally known it is that those are just well written. <laughs> it's just that's oh, what that it, is. It's really cool. And it's, it, it's the kind of thing where you hear that news and you're like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> like a movie that I had no interest in at all has now become a movie that I'm looking at like, huh? Okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll see. All right, yeah. I mean, that's a really good idea. They should be, if they're smart, they should be offering those guys more jobs. Uh, the writing team, the directors, they should be offering them more work. Find mm -hmm. ways to give them stuff to do. Yes. For Star Wars. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, Rags' cousin used dead cockroach. I don't know what that means. Some distant reference, maybe? I, I can't remember. I'm so sorry. Maybe, but I... Yeah, it maybe eludes me. Uh, hey, guys, is there any good oh. recently released horror movie around? I'm starving for good horror. I think we all are. Just saw there is a Pet Cemetery sequel out, Bloodlines. Is that any good? Well, I haven't seen it, but... I don't know. Good new horror movies. That is a tough category. Um, Good horror movies. It's not a genre I peruse, really. Yeah, I, uh... I'm trying to think. I mean, th this isn't exactly a, you know, Haunting in Venice is not a horror movie. It's got some spooky, spook in it, yeah. But, yeah, it's got some spook in there. So maybe that'll tide you over. I don't know. I couldn't tell you. I just don't know. Um, boop, boop, boop. What's your favorite Pokemon and ideal team? Also, high rags. My favorite, hello, my favorite Pokemon is Meowth. Um, I don't know about ideal team. It'd be stuff like, you know, Venusaur, you know, the uh, Nitto King or Nitto Queen. I've always liked them. They're cool. Um, uh, Rhyhorn's really cool. Hmm. I like, um, I, I'm mostly familiar with the Gen 1 Pokemon. I like Meowth. Alakazam. I want a good... Oh yeah, he wouldn't. He'd be like, he'd just be like my sidekick. He wouldn't be on like the team of six that fights and everything. You wouldn't let him fight. You um, want to take care of him. Yeah, yeah. It's not that I don't love all of them <laughs> equally. It's just I, I love him the most equal of all of the Pokemon. Yes, of course. Um, I like yeah something like an Alakazam, a psychic kind of Pokemon. Out of Haunter. I probably want to. I just like Haunter. like a yeah like a, a Gengar something like that. Haunter is really cool though. I remember when I was young, there was a Pokemon manga. I think, and it was, it was like uh, about a haunter who was like a super haunter, and he'd like eat people's dreams and shit in their sleep, and it would like eat their souls and stuff. 
Um, and it was really cool. Uh, there was some some neat uh, little old old comics way back in the day where Ash was you know doing Pokemon stuff. So yeah. that was neat. Um, I would yeah. There's there's a lot of Pokemon I like. I, Arcanine is really cool. Um, I really like. Oh, oh, what is um. Dragonite is really neat. Gyarados, I've always really thought was super cool. The big mystical sea serpent kind of, you know, guy. But, you know, I like that. I like it. I like Zepdos. Blastoise. Eh. Mewtwo. I really like Squirtle. Squirtle's great. Yeah. Squirtle. Love I don't them. think if if I was in the Pokemon world, I wouldn't fight Pokemon. I they'd just be my pals, and we'd hang <laughs> yeah, out. Exactly. And, you know, I'd just be have a have a good time taking care yeah, of them. And of course. Or maybe I, I I mean actually I think we talked about this. If this was the Pokemon world, I think I'd just have this podcast with my friends where we talk about movies and stuff. Is probably what I would do in the Pokemon world. The fact that there was Pokemon in the world wouldn't actually change that this is what I want to do and what I enjoy. We would just have to have a sarcastic, sassy Meowth as a co-host. It wasn't there. Ah, oh, there was a game, wasn't there? When Pik is basically like Pikachu just watches Pokemon-related TV. Pokemon TV. Yeah, Pokemon, it Pokemon, Pokemon, Pokemon TV. It was called Pokemon, Pokemon Channel. It was on Pokemon Game Channel. That's the one. Ah. Yeah, it, they had a they had a news show on there where uh, it was it was uh, Psyduck, and he would read the news, and he'd be like, Psyduck, Psyduck. And then it would like show the the news on the you know like the little square of like ah here's the news story and I think he wore a suit. I think Psyduck wore a suit. I'm a big fan of Psyduck as well. He's one of my favorite yeah. Pokemon. Pokemon Channel Psyduck. Mm. Yeah, he had a tie. Looks yeah. like he's wearing a tie here. <laughs> he's got a little blue tie on. Yeah. He he did PNF Pokemon News. And I remember Flash. there was um there was a there was like a shopping channel. You remember the you know like those shopping channels where they'd be like, oh this is a this is a beautiful necklace here and it's available for like $20 oh yeah those. Or something. They had that. Is that uh, a thing? But... That's one of the things I can't imagine that people actually watch. Well, it was South Park made jokes about it. It was uh, for the the Cash for Gold like episode where it was about oh, all yes. people watching it and then Stan calling into <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hmm. uh, there's a swimming school named after Harold Holt because we here in Australia think we're funny. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean it's kind of a meme, um, which is it's, you know, so it's a tragedy. A man like went out for swimming and, and died, but. People still make jokes about it. Well, don't worry, Fringy. He could have died on the way there or been murdered on the way back, you know? It's Possible. just one of those bizarre instances of, like, the leader of the country just disappeared. That's crazy. That's wild. It is crazy. Nowadays, you expect them to be watched 24-7 constantly with, like, security Low personnel. Jacked. I can oh. actually imagine, um, like, uh, like, if the president goes to the beach, <laughs> he just has people in full suits and sunglasses on the beach there with him, like, running yeah. to chase after him as he's running around. Well, I could just imagine, like, Joe Biden plays golf, right? Like, if he was playing golf and then, like, a tree branch started to fall down that the Secret Service guys would whip out, like, a rocket launcher and blow it up. I thought you were going to say they tackle him out of the way, they just turns to dust, <laughs> so they just go... Psh! <laughs> like, oh shit! Uh, no, I, I just like the idea of uh, I, I actually in my head I was like, is it funnier if it's a rocket launcher? Or if they just fire so many bullets at the tree branch that it disintegrates into nothing? It's like, funnier with the bullets, of, I think. Yeah, a bunch of they rifles just all and shoot pistols. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they just, mm -hmm. they just shoot everything, regardless of context. Uh, boop, boop, boop. I can haiku, dude. Barely an inconvenience. I just did that shit. You see what he did there? He just made a haiku. That was pretty cool. That is cool. Yeah. That's really, that's really clever. Most of the Good time, job. people say that they were introduced to the little platoon via Mauler, but it was actually the opposite for me. Thanks to platoon, I now know Mauler, Nerdorotic, and Drinker, and I, I Whoa. believe I am for it. Cheers. Hooray! Beautiful. The wonderful yeah. circle of life, where we share each other's fleems, and then everyone gets splashed <laughs> with fleem juice. Uh, thoughts on the, it's supposed to be, slash always has been silly, slash dumb, you're wrong to compare it to minus one argument about the Godzilla franchise, RE Godzilla X Kong. I was actually speaking to Platoon about this. Um, what they think is happening is a bunch of new fans are coming into their culture without realizing the history of it. 
But what's actually happening is that they, as a mini culture of movies, is entering a huge, well-established culture of we laugh at the shit movies while calling them shit movies. They don't get the pass because you really, really like memeing with them. In the same way that The Room, no matter how much people love it, still shit, okay? Like, that's just, as long as we're clear on this. Like, I'm more than happy to join with the Godzilla fans in laughing. But if you remember, we went through this with King of the Monsters. People were like, you fools, you don't even know what you're talking about. It's like, it's a shit movie. It is a really I bad don't, movie. It sucks. Oh, it sucks. I don't care <laughs> if you've got a history of saying they're not shit. They're still shit. And then I've seen notions like, you can't say that we can't love this. It's like, go ahead and love it. I don't care if you love it. That's not the point. I'm just talking about how, like, because I know the uh, movie cynic has received quite a bit of heat for saying <laughs> that Godzilla X Kong or whatever the fuck it's called is bad, which is funny because it's so much worse than King of the Monsters. And we got a bunch of shit for saying that was bad back in the day. And the Godzilla fans are especially annoyed because people are comparing to Minus One, an actually very well-written well, Godzilla movie. It's really, it's been fascinating to watch because I, I sorry, I keep bringing it up, but it, it blows my mind that like I distinctly remember when King of the Monsters came out that people said that that was what they wanted a Godzilla film to be, and then, you know, Godzilla Minus One comes out, and then that gets pointed to as what a Godzilla film should be, which I think is more apt, obviously. But like this is irrec, like they are fundamentally contradictory as being like what Godzilla should be. One of them's a story. The other one was, no, we don't want a story. We want the big big lizard to fight the monsters. That's what we wanted to see. I, I, I got any fucking golf anyway. That's like fifteen percent of the film is the monsters it's fighting bad. the rest it's of it's the barely. human shit. Like, I'm actually doing a video on it because like I, I'm a sadomasochist and I like bullying bad films and I like being hated for it. But like equally <laughs> it's kind of erotic. So like I'm doing a Godzilla XCOM video, and making the point specifically that I'm deliberately not going to compare this to Minus One because I don't want to have to deal with all the people saying, oh, you can't compare the films. No, it's it's bullying. It's too much bullying to compare Minus One <laughs> to Godzilla X Kong. But like, you don't need to compare it with a really, really good particular type of film to be able to say that just on every conceivable metric, this is a terrible, terrible movie. It's just shit. You, and if you love the thing, you should probably demand that it's better. Like, no one would suffer if you made this thing not shit. I don't really understand why so many well, people the, are so very angry about it. That's the really big, like, almost lie that's getting told. Like, the, the idea that we can't maintain the fun of monster fights while also making it good. That's not oh, possible. Sorry. Those two are at odds the with only, each other. The only kind of Godzilla film is, like, one of the worst Transformers films. Exa exactly this. Your, your Transformers fans... Drama. Uh, like, who really enjoyed the Michael Bay Transformers will probably feel it the same way when they hit, like, the eighth fucking one, where they were like, oh, I love the good... Fast and the Furious is gonna go through this all the time, too. Like, people coming in being like, good god, what a terribly constructed movie. They'll be like, no, it, it's it's fun. You're not... Why are you treating this like this? It's fun, okay? Stop, stop being a dick to the movie. The movie is not... I think another notion is, like, you're saying they shouldn't exist this way when I love them, and it's like, well... They could be so much better. Why are you they so could upset be better. by this? There's no reason why you can't have the film that has the big lizard fight, but also has characters. Absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's entirely possible. You could have better films, and you would be happier, and we would be happier, and everybody would be happier. Yeah, like, if they say something, like, no, what I love is watching Thanos Gauntlet, uh, big spiny, like, swords flying through the air. Everything is absolutely absurd. I love that. It's like, we can still do that better. Still. But yeah, it's very hard to do the Thanos Gauntlet worse than the way they did it in that film. I mean, that, that's <laughs> uh, some yeah. absolutely special nonsense that goes on there. But yeah, you can, you can write the Thanos Gauntlet into the film in any number of ways, but just having a guy say, oh, by the way, we happen to have it in the shed. Like, that's not how this is supposed to work. The biggest impression I've gotten from reading about all of this is Godzilla fans are upset that people are making fun of their shit. It's like, your shit is just as stinky as everyone else's. Just because you got Godzilla on it doesn't mean it's immune to criticism. That ain't happening. Yeah, I like the big lizard, but I also like Optimus Prime and shit. That still exactly, yeah. The there are things I like in the bad. Bayformers movies, maybe. Yeah, there are. <laughs> I well, I would. I mean, I think that the first Transformers movie is probably yeah. going to be holding up better than all of these new Godzilla. Obviously, remember Godzilla minus one is not <laughs> included in that selection. But like, I, I we haven't seen Godzilla uh, Kong yet, but it's probably like shit. It probably well, yeah, is. we're saving it all for now. We're going to go through it again. Too. 
We're going to go through them, and we're going to tell you exactly how we feel, Godzilla fans. Get ready. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I just it's it's uh I, I think something that's become really lame now is it's almost like once the meta sets in enough, it like readjusts the way that the film will be appraised to where, you know, your mainstream critics will like be more kind to it because it's accepted that it's gonna be a piece of shit. So <laughs> yeah. as long as it's like got a fun action scene, it's what happened to John Wick, where John Wick gets rated very favorably. It gets rated as being excellent, not just yeah, it's stupid, but it's got fun action. It gets rated, like, as a very quality action film. Um, obviously, again, two, three, four, not one. One is actually a quality That's actually another great example of people being like, you know, yeah. John Wick, two, three, four, they're incredible. And it's like, no, they're actually dumb as fuck. And it's like, yeah, dumb as fucking awesome. And, oh, you know, he's like, like oh. um, There was John Wick 1 that was really cool and had cool action scenes, but was also, like, a story. It's Jurassic World versus Jurassic Park again. Yeah. It's, I mean, the same thing happens. You, know, you, you criticize Jurassic World Dominion and they say, no, it's fine. It's a blockbuster, so it's not meant to be good. The fact it's not meant to be good makes it good. Yeah. My kids really enjoy it. It's like, why the fuck are you taking your kids to see that? <laughs> I don't know the, what's the, happened. Irresponsible like, parent? Watch the watch know. original Jurassic Park. That's a really good film. Oh, yeah. It's available. Just go check it out. You don't need to go spend a whole bunch of money to go to the movie to watch a shit movie when you can watch a good movie on streaming. Ask for better. Demand better. Mm-hmm. Anyway, EFAP of Metal Gear Solid 1 when? I don't know if that's ever going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about None that. None of us are familiar, really. I played 5 and I kind of liked it, but I didn't understand the story, so... Um, yeah, one of these play. days, I'd like to meet this apparent omniscient, potentially omnipotent wizard Morley keeps referencing in his hypotheticals. When we created the wizard, he was for a very specific purpose, and he's just stuck around in our hypotheticals. I love the wizard. I, uh, I've explained that I view the wizard as wearing a blue coat and having, like, a blue hat. I don't know why. Does he kind of look I, like I imagine... Pierce in he's... the community episode where they convinced him he's the cookie wizard or whatever? He's got, like, uh, the way that I view the wizard in my head is he's got the big, you know, like, uh, Mickey Mouse and Fantasia with the, mm -hmm. the Sorcerer's Apprentice, like, that big hat. But he's wearing a blue, like, coat, kind of like, um... Uh, from Mario, uh, except he's a person, and he's got like a big white uh, beard, a big long white beard, and a and a quaint, happy little mustache. And he's uh, he's a really helpful guy, the wizard. I agree, like him. Uh, please look up Project X Ray. It's ridiculous. Familiar to you guys? No, I've never heard of this. Bat mm. bombs were an experimental World War II weapon developed by the United States that consisted of a bomb-shaped casing with over a thousand compartments. What is this? This is the... <laughs> if uh, it, does it, is it like a canister full of bats each, that fly out? And... Each of the thousand compartments contained yeah. a hibernating Mexican free-tailed bat with a small-timed incendiary bomb. What? <laughs> Imagine being the guys whose job it was to assemble these. Yeah, you you get the, you have to get, you get a get thousand order, bats and you like attach I... incendiary bombs to them, get them to hibernate, like read them bedtime stories. Oh, and you then know what? Get them into the... This should have been like an Austin Powers. They should have had Doctor Evil do this, <laughs> but never never explained to the audience it's actually something that happened. <laughs> Just have it be in the movie like that. Oh my goodness! Wow! How in? <laughs> How would that work? So they come out of the... I assume these bats are very confused. They jump out of this little canister compartment. They see all of their friends. They have this weird thing stuck to them that they, unfortunately, are not equipped to deal with in terms of its explosive uh, consequences. What do they do? Do they, do they fly into well, German uh, caves to... and explode? During... Wikipedia says they go and nest in Japanese houses, and then at some point at the predetermined time, they just explode. Jeez. <laughs> that's, that's actually horrific in the most ridiculous. <laughs> Dude, listen to this. <laughs> Conceived in 1942 by dental surgeon turned inventor Lythal S. Adams, the bat bomb was envisioned as a means to set fire to Japanese cities by exploiting bats. <laughs> <laughs> Uh. Bruce Wayne over here. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. That needs to be in an Austin Powers movie. They have, they got to do it. Uh, eh, anyway. It wasn't, uh, in, it wasn't in Batwoman. It's a Batwoman level weapon, surely. Oh yeah, I mean, I'd put it in that. I mean, this is the thing. It depends on what you want to do. Cringe or funny. 
Or both. Bats all over Japan randomly exploding <laughs> into balls of flame. Oh, the Americans! <laughs> Damn them. <laughs> then they're exploding bats. Um, oh. Quote, Joy, quote, got into that home shopping network life. What's that a reference to? Who? Joy. That'd be the Blade Runner lady. She was called what, Joy, right? She, like, host the, the channel where they talk about all of these, like, jewelry that you can get. She hosts it. Maybe. I don't know. Mm. But, uh, yeah, maybe. That was Absolutely. the final Super Chat of the night, which leads Woo! us to the end of the stream. But before we go... Lil Platoon, what are you up to, sir? Where can people find you? What's the newest with the newest of the newest? Newest with the new yeah, it's it's probably gonna be Godzilla X Kong. Oh, um, no. just because <laughs> why not? Yeah. They're um, ready to piss off the whole Godzilla community. I just yeah, I'm just gonna just prepare myself. It's hopefully it'll be this week, so yeah, then that that'll be entertaining as I ignore my comment section entirely. Um, and then, then it'll be back to the Dune video, because the, the introduction's done, but the introduction alone is about 90 minutes long, so this is gonna... It's a long video. I don't know exactly when it's gonna come out, but eventually it will come out. Um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much it for where I am at the moment. Beautiful. Fun. Um, well, I, uh, is there anything rags for any of you guys would like to mention? Um... I don't think there is anything that I would like to mention. I think I think I've said enough today. Uh, well, I mean, you know, just working. But I suppose uh, probably worth noting that uh, the EFAP TV episodes for Halo should start uh start releasing, rolling out. Yeah, weekly soon, very soon. Yeah, we're figuring out the timeline on that. Next week's episode will be a Halo season two Halo retrospective. I believe, uh, I yep. confirm, but I believe we have Woo! ER, Halo! ER Patrician TV and John. You know John? Yes. And then, uh, yeah, the Halo episodes will possibly follow that. It's going to be bizarre because we're going to talk about the whole season and then we're going to show you our episodes, I guess. But uh, we, there's nothing <laughs> else we can do. Like, that's just how yeah. it works. Um, and then following that, I guess, will be Rebel Moon, or is, it, is, is that close enough to that? Right, the week uh... after? Well, there's Rebel Moon, but Fallout, I think, starts this... Well, not right. start, I think it all comes out this week, because it's uh, Amazon so, Prime, so I think all the episodes are out. Listen, EFAP chat, EFAP audience, we've not figured out exactly what we're covering, where, how, when, and why, all right? We've got to get move everything around, get everyone ready to do editing particular things. But uh, work is being done. People are on stuff. You will receive things. The uh, you got the War Arc next installment coming. I think next week or the week after next week. So two weeks ish from now, which will be the Three Musketeers, the W. S. Anderson movie. That'll be exciting Ooh. for you. And then uh, yeah, just you know, you, th th there'll be a decent arc with the uh, the Halo stuff. Once that's all over and wrapped up, I think we'll be heading into. We'll be crossing over with Acolyte at that point. Uh, no, Acolyte is in June, so June, that's a okay. little bit away from now, but, uh, Rebel but Moon is and Rebel uh, a Moon, couple yes. of weeks from now. Yeah, full, uh, Fallout, I think, is this week. So... Uh, and there's probably something else I've forgotten about as well, <laughs> like, it's a upcoming thing. Yeah, plenty more on the way. Thank you all for, uh... You know, hanging out, and um, we appreciate it very, very mm -hmm. much. No, thank you for hanging out, Mahler. Aww. It's really good to, you know, see you around. It's good that you're here talking to the people. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's really good. You know, it's it's really good stuff. It goes a long way. Oh, we had another message saying, made you look again, which oh. you genuinely did. I did look. Did, oh, yeah, I, I did me. look. I did look at that. That's true. Wow. Do Alrighty. I want to click on that icon that they have, or is that going to oh, be God, like, it looks ghastly. <laughs> Because I could tell, I it could is tell that that's going to be a spooky, weird image by the little tiny preview image. So I like, I don't know if I want to get look closer. Um, but yes, just before we go, oh, I, yeah, I right. just carried on reading because I was very, very fascinated. Do you want to, the pitch, the bat bomb guy's pitch for his idea, is also contained in the Wikipedia article. Go for it. Um, he says that the bat is the lowest form of animal life that until and until now reasons for its creation have remained unexplained <laughs> oh he went on goodness. to say that bats were and i quote created by god to await this hour to play their part in the scheme of free human existence <laughs> and to frustrate any attempts of those who dare desecrate our way of life and oh president god. roosevelt responded this man is not a nut it sounds like a wild idea but it's worth looking into <laughs> government isn't it great <laughs> 
<laughs> you know what? <laughs> this so man is not we were... a nut. <laughs> I tell you, if if this worked really well, we might not have developed the atomic bombs. <laughs> so, <laughs> in an alternate start... branch of he history, the guy, bats destroyed Imperial bats, Japan. He hates bats, doesn't he? he this guy them. does. I bats really... are great. They serve no fucking bats purpose really... until this day. <laughs> That's the, like fascinating. There's no so many purpose aspects for their creation. Are, like, God really... made these bats so America so could destroy the Yeah, America could fight Japan. Millions wow. of years ago, God made bats so that in 1942, <laughs> <laughs> they could finally shine. Oh, Gorgeous. Geez. You know what? I like it. Yes. Good stuff. Um, hope you had a wonderful night, everybody. We shall see you next time. Doodle pip. That's right. Bye, bye. See you later, everybody. Bye bye. Also, bye, subscribe bye, to the EFAP Highlights channel. <laughs> Goodbye. See ya. Doodaloo.